Introduction Part 1 of The Social Cancer, a complete English version of Noli Me Tangere from the Spanish of José Rizal by Charles Derbyshire. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avaí in October 2011. Norli me tangere by Jose Rizal Translator's Introduction, Part 1 We travel rapidly in these historical sketches. The reader flies in his express train in a few minutes through a couple of centuries. The centuries pass more slowly to those to whom the years are doled out day by day. Institutions grow and beneficently develop themselves, making their way into the hearts of generations which are shorter lived than they, attracting love and respect and winning loyal obedience, and then as gradually forfeiting by their shortcomings the allegiance which had been honorably gained in worthier periods. We see wealth and greatness, we see corruption and vice, and one seems to follow so close upon the other that we fancy they must have always coexisted. We look more steadily, and we perceive long periods of time in which there is first a growth, and then a decay, like that we perceive in a tree of the forest. Froud, Annals of an English Abbey Monasticism's record in the Philippines presents no new general fact to the eye of history. The attempt to eliminate the eternal feminine from her natural and normal sphere in the scheme of things there met with the same certain and signal disaster that awaits every perversion of human activity. Beginning with a band of zealous, earnest men, sincere in their convictions, to whom the cause was all and their personalities nothing, it there, as elsewhere, passed through its usual cycle of usefulness, stagnation, corruption, and degeneration. To the unselfish and heroic efforts of the early friars, Spain in large measure owed her dominion over the Philippine Islands, and the Filipinos a marked advance on the road to civilization and nationality. In fact, after the dreams of sudden wealth from gold and spices had faded, the islands were retained chiefly as a missionary conquest and a stepping stone to the broader fields of Asia, with Manila as a depot for the oriental trade. The records of those early years are filled with tales of courage and heroism worthy of Spain's proudest years, as the missionary fathers labored with unflagging zeal in disinterested endeavor for the spread of the faith and the betterment of the condition of the Malays among whom they found themselves. They won the confidence of the native peoples, gathered them into settlements and villages, led them into the ways of peace, and became their protectors, guides, and counselors. In those times the cross and the sword went hand in hand but in the Philippines the latter was rarely needed or used. The lightness and vivacity of the Spanish character, with its strain of Orientalism, its fertility of resource in meeting new conditions, its adaptability in dealing with the dwellers in warmer lands, all played their part in this as in the other conquests. Only on occasions when some stubborn resistance was met with, as in Manila and the surrounding country, where the most advanced of the native peoples dwelt, and where some of the forms and beliefs of Islam had been established, was it necessary to resort to violence to destroy the native leaders and replace them with the missionary fathers. A few sallies by young Salcedo, the Cortes of the Philippine conquest, with a company of the splendid infantry, which was at that time the admiration and despair of martial Europe, soon effectively exercised any idea of resistance that even the boldest and most intransignant of the native leaders might have entertained. For the most part, no great persuasion was needed to turn a simple, imaginative, fatalistic people from a few vague animistic deities to the systematic iconology and the elaborate ritual of the Spanish church. An obscure Batala or a dim Malyari was easily superseded by or transformed into a clearly defined Dios, and in the case of any specially tenacious demon he could without much difficulty be merged into a Christian saint or devil. 
There was no organized priesthood to be overcome, the primitive religious observances consisting almost entirely of occasional orgies presided over by an old woman, who filled the priestly offices of interpreter for the unseen powers and chief eater at the sacrificial feast. With their unflagging zeal, their organization, their elaborate forms and ceremonies, the missionaries were enabled to win the confidence of the natives, especially as the greater part of them learned the local language and identified their lives with the communities under their care. Accordingly, the people took kindly to their new teachers and rulers, so that in less than a generation Spanish authority was generally recognized in the settled portions of the Philippines, and in the surrounding years the missionaries gradually extended this area by forming settlements from among the wilder peoples, whom they persuaded to abandon the more objectionable features of their old roving, often predatory life, and to group themselves into towns and villages under the bell. The tactics employed in the conquest and the subsequent behavior of the conquerors were true to the old Spanish nature, so succinctly characterized by a plain-spoken Englishman of Mary's reign, when the war cry of Castile encircled the globe, and even hovered ominously near the sceptred isle, when in the intoxication of power character stands out so sharply defined. They be very wise and politic, and can, through their wisdom, perform and bridle their own natures for a time, and apply their conditions to the manners of those men with whom they meddle gladly by friendship, whose mischievous manners a man shall never know until he come under their subjection. But then shall he perfectly perceive and feel them, for in dissimulations until they have their purposes, and afterwards in oppression and tyranny, when they can obtain them, they do exceed all other nations upon the earth. In the working out of this spirit, with all the indomitable courage and fanatical ardor derived from the long contests with the Moors, they reduced the native peoples to submission, but still not to the galling yoke which they fastened upon the aborigines of America to make one Las Casas shine amid the horde of Pizarros. There was some compulsory labor in timber cutting and shipbuilding, with enforced military service as rowers and soldiers for expeditions to the Moluccas and the coasts of Asia, but nowhere the unspeakable atrocities which in Mexico, Hispaniola, and South America drove mothers to strangle their babies at birth, and whole tribes to prefer self-immolation to the living death in the mines and slave pens. Quite differently from the case in America, where entire islands and districts were depopulated to bring on later the curse of Negro slavery, in the Philippines the fact appears that the native population really increased and the standard of living was raised under the stern yet beneficent tutelage of the missionary fathers. The great distance and the hardships of the journey precluded the coming of many irresponsible adventurers from Spain, and, fortunately for the native population, no great mineral wealth was ever discovered in the Philippine Islands. The system of government was, in its essential features, a simple one. The missionary priests drew the inhabitants of the towns and villages about themselves, or formed new settlements, and with profuse use of symbol and symbolism taught the people the faith, laying particular stress upon the fear of God as administered by them, reconciling the people to their subjection by inculcating the Christian virtues of patience and humility. When any recalcitrants refused to accept the new order, or later showed an inclination to break away from it, the military forces, acting usually under secret directions from the padre, made raids in the disaffected parts with all the unpitying atrocity the Spanish soldiery were ever capable of displaying in their dealings with the weaker people. After sufficient punishment had been inflicted and a wholesome fear inspired, the padre very opportunely interfered in the natives' behalf, by which means they were convinced that peace and security lay in submission to the authorities, especially to the curate of their town or district. A single example will suffice to make the method clear. Not an isolated instance, but a typical case chosen from among the mass of records left by the chief actors themselves. 
Fray Domingo Pérez, evidently a man of courage and conviction, for he later lost his life in the work of which he wrote, was the Dominican vicar on the Sambales coast when that order temporarily took over the district from the Recollects. In a report written for his superior in 1680, he outlines the method clearly. In order that those whom we have assembled in the three villages may persevere in their settlements, the most efficacious fear and the one most suited to their nature is that the Spaniards of the fort and presidio of Painaven, of whom they have a very great fear, may come very often to the sad villages and overrun the land, and penetrate even into their old recesses where they formerly lived. And if perchance they should find anything planted in the said recesses, they would destroy it and cut it down without leaving them anything. And so that they may see the father protects them when the said Spaniards come to the village, the father opposes them and takes the part of the Indians. But it is always necessary in this matter for the soldiers to conquer, and the father is always very careful always to inform the Spaniards by whom and where anything is planted which it may be necessary to destroy, and that the edicts which his lordship, the governor, sent them be carried out. But at all events said Spaniards are to make no trouble for the Indians whom they find in the villages, but rather must treat them well. This in 1680. The Dominican transcriber of the record in 1906 has added a very illuminating note, revealing the immutability of the system and showing that the rulers possessed in a superlative degree the Bourbonesque trait of learning nothing and forgetting nothing. Even when I was a missionary to the heathens from 1882 to 1892, I had occasion to observe the said policy to inform the chief of the fortress of the measures that he ought to take, and to make a false show on the other side so that it might have no influence on the fortress. Thus it stands out in bold relief as a system built up and maintained by fraud and force, bound in the course of nature to last only as long as the deception could be carried on and the repressive force kept up to sufficient strength. Its maintenance required that the different sections be isolated from each other, so that there could be no growth toward a common understanding and cooperation, and its permanence depended upon keeping the people ignorant and contented with their lot, held under strict control by religious and political fear. Yet it was a vast improvement over their old mode of life, and their condition was bettered as they grew up to such a system. Only with the passing of the years and the increase of wealth and influence, the ease and luxury invited by these, and the consequent corruption so induced, with the insatiable longing ever for more wealth and greater influence, did the poison of greed and grasping power enter the system to work its insidious way into every part, slowly transforming the beneficent institution of the sixteenth and seventeenth centuries into an incubus weighing upon all the activities of the people in the nineteenth an unyielding bar to the development of the country a hideous anachronism in these modern times it must be remembered also that spain in the years following her brilliant conquests of the fifteenth and sixteenth century lost strength and vigour through the corruption at home induced by the unearned wealth that flowed into the mother country from the colonies and by the draining away of her best blood nor did her sons ever develop that economic spirit which is the permanent foundation of all empire but they let the wealth of the indies flow through their country principally to london and amsterdam there to form in more practical hands the basis of the british and dutch colonial empires the priest and the soldier were supreme, so her best sons took up either the cross or the sword to maintain her dominion in the distant colonies, a movement which, long continued, spelled for her a form of national suicide. The soldier expended his strength and generally laid down his life on alien soil, leaving no fit successor of his own stock to carry on the work according to his standards. The priest, under the celibate system, in its better days left no offspring at all, and in the days of its corruption, none bred and reared under the influences that make for social and political progress. The dark chambers of the Inquisition stifled all advance in thought, 
so the civilization and culture of Spain, as well as her political system, settled into rigid forms to await only the inevitable process of stagnation and decay. In her proudest hour an old soldier, who had lost one of his hands fighting her battles against the Turk at Lepanto, employed the other in writing the masterpiece of her literature, which is really a caricature of the nation. There is much in the career of Spain that calls to mind the dazzling beauty of her dark-glancing daughters, with its early bloom, its startling, almost morbid brilliance, and its premature decay. Rapid and brilliant was her rise, gradual and inglorious her steady decline, from the bright morning when the banners of Castile and Aragon were flung triumphantly from the battlements of the Alhambra, to the short summer not so long gone, when at Cavite and Santiago, with swift, decisive havoc, the last ragged remnants of the once world-dominating power were blown into space and time, to hover disembodied there, a lesson and a warning to future generations. Whatever her final place in the records of mankind, whether as the pioneer of modern civilization, or the buccaneer of the nations, or, as would seem most likely, a goodly mixture of both, she has at least, with the exception only of her great mother, Rome, furnished the most instructive lessons in political pathology yet recorded, and the advice to students of world progress to familiarize themselves with her history is even more apt today than when it first issued from the encyclopedic mind of Macaulay nearly a century ago. Hardly had she reached the zenith of her power when the disintegration began, and one by one her brilliant conquests dropped away to leave her alone in her faded splendor, with naught but her wanting pride left, another Niobe of nations. In the countries more in contact with the trend of civilization and more susceptible to revolutionary influences from the mother country, this separation came from within, while in the remoter parts the archaic and outgrown system dragged along until a stronger force from without destroyed it. Nowhere was the crystallization of form and principle more pronounced than in religious life, which fastened upon the mother country a deadening weight that hampered all progress, and in the colonies, notably in the Philippines, virtually converted her government into a hagiarchy that had its face towards the past, and either could not or would not move with the current of the times. So, when the shot heard round the world, the declaration of humanity's right to be and to become, in its all-encircling sweep, reached the lands controlled by her, it was coldly received and blindly rejected by the governing powers, and there was left only the slower, subtler, but none the less sure, process of working its way among the people, to burst in time in rebellion and the destruction of the conservative forces that would repress it. In the opening years of the 19th century, the friar orders of the Philippines had reached the apogee of their power and usefulness. Their influence was everywhere felt and acknowledged, while the country still prospered under the effects of the vigorous and progressive administration of Anda and Vargas in the preceding century. Native levies had fought loyally under Spanish leadership against Dutch and British invaders, or in suppressing local revolts among their own people, which were always due to some specific grievance, never directed definitely against the Spanish sovereignty. The Philippines were shut off from contact with any country but Spain, and even this communication was restricted and carefully guarded. There was an elaborate central government which, however, hardly touched the life of the native peoples, who were guided and governed by the parish priests, each town being in a way an independent entity. Of this halcyon period, just before the process of disintegration began, there has fortunately been left a record which may be characterized as the most notable Spanish literary production relating to the Philippines, being the calm, sympathetic, judicial account of one who had spent his manhood in the work there, and who, full of years and experience, sat down to tell the story of their life. In it there are no puerile whinings, no querulous curses that tropical malaise do not order their lives as the people of the Spanish village, where he may have been reared, 
no selfish laments of ingratitude over blessings unasked and only imperfectly understood by the natives, no fatuous self-deception as to the real conditions, but a patient consideration of the difficulties encountered, the good accomplished, and the unavoidable evils incident to any human work. The country and the people, too, are described with the charming simplicity of the eyes that see clearly, the brain that ponders deeply, and the heart that beats sympathetically. Through all the pages of his account runs the quiet strain of peace and contentment, of satisfaction with the existing order, for he had looked upon the creation and saw that it was good. There is neither haste nor hate nor anger, but the deliberate recital of the facts, warmed and illuminated by the geniality of a soul to whom age and experience had brought, not a sour cynicism, but the mellowing influence of a ripened philosophy. He was such an old man as may fondly be imagined walking through the streets of Panyake in stately benignity amid the fear and respect of the brown people over whom he watched. But in all his chronicle there is no suggestion of anything more to hope for, anything beyond. Beautiful as the picture is, it is that of a system which had reached maturity, a condition of stagnation, not of growth. In less than a decade the terrific convulsions in European politics made themselves felt even in the remote Philippines, and then began the gradual drawing away of the people from their rulers, blind gropings and erratic wanderings at first, but nevertheless persistent and vigorous tendencies. The first notable influence was the admission of representatives for the Philippines into the Spanish Cortes under the revolutionary governments and the abolition of the trade monopoly with Mexico. The last galleon reached Manila in 1815, and soon foreign commercial interests were permitted, in a restricted way, to enter the country. Then, with the separation of Mexico and the other American colonies from Spain, a more marked change was brought about, in that direct communication was established with the mother country, and the absolutism of the hagiarchy first questioned by the numbers of peninsula Spaniards who entered the islands to trade, some even to settle and rear families there. These also affected the native population in the larger centres by the spread of their ideas, which were not always in conformity with those that for several centuries the friars had been inculcating into their wards. Moreover, there was a not considerable portion of the population, sprung from the friars themselves, who were eager to adopt the customs and ideas of the Spanish immigrants. The suppression of many of the monasteries in Spain in 1835 caused a large influx of the disestablished monks into the Philippines in search for a haven and a home, thus bringing about a conflict with the native clergy, who were displaced from their best holdings to provide births for the newcomers. At the same time, the increase of education among the native priests brought the natural demand for more equitable treatment by the Spanish friar, so insistent that it even broke out into open rebellion in 1843 on the part of a young Tagalog who thought himself aggrieved in this respect. Thus the struggle went on, with stagnation above and some growth below, so that the governors were ever getting further away from the governed, and for such a movement there is in the course of nature but one inevitable result, especially when outside influences are actively at work penetrating the social system and making for better things. Among these influences four cumulative ones may be noted, the spread of journalism, the introduction of steamships into the Philippines, the return of the Jesuits, and the opening of the Suez Canal. The printing press entered the islands with the conquest, but its use had been strictly confined to religious works until about the middle of the past century, when there was a sudden awakening and within a few years five journals were being published. In 1848 appeared the first regular newspaper of importance, El Diario de Manila, and about a decade later the principal organ of the Spanish Filipino population, El Comercio, which, with varying vicissitudes, has continued down to the present. While rigorously censored, both politically and religiously, and accessible to only an infinitesimal portion of the people, 
they still performed the service of letting a few rays of light into the Cimmerian intellectual gloom of the time and place. With the coming of steam navigation, communication between the different parts of the islands was facilitated and trade encouraged, with all that such a change meant in the way of breaking up the old isolation and tending to a common understanding. Spanish power, too, was for the moment more firmly established, and Moro piracy in Luzon and Bisayan Islands, which had been so great a drawback to the development of the country, was forever ended. The return of the Jesuits produced two general results tending to dissatisfaction with the existing order. To them was assigned the missionary field of Mindanao, which meant the displacement of the recollect fathers in the missions there, and for these other births had to be found. Again, the native clergy were the losers in that they had to give up their best parishes in Luzon, especially around Manila and Cavite, so the breach was further widened and the soil sown with discontent. But more far-reaching than this immediate result was the educational movement inaugurated by the Jesuits. The native, already feeling the vague impulses from without and stirred by the growing restlessness of the times, here saw a new world open before him. A considerable portion of the native population in the larger centres, who had shared in the economic progress of the colony, were enabled to look beyond their daily needs and to afford their children an opportunity for study and advancement, a condition and a need met by the Jesuits for a time. With the opening of the Suez Canal in 1869, communication with the mother country became cheaper, quicker, surer, so that large number of Spaniards, many of them in sympathy with the republican movements at home, came to the Philippines in search of fortunes and generally left half-cased families who had imbibed their ideas. Native boys who had already felt the intoxication of such learning as the schools of Manila afforded them began to dream of greater wonders in Spain, now that the journey was possible for them. So began the definite movements that led directly to the disintegration of the friar regime. In the same year occurred the revolution in the mother country, which had tired of the old corrupt despotism. Isabella II was driven into exile, and the country left to waver about uncertainly for several years, passing through all the stages of government, from red radicalism to absolute conservatism, finally adjusting itself to the middle course of constitutional monarchism. During the effervescent and ephemeral republic, there was sent to the Philippines a governor who set to work to modify the old system and establish a government more in harmony with modern ideas and more democratic in form. His changes were hailed with delight by the growing class of Filipinos who were striving for more consideration in their own country, and who, in their enthusiasm and the intoxication of the moment, perhaps became more radical than was safe under the conditions, surely too radical for their religious guides watching and waiting behind the veil of the temple. In January 1872, an uprising occurred in the naval arsenal at Cavite with a Spanish non-commissioned officer as one of the leaders. From the meagre evidence now obtainable, this would seem to have been a purely local mutiny over the service questions of pay and treatment, but in it the friars saw their opportunity. It was blazoned forth with all the wild panic that was to characterize the actions of the governing powers from that time on as the premature outbreak of a general insurrection under the leadership of the native clergy, and rigorous repressive measures were demanded. Three native priests, notable for the popularity among their own people, one an octogenarian and the other two young canons of the Manila Cathedral, were summarily garroted, along with the renegade Spanish officer who had participated in the mutiny. No record of any trial of these priests has ever been brought to light. The archbishop, himself a secular clergyman, stoutly refused to degrade them from their holy office, and they wore their sacerdotal robes at the execution, which was conducted in a hurried, fearful manner. At the same time, a number of young Manilans who had taken conspicuous part in the liberal demonstrations were deported to the Ladrone Islands or to remote islands of the Philippine group itself. 
This was the beginning of the end. Yet there immediately followed the delusive calm which ever precedes the fatal outburst, lulling those marked for destruction to a delusive security. The two decades following were years of quiet, unobtrusive growth, during which the Philippine Islands made the greatest economic progress in their history. But this in itself was preparing the final catastrophe, for if there be any fact well established in human experience, it is that with economic development the power of organized religion begins to wane, the rise of the merchant spells the decline of the priest. A sordid change from masses and mysteries to sugar and shoes, this is often said to be, but it should be noted that the epochs of greatest economic activity have been those during which the generality of mankind have lived fuller and freer lives, and above all that in such eras the finest intellects and the greatest souls have been developed. Nor does such an institution that has been slowly growing for three centuries, moulding the very life and fibre of the people, disintegrate without a violent struggle, either in its own constitution or in the life of the people trained under it. Not only the ecclesiastical, but also the social and political system of the country was controlled by the religious orders, often silently and secretly, but nonetheless effectively. This is evident from the ceaseless conflict that went on between the religious orders and the Spanish political administrators, who were at every turn thwarted in their efforts to keep the government abreast of the times. The shock of the affair of 1872 had apparently stunned the Filipinos, but it had at the same time brought them to the parting of the ways and induced a vague feeling that there was something radically wrong which could only be righted by a closer union among themselves. They began to consider that their interests and those of the governing powers were not the same. In these feelings of distrust toward the friars, they were stimulated by the great numbers of immigrant Spaniards who were then entering the country, many of whom had taken part in the republican movements at home, and who, upon the restoration of the monarchy, no doubt thought it safer for them to be at as great a distance as possible from the throne. The young Filipinos studying in Spain came from different parts of the islands, and by their association there in a foreign land were learning to forget their narrow sectionalism, hence the way was being prepared for some concerted action. Thus, aided and encouraged by the anti-clerical Spaniards in the mother country, there was growing up a new generation of native leaders who looked towards something better than the old system. It is with this period in the history of the country, the author's boyhood, that the story of Noli me tangere deals. Typical scenes and characters are sketched from life with wonderful accuracy, and the picture presented is that of a master mind who knew and loved his subject. Terror and repression were the order of the day, with ever a growing unrest in the higher circles, while the native population at large seemed to be completely cowed, brutalized is the term repeatedly used by Rizal in his political essays. Spanish writers of the period, observing only the superficial movements, some of which were indeed fantastical enough, for they, who in oppression's darkness could have dwelt, they are not eagles nourished with the day. What marvel then, at times, if they mistake their way? And not heeding the currents at work below, take great delight in ridiculing the pretensions of the young men seeking advancement, while they indulge in coarse ribaldry over the wretched condition of the great mass of the Indians. The author, however, himself a miserable Indian, vividly depicts the unnatural conditions and dominant characters produced under the outworn system of fraud and force, at the same time presenting his people as living, feeling, struggling individuals, with all the frailties of human nature and all the possibilities of mankind, either for good or evil, Incidentally, he throws into marked contrast the despicable deprecation used by the Spanish writers in referring to the Filipinos, making clear the application of the self-evident proposition that no ordinary human, being in the presence of superior force, can very well conduct himself as a man, unless he be treated as such. 
the friar orders deluded by the transient triumph and secure in their pride of place became more arrogant more domineering than ever in the general administration the political rulers were at every turn thwarted their best efforts frustrated and if they ventured too far their own security threatened for in the three-cornered wrangle which lasted throughout the whole of the spanish domination the friar orders had in addition to the strength derived from their organization and their wealth the damoclean weapon of control over the natives to hang above the heads of both governor and archbishop the curates in the towns always the real rulers became veritable despots so that no voice dared to raise itself against them even in the midst of conditions which the humblest indio was beginning to feel dumbly to be perverted and unnatural and that too after three centuries of training under the system that he had ever been taught to accept as the will of god the friars seemed long since to have forgotten those noble aims that had meant so much to the founders and early workers of their orders if indeed the great majority of those of the later day had ever realized the meaning of their office for the spanish writers of the time delight in characterizing them as the meanest of the spanish peasantry when not something worse who had been lassoed taught a few ritualistic prayers and shipped to the philippines to be placed in isolated towns as lords and masters of the native population with all the power and prestige over a docile people that the sacredness of their holy office gave them these writers treat the matter lightly seeing in it rather a huge joke on the miserable indians and give the friars great credit for patriotism a term which in this connection they dragged from depth to depth until it quite aptly fitted dr johnson's famous definition the last refuge of a scoundrel in their conduct the religious corporations both as societies and as individuals must be estimated according to their own standards the application of any other criterion would be palpably unfair they undertook to hold the native in subjection to regulate the essential activities of his life according to their ideas so upon them must fall the responsibility for the conditions finally attained to destroy the freedom of the subject and then attempt to blame him for his conduct is a paradox into which the learned men often fell perhaps inadvertently through their deductive logic they endeavoured to shape the lives of their malay wards not only in this existence but also in the next their vows were poverty chastity and obedience the vow of poverty was early regulated to the limbo of neglect only a few years after the founding of manila royal decrees began to issue on the subject of complaints received by the king over the usurpation of lands on the parts of the priest using the same methods so familiar in the heyday of the institution of monasticism in europe pious gifts deathbed bequests pilgrims offerings the friar orders gradually secured the richest of the arable lands in the more thickly settled portions of the philippines notably the part of luzon occupied by the tagalogs not always however it must in justice be recorded were such doubtful means resorted to for there were instances where the missionary was the pioneer gathering about himself a band of devoted natives and plunging into the unsettled parts to build up a town with its fields around it which would later become a friar estate with the accumulated incomes from these estates and the fees for religious observances that poured into their treasuries the orders in their nature of perpetual corporations became the masters of the situation the lords of the country but this condition was not altogether objectionable it was in the excess of their greed that they went astray for the native peoples had been living under this system through generations and not until they began to feel that they were not receiving fair treatment did they question the authority of a power which not only secured them a peaceful existence in this life but also assured them eternal felicity in the next with only the shining exceptions that are produced in any system no matter how false its premises or how decadent it may become to uphold faith in the intrinsic soundness of human nature the vow of chastity was never much more than a myth 
through the tremendous influence exerted over a fanatically religious people who implicitly followed the teachings of the reverend fathers once their confidence had been secured the curate was seldom to be gainsaid in his desires by means of the secret influence in the confessional and the more open political power wielded by him the fairest was his to command and the favoured one and her people looked upon the choice more as an honour than otherwise for besides the social standing that it gave her there was the proud prospect of becoming the mother of children who could claim kinship with the dominant race the curate's companion or the sacristan's wife was a power in the community her family was raised to a place of importance and influence among their own people while she and her ecclesiastical offspring were well cared for on the death or removal of the curate it was almost invariably found that she had been provided with a husband or protector and a not inconsiderable amount of property an arrangement rather appealing to a people among whom the means of living have ever been so insecure that this practice was not particularly offensive to the people among whom they dwelt may explain the situation but to claim that it excuses the friars approaches dangerously close to casuistry still as long as this arrangement was decently and moderately carried out there seems to have been no great objection nor from a worldly point of view with all the conditions considered could there be much but the old story of excess of unbridled power turned toward bad ends again recurs at the same time that the ideas brought in by the spaniards who come each year in increasing numbers and the principles observed by the young men studying in europe cast upon the fitness of such a state of affairs as they approached their downfall like all mankind the friars became more open more insolent more shameless in their conduct the story of Maria Clara, as told in Noli me Tangere, is by no means an exaggerated instance, but rather one of the few clean enough to bear the light, and her fate, as depicted in the epilogue, is said to be based upon an actual occurrence with which the author must have been familiar. The vow of obedience, whether considered as to the Pope, their highest religious authority, or to the King of Spain, their political liege, might not always be so callously disregarded, but it could be evaded and defied. From the Vatican came bull after bull, from the Escorial, decree after decree, only to be archived in Manila, sometimes after a hollow pretense of compliance. A large part of the records of Spanish domination is taken up with the wearisome quarrels that went on between the archbishop, representing the head of the church, over the questions of the episcopal visitation and the enforcement of the provisions of the Council of Trent, relegating the monks to their original status of missionaries, with the friars invariably victorious in their contentions. Royal decrees ordering inquiries into the titles to the estates of the men of poverty and those providing for the education of the natives in Spanish were merely sneered at and left to moulder in harmless quiet not without good grounds for his contention the friar claimed that the spanish dominion over the philippines depended upon him and he therefore confidently set himself up as the best judge of how that dominion could be maintained thus there are presented in the philippines of the closing quarter of the century just past the phenomena so frequently met with in modern society so disheartening to the people who must drag out their lives under them of an old system which has outworn its usefulness and is being called into question with forces actively at work disintegrating it yet with the unhappy folk bred and reared under it unprepared for a new order of things the old faith was breaking down its forms and beliefs once so full of life and meaning were being sharply examined doubt and suspicion were the order of the day moreover it must ever be borne in mind that in the philippines this unrest except in the parts where the friars were the landlords was not general among the people the masses of whom were still sunk in their loved egyptian night but affected only a very small proportion of the population for the most part young men who were groping their way towards something better yet without any very clearly conceived idea of what that better might be and among whom was to be found the usual sprinkling of sunshine patriots and omnipresent opportunists 
ready for any kind of trouble that will afford them a chance to rise. Add to the apathy of the masses, dragging out their vacant lives amid the shadows of religious superstition and to the unrest of the few, the fact that the orders were in absolute control of the political machinery of the country, with the best part of the agrarian wealth amortized in their hands, Add also the ever-present jealousies, petty feuds, and racial hatreds for which Manila and the Philippines, with their medley of creeds and races, offer such a fertile land, all fostered by the governing class for the maintenance of the old Machiavellian principle of divide and rule, and the sum is about the most miserable condition under which any portion of mankind ever tried to fulfill nature's inexorable laws of growth. End of Introduction, Part 1Introduction Part 2 of The Social Cancer, a complete English version of No Lime Tangere from the Spanish of José Rizal by Charles Darbyshire. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Hawaii in October 2011. No Lime Tangere by José Rizal. Translator's Introduction, Part 2. And third came she who gives dark creeds their power, Silabat Paramasa, sorceress, draped fair in many lands as lowly faith, but ever juggling souls with rites and prayers, the keeper of those keys which lock up hells and open heavens. Wilt thou there, she said, put by our sacred books, dethrone our gods, unpeople all the temples, shaking down that law which feeds the priests and props the realm? But Buddha answered, What thou bidst me keep is form which passes, but the free truth stands, get thee unto thy darkness. Sir Edwin Arnold, The Light of Asia Ah, simple people, how little do you know the blessing that you enjoy? Neither hunger, nor nakedness, nor inclemency of the weather troubles you. With the payment of seven reals per year, you remain free of contributions. You do not have to close your houses with bolts. You do not fear that the district troopers will come in to lay waste your fields and trample you underfoot at your own firesides. You call Father the one who is in command over you. Perhaps there will come a time when you will be more civilized and you will break out in revolution and you will wake terrified at the tumult of the riots and will see blood throwing through these quiet fields and gallows and guillotines erected in these squares which never yet have seen an execution. Thus moralized the Spanish traveller in 1842, just as that dolce far niente was drawing to its close. Already far-seeing men had begun to raise in the Spanish Parliament the question of the future of the Philippines, looking towards some definite programme for their care under modern conditions and for the adjustment of their relations with the mother country. But these were mere Cassandra voices. The horologe of time was striking for Rome's successor, as it did for Rome herself. Just where will come the outbreak after three centuries of mind repression and soul distortion, of forcing a growing subject into the straight jacket of medieval thought and action, of natural selection reversed by the constant elimination of native initiative and leadership, is indeed a curious study. That there will be an outbreak somewhere is as certain as that the plant will grow toward the light, even under the most unfavorable conditions, for man's nature is but the resultant of eternal forces that ceaselessly and irresistibly interplay about and upon him, and somewhere this resultant will express itself in thought or deed. After three centuries of Spanish ecclesiastical domination in the Philippines, it was to be expected that the wards would turn against their mentors the methods that had been used upon them, nor is it especially remarkable that there was a decided tendency in some parts to revert to primitive barbarism, but that concurrently a creative genius, 
a bard or a seer, should have been developed among a people, who, as a whole, have hardly passed through the clan or village stage of society, can be regarded as little less than a psychological phenomenon, and provokes the perhaps presumptuous inquiry as to whether there may not be some things about our common human nature that the learned doctors have not yet included in their anthropometic diagrams. On the western shore of the Lake of Bay in the heart of the Philippines clusters the village of Calamba, first established by the Jesuit fathers in the early days of the conquest, and upon their expulsion in 1767 taken over by the crown, which later transferred it to the Dominicans, under whose care the fertile fields about it became one of the richest of the friar estates. It can hardly be called a town, even for the Philippines, but is rather a market village, set as it is at the outlet of the rich country of northern Batangas on the open waterway to Manila and the outside world. Around it flourish the green rice fields, while Mount Makiling towers majestically near in her moods of cloud and sunshine, overlooking the picturesque curve of the shore and the rippling waters of the lake. Shadowy to the eastward gleam the purple crests of Banahao and Cristobal, and but a few miles to the southwestward dim thundering, seething, earth-rocking Taal mutters and moans of the world's birth throes. It is the centre of a region rich in native lore and legend, as it sleeps through the dusty noons when the cacao leaves droop with the heat and dreams through the silvery nights, waking twice or thrice a week to the endless babble and ceaseless chatter of an oriental market, where the noisy throngs make of their trading as much a matter of pleasure and recreation as of business. Directly opposite this marketplace, in a house facing the village church, there was born in 1861 into the already large family of one of the more prosperous tenants on the Dominican estate, a boy who was to combine in his person the finest traits of the Oriental character with the best that Spanish and European culture could add, on whom would fall the burden of his people's woes to lead him over the Via Dolorosa of struggle and sacrifice, ending in his own destruction amid the crumbling ruins of the system whose disintegration he himself had done so much to compass. José Rizal Mercado y Alonso, as his name emerges from the confusion of Filipino nomenclature, was of Malay extraction, with some distant strains of Spanish and Chinese blood. His genealogy reveals several persons remarkable for intellect and independence of character, notably a Philippine, Eloise and Abelard, who, drawn together by their common enthusiasm for study and learning, became his maternal grandparents, as well as a great-uncle who was a traveller and student and who directed the boy's early studies. Thus, from the beginning, his training was exceptional, while his mind was stirred by the trouble already brewing in his community, and from the earliest hours of consciousness he saw about him the wrongs and injustices which overgrown power will ever develop in dealing with a weaker subject. One fact of his childhood, too, stands out clearly, well worthy of record. His mother seems to have been a woman of more than ordinary education for the time and place, and, pleased with the boy's quick intelligence, she taught him to read Spanish from a copy of the Vulgate in that language, which she had somehow managed to secure and keep in her possession, the old, old story of the woman and the book, repeated often enough under strange circumstances, but under none stranger than these. The boy's father was well-to-do, so he was sent at the age of eight to study in the new Jesuit school in Manila, not, however, before he had already inspired some awe in his simple neighbours by the facility with which he composed verses in his native tongue. He began his studies in a private house, while waiting for an opportunity to enter the Ateneo, as the Jesuit school is called, and while there he saw one of his tutors, Padre Burgos, hailed to an ignominious death on the garrote as a result of the affair of 1872. This made a deep impression on his childish mind, and, in fact, seems to have been one of the principal factors in moulding his ideas and shaping his career. 
that the effect upon him was lasting and that his later judgment confirmed him in the belief that a great injustice had been done are shown by the fact that his second important work el filibusterismo written about eighteen ninety one and miscalled by himself a novel for it is really a series of word paintings constituting a terrific arraignment of the whole regime was dedicated to the three priests executed in eighteen seventy two in these words religion in refusing to degrade you has placed in doubt the crime imputed to you the government in surrounding your case with mystery and shadow gives reason for belief in some error committed in fatal moments and all the philippines in venerating your memory and calling you martyrs in no way acknowledges your guilt the only answer he ever received to this was eight remington bullets fired into his back in the ateneo he quickly attracted attention and became a general favorite by his application to his studies the poetic fervor with which he entered into all the exercises of religious devotion and the gentleness of his character he was from the first considered peculiar for so the common mind regards everything that fails to fit the old formulas being of a rather dreamy and reticent disposition more inclined to reading spanish romances than joining in the games of his schoolmates and of all the literatures that could be placed in the hands of an imaginative child what one would be more productive in a receptive mind of a fervid love of life and home and country and all that men hold dear than that of the musical language of castile with its high colouring and passionate character his activities were varied for in addition to his regular studies he demonstrated considerable skill in wood carving and wax modelling and during this period won several prizes for poetical compositions in spanish which while sometimes juvenile in form and following closely after spanish models reveal at times flashes of thought and turns of expression that show distinct originality even in these early compositions there is that plaintive undertone that minor chord of sadness which pervades all his poems reaching its fullest measure of pathos in the verses written in his death cell he received a bachelor's degree according to the spanish system in eighteen seventy seven but continued advanced studies in agriculture at the ateneo at the same time that he was pursuing the course in philosophy in the dominican university of santo tomas where in eighteen seventy nine he startled the learned doctors by a reference in a prize poem to the philippines as his patria fatherland this political heresy on the part of a native of the islands was given no very serious attention at the time being looked upon as the vagary of a schoolboy but again in the following year by what seems a strange fatality he stirred the resentment of the friars especially the dominicans by winning over some of their number the first prize in a literary contest celebrated in honour of the author of don quixote the archaic instruction in santo tomas soon disgusted him and led to disagreements with the instructors and he turned to spain plans for his journey and his stay there had to be made with the utmost caution for it would hardly have fared well with his family had it become known that the son of a tenant on an estate which was a part of the university endowment was studying in europe he reached spanish territory first in barcelona the hotbed of radicalism where he heard a good deal of revolutionary talk which however seems to have made but little impression upon him for throughout his entire career breadth of thought and strength of character are revealed in his consistent opposition to all forms of violence in madrid he pursued the courses in medicine and philosophy but a fact of even more consequence than his proficiency in his regular work was his persistent study of languages and his omnivorous reading he was associated with the other filipinos who were working in a somewhat spectacular way misdirected rather than led by what may be styled the spanish liberals for more considerate treatment of the philippines but while he was among them he was not of them as his studious habits and reticent disposition would hardly have made him a favorite among those who were enjoying the broader and gayer life there 
Moreover, he soon advanced far beyond them in thought by realizing that they were beginning at the wrong end of the labor, for even at that time he seems to have caught, by what must almost be looked upon as an inspiration of genius, since there was nothing apparent in his training that would have suggested it, the realization of the fact that hope for his people lay in bettering their condition, that any real benefit must begin with the benighted folk at home, that the introduction of reforms for which they were unprepared would be useless, even dangerous to them. This was not at all the popular idea amongst his associates and led to serious disagreements with their leaders, for it was the way of toil and sacrifice without any of the excitement and glamour that came from drawing up magnificent plans and sending them back home with appeals for funds to carry on the propaganda, for the most part banquets and entertainments to Spain's political leaders. His views, as revealed in his purely political writings, may be succinctly stated, for he had that faculty of expression which never leaves any room for doubt as to the meaning. His people had a natural right to grow and to develop, and any obstacles to such growth and development were to be removed. He realized that the masses of his countrymen were sunk deep in poverty and ignorance, cringing and crouching before political authority, crawling and groveling before religious superstition, but to him this was no subject for jest or indifferent neglect. It was a serious condition which should be ameliorated, and hope lay in working into the inert social mass the leaven of conscious individual effort toward the development of a distinctive, responsible personality. He was profoundly appreciative of all the good that Spain had done, but saw in this no inconsistency with the desire that this gratitude might be given cause to be ever on the increase, thereby uniting the Philippines with the mother country by the firm bonds of common ideas and interests, for his earlier writings breathe nothing but admiration, respect and loyalty for Spain and her more advanced institutions. The issue was clear to him, and he tried to keep it so. It was indeed administrative myopia, introduced largely by blind greed, which allowed the friar orders to confuse the objections to their repressive system with an attack upon Spanish sovereignty, thereby dragging matters from bad to worse, to engender ill-feeling and finally desperation. This narrow, selfish policy had about as much soundness in it as the idea upon which it was based, so often brought forward with what looks very suspiciously like a specious effort to cover mental indolence with a glittering generality, that the Filipino is only a grown-up child and needs a strong paternal government, an idea which entirely overlooks the natural fact that when an impressionable subject comes within the influence of a stronger force from a higher civilization, he is very likely to remain a child, perhaps a stunted one, as long as he is treated as such. There is about as much sense and justice in such logic as there would be in that of keeping a babe confined in swaddling bands and then blaming it for not knowing how to walk. No creature will remain a healthy child forever, but, as Spain learned to her bitter cost, will be very prone, as the parents grow decrepit and it begins to feel its strength, to prove a troublesome subject to handle, thereby reversing the natural law suggested by the comparison and bringing such Sancho Panza statecraft to flounder at last through as hopeless confusion to as absurd a conclusion as his own island government. Rizal was not one of those rabid, self-seeking revolutionists who would merely overthrow the government and maintain the old system with themselves and the privileged places of the former rulers, nor is he to be classed among the misguided enthusiasts who by their intemperate demands and immoderate conduct merely strengthen the hands of those in power. He realized fully that the restrictions under which the people had become accustomed to order their lives should be removed gradually as they advanced under suitable guidance and became capable of adjusting themselves to the new and better conditions. They should take all the good offered from any source, especially that suited to their nature, which they could properly assimilate. No great patience was ever exhibited by him toward those of his countrymen, the most repulsive characters in his stories are such, 
who would make of themselves mere apes and mimes, decorating themselves with a veneer of questionable alien characteristics, but with no personality or stability of their own, presenting at best a spectacle to make devils laugh and angels weep, lacking even the hothouse product's virtue of being good to look upon. Reduced to a definite form, the wish of the more thoughtful in the new generation of Filipino leaders that was growing up was that the Philippine Islands be made a province of Spain with representation in the Cortes and the concomitant freedom of expression and criticism. All that was directly asked was some substantial participation in the management of local affairs and the curtailment of the arbitrary power of petty officials, especially of the friar curates, who constituted the chief obstacle to the education and development of the people. The friar orders were, however, all-powerful, not only in the Philippines, but also in Madrid, where they were not cheery of making use of a part of their wealth to maintain their influence. The efforts of the Filipinos in Spain, while closely watched, do not seem to have been given any very serious attention, for the Spanish authorities no doubt realized that as long as the young man stayed in Madrid writing manifestos in a language which less than one percent of their countrymen could read, and spending their money on members of the Cortes, there could be little danger of trouble in the Philippines. Moreover, the Spanish ministers themselves appear to have been in sympathy with the more moderate wishes of the Filipinos, a fact indicated by the number of changes ordered from time to time in the Philippine administration. But they were powerless before the strength and local influence of the religious orders. So matters dragged their weary way along, until there was an unexpected and startling development, a David Goliath contest, and certainly no one but a genius could have polished the smooth stone that was to smite the giant. It is said that the idea of writing a novel depicting conditions in his native land first came to Rizal from a perusal of Eugene Sue's The Wandering Jew while he was a student in Madrid, although the model for the greater part of it is plainly the delectable sketches in Don Quixote, for the author himself possessed in a remarkable degree that Cervantic touch which raises the commonplace, even the mean, into the highest regions of art. Not, however, until he had spent some time in Paris continuing his medical studies, and later in Germany, did anything definite result. But in 1887, Noli Metangere was printed in Berlin, in an establishment where the author is said to have worked part of his time as a compositor, in order to defray his expenses while he continued his studies. A limited edition was published through the financial aid extended by a Filipino associate and sent to Hong Kong, thence to be surreptitiously introduced into the Philippines. No Lime Tangere, Touch Me Not, at the time the work was written, had a peculiar fitness as a title. Not only was there an apt suggestion of a comparison with the common flower of that name, but the term is also applied in pathology to a malignant cancer which affects every bone and tissue in the body, and that this letter was in the author's mind would appear from the dedication and from the summing up of the Philippine situation in the final conversation between Ibarra and Elias. But in a letter written to a friend in Paris at the time, the author himself says that it was taken from the gospel scene where the risen Saviour appears to the Magdalene, to whom he addresses these words, a scene that has been the subject of several notable paintings. In this connection it is interesting to note what he himself thought of the work, and his frank statement of what he had tried to accomplish, made just as he was publishing it, Noli me tangere, an expression taken from the Gospel of St. Luke, means, touch me not. The book contains things of which no one up to the present time has spoken, for they are so sensitive that they have never suffered themselves to be touched by anyone whomsoever. For my own part, I have attempted to do what no one else has been willing to do. I have dared to answer the calumnities that have for centuries been heaped upon us and our country. I have written of the social condition and the life, of our beliefs, our hopes, our longings, our complaints and our sorrows. 
I have unmasked the hypocrisy which, under the cloak of religion, has come among us to impoverish and to brutalize us. I have distinguished the true religion from the false, from the superstition that traffics with the holy word to get money and to make us believe in absurdities for which Catholicism would blush if it ever knew of them. I have unveiled that which has been hidden behind the deceptive and dazzling words of our governments. I have told our countrymen of our mistakes, our vices, our faults, and our weak complacence with our miseries there. Where I have found virtue, I have spoken of it highly, in order to render it homage, and if I have not wept in speaking of our misfortunes, I have laughed over them, for no one would wish to weep with me over our woes, and laughter is ever the best means of concealing sorrow. The deeds that I have related are true, and have actually occurred, I can furnish proof of this. My book may have, and it does have, defects from an artistic and aesthetic point of view. This I do not deny, but no one can dispute the veracity of the facts presented. But while the primary purpose and first effect of the work was to crystallize anti-friar sentiment, the author has risen above a mere personal attack, which would give it only a temporary value and by portraying in so clear and sympathetic a way the life of his people has produced a piece of real literature, of especial interest now as they are being swept into the newer day. Any fool can point out errors and defects if they are at all apparent, and the persistent searching them out for their own sake is the surest mark of the vulpine mind, but the author has cast aside all such petty considerations, and, whether consciously or not, has left a work of permanent value to his own people, and of interest to all friends of humanity. If ever a fair land has been cursed with the wearisome breed of fault-finders, both indigenous and exotic, that land is the Philippines, so it is indeed refreshing to turn from the dreary waste of carping criticism, pragmatical, scientific, analysis, and sneering half-truths, to a story pulsating with life, presenting the Filipino as a human being, with his virtues and his vices, his loves and hates, his hopes and fears. The publication of Noli Me Tangere suggests the reflection that the story of Achilles' heel is a myth only in form. The belief that any institution, system, organization or arrangement has reached an absolute form is about as far as human folly can go. The friar orders looked upon themselves as the sum of human achievement in man-driving and God-persuading, divinely appointed to rule, fixed in their power, far above suspicion. Yet they were obsessed by the sensitive, covered dread of exposure that ever lurks spectrally under Pharisaism's spacious robe, so when there appeared this work of a miserable Indian who dared to portray them and the conditions that their control produced exactly as they were, for the indefinable touch by which the author gives an air of unimpeachable veracity to his story is perhaps its greatest artistic merit, the effect upon the mercurial Spanish temperament was, to say the least, electric. The very audacity of the thing left the friars breathless. A committee of learned doctors from Santo Tomas, who were appointed to examine the work, unmercifully scored it as attacking everything from the state religion to the integrity of the Spanish dominions, so the circulation of it in the Philippines was, of course, strictly prohibited, which naturally made the demand for it greater. Large sums were paid for single copies, of which, it might be remarked in passing, the author himself received scarcely any part, Collections have ever had a curious habit of going astray in the Philippines. Although the possession of a copy by a Filipino usually meant summary imprisonment or deportation, often with the concomitant confiscation of property for the benefit of some patriot, the book was widely read among the leading families and had the desired effect of crystallizing the sentiment against the friars, thus to pave the way for concerted action. At last the idol had been flouted, so all could attack it. 
Within a year after it had begun to circulate in the Philippines, a memorial was presented to the archbishop by quite a respectable part of the Filipinos in Manila, respecting that the friar orders be expelled from the country. But this resulted only in the deportation of every signer of the petition upon whom the government could lay hands. They were scattered literally to the four corners of the earth, some to the Ladrone Islands, some to Fernando Po of the west coast of Africa, some to Spanish prisons, others to remote parts of the Philippines. Meanwhile, the author had returned to the Philippines for a visit to his family, during which time he was constantly attended by an officer of the civil guard, detailed ostensibly as a bodyguard. All his movements were closely watched, and after a few months the captain-general advised him to leave the country, at the same time requesting a copy of Noli Metangere, saying that the excerpts submitted to him by the censor had awakened a desire to read the entire work. Rizal returned to Europe by way of Japan and the United States, which did not seem to make any distinct impression upon him, although it was only a little later that he predicted that when Spain lost control of the Philippines, an eventuality he seemed to consider certain not far in the future, the United States would be a probable successor. Returning to Europe, he spent some time in London preparing an edition of Morga's Successos de las Filipinas, a work published in Mexico about 1606 by the principal actor in some of the most stirring scenes of the formative period of the Philippine government. It is a record of prime importance in Philippine history, and the resuscitation of it was no small service to the country. Rizal added notes tending to show that the Filipinos had been possessed of considerable culture and civilization before the Spanish conquest, and he even intimidated that they had retrograded rather than advanced under Spanish tutelage. But such an extreme view must be ascribed to patriotic ardor, for Rizal himself, though possessed of that intangible quality commonly known as genius and partly trained in northern Europe, is still, in his own personality, the strongest refutation of such a contention. Later, in Ghent, he published El Filibusterismo, called by him a continuation of Noli Metangere, but with which it really has no more connection than that some of the characters reappear and are disposed of. There is almost no connected plot in it and hardly any action, but there is the same incisive character drawing and clear etching of conditions that characterize the earlier work. It is a maturer effort and a more forceful political argument. Hence, it lacks the charm and simplicity which assign Noli Metangere to a preeminent place in Philippine literature. The light satire of the earlier work is replaced by bitter sarcasm delivered with deliberate intent for the iron had evidently entered his soul with broadening experience and the realization that justice at the hands of decadent Spain had been an iridescent dream of his youth. Nor had the Spanish authorities in the Philippines been idle, his relatives had been subjected to all the annoyances and irritations of petty persecution, eventually losing the greater part of their property, while some of them suffered deportation. In 1891, he returned to Hong Kong to practice medicine, in which profession he had remarkable success, even coming to be looked upon as a wizard by his simple countrymen, among whom circulated wonderful accounts of his magical powers. He was especially skilled in ophthalmology, and his first operation after returning from his studies in Europe was to restore his mother's sight by removing a cataract from one of her eyes, an achievement which no doubt formed the basis of marvellous tales. But the misfortunes of his people were ever the paramount consideration, so he wrote to the captain-general requesting permission to remove his numerous relatives to Borneo to establish a colony there, for which purpose liberal concessions had been offered him by the British government. The request was denied and further stigmatized as an unpatriotic attempt to lessen the population of the Philippines when labor was already scarce. This was the answer he received to a reasonable petition after the homes of his family, including his own birthplace, had been ruthlessly destroyed by military force, 
while a quarrel over ownership and rents was still pending in the courts. The captain-general at that time was Valeriano Vailer, the pitiless instrument of the reactionary forces manipulated by the monastic orders, he who was later sent to Cuba to introduce there the repressive measures which had apparently been so efficacious in the Philippines, thus to bring on the interference of the United States to end Spain's colonial power, all of which induces the reflection that there may still be deluded casuists who doubt the reality of Nemesis. Weyler was succeeded by Eulogio Despujols, who made sincere attempts to reform the administration and was quite popular with the Filipinos. In reply to repeated requests from Rizal to be permitted to return to the Philippines unmolested, a passport was finally granted to him and he set out for Manila. For this move on his part, in addition to the natural desire to be among his own people, two special reasons appear. He wished to investigate and stop, if possible, the unwarranted use of his name in taking up collections that always remained mysteriously unaccounted for, and he was drawn by a ruse deliberately planned and executed in that his mother was several times officiously arrested and hustled about as a common criminal in order to work upon the son's filial feelings and thus get him back within reach of the Spanish authority which, as subsequent events and later researches have shown, was the real intention in issuing the passport. Entirely unsuspecting any ulterior motive, however, in a few days after his arrival he convoked a motley gathering of Filipinos of all grades of the population, for he seems to have been only slightly acquainted among his own people, and not at all versed in the mazy Walpurgis dance of Philippine politics, and laid before it the constitution for a Liga Filipina, Philippine League, an organization looking toward greater unity among the Filipinos and cooperation for economic progress. This Liga was no doubt the result of his observations in England and Germany, and despite its questionable form as a secret society for political and economic purposes, was assuredly a step in the right direction but unfortunately its significance was beyond the comprehension of his countrymen, most of whom saw in it only an opportunity for harassing the Spanish government, for which all were ready enough. All his movements were closely watched, and a few days after his return he was arrested on the charge of having seditious literature in his baggage. The friars were already clamouring for his blood, but Despujols seems to have been more in sympathy with Rizal than with the man whose tool he found himself forced to be. Without trial, Rizal was ordered deported to Dapitan, a small settlement on the northern coast of Mindanao. The decree ordering his deportation and the destruction of all copies of his books to be found in the Philippines is a marvel of sophistry, since, in the words of a Spanish writer of the time, in this document we do not know which to wonder at most, the ingenuousness of the governor-general, for in this decree he implicitly acknowledges his weakness and proneness to error, or the candor of Rizal, who believed that all the way was strewn with roses. But it is quite evident that Despujols was playing a double game, of which he seems to have been rather ashamed, for he gave strict orders that copies of the decree should be withheld from Rizal. In Dapitan, Rizal gave himself up to his studies and such medical practice as sought him out in that remote spot, for the fame of his skill was widely extended and he was allowed to live unmolested under parole that he would make no attempts to escape. In company with a Jesuit missionary, he gathered about him a number of native boys and conducted a practical school on the German plan, at the same time indulging in religious polemics with his Jesuit acquaintances by correspondence and working fitfully on some compositions which were never completed, noteworthy among them being a study in English of the Tagalog verb. But while he was living thus quietly in Dapitan, events that were to determine his fate were misshaping themselves in Manila. The stone had been loosened on the mountainside and was bounding on in mad career, far beyond his control. End of Introduction, Part 2
Introduction Part 3 of The Social Cancer, a complete English version of Norlime Tangere from the Spanish of José Rizal by Charles Darbyshire. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avaí in October 2011. Norlime Tangere by José Rizal. Translator's Introduction, Part 3. He who of old would rend the oak, dreamed not of the rebound, chained by the trunk he vainly broke, alone, how looked he round? Byron Reason and moderation in the person of Rizal, scorned and banished, the spirit of Jean-Paul Marat and John Brown of Osavatomi, rises to the fore in the shape of one Andres Bonifacio, warehouse porter who sits up on nights copying all the letters and documents that he can lay hands on composing grandiloquent manifestos in tagalog drawing up magnificent appointments in the names of prominent persons who would later suffer even to the shedding of their life's blood through his mania for writing history in advance spelling out spanish tales of the french revolution babbling of liberty equality and fraternity hinting darkly to his confidants that the president of France had begun life as a blacksmith. Only a few days after Rizal was so summarily hustled away, Bonifacio gathered together a crowd of malcontents and ignorant dupes, some of them composing as choice a gang of cutthroats as ever slit the gullet of a Chinese or tied mutilated prisoners in anthills, and solemnly organized the Kataas ta sang, kagalang galang, katipunan ang amga, anak ang bayan, supreme select association of the sons of the people, for the extermination of the ruling race and the restoration of the golden age. It was to bring the people into concerted action for a general revolt on a fixed date, when they would rise simultaneously, take possession of the city of Manila, and the rest were better left to the imagination for they had been reared under the spanish colonial system and imitativeness has ever been pointed out as a cardinal trait in the filipino character no quarter was to be asked or given and the most sacred ties even of consanguinity were to be disregarded in the general slaughter to the inquiry of a curious neophyte as to how the spaniards were to be distinguished from other europeans in order to avoid international complications, Dark Andres replied that in case of doubt they should proceed with due caution, but should take good care that they made no mistakes about letting any of the Castillas escape their vengeance. The higher officials of the government were to be taken alive as hostages, while the friars were to be reserved for a special holocaust on Bangumbayan field, where over their incinerated remains a heaven-kissing monument would be erected. This Katipunan seems to have been an outgrowth from Spanish Freemasonry, introduced into the Philippines by a Spaniard named Moraita and Marcelo H. del Pilar, a native of Bulacan province, who was the practical leader of the Filipinos in Spain, but who died there in 1896, just as he was setting out for Hong Kong to mature his plans for a general uprising to expel the friar orders. There had been some Masonic societies in the islands for some time, but the membership had been limited to peninsulas, and they played no part in the politics of the time. But about 1888, Filipinos began to be admitted into some of them, and later, chiefly through the exertions of Pilar, lodges exclusively for them were instituted. These soon began to display great activity, especially in the transcendental matter of collections, so that their existence became a source of care to the government and a nightmare to the religious orders. From them, and with a perversion of the idea in the Rizal's stillborn Liga, it was an easy transition to the Katipunan, which was to put aside all pretense of reconciliation with Spain, and at the appointed time rise to exterminate not only the friars, but also all the Spaniards and Spanish sympathizers, 
thus to bring about the reign of liberty, equality, and fraternity, under the benign guidance of Patriot Bonifacio, with his bolo for a sceptre. With its secrecy and mystic forms, its methods of threats and intimidation, the Katipunan spread rapidly, especially among the Tagalogs, the most intransignant of the native peoples, and, it should be noted, the ones in whose territory the friars were the principal landlords. It was organized on the triangle plan, so that no member might know or communicate with more than three others, the one above him from whom he received his information and instructions, and two below to whom he transmitted them. The initiations were conducted with great secrecy and solemnity, calculated to inspire the new members with awe and fear. The initiate, after a series of blood-curdling ordeals to try out his courage and resolution, swore on a human skull a terrific oath to devote his life and energies to the extermination of the white race, regardless of age or sex, and later affixed to it his signature or mark, usually the letter, with his own blood taken from an incision in the left arm or left breast. This was one form of the famous blood compact, which, if history reads aright, played so important a part in the assumption of sovereignty over the Philippines by Legaspi in the name of Philip II. Rizal was made the honorary president of the association. His portrait hung in all the meeting halls, and the magic of his name used to attract the easily deluded masses, who were in a state of agitated ignorance and growing unrest, ripe for any movement that looked anti-governmental and especially anti-Spanish. Soon after the organization had been perfected, collections began to be taken up. These collections were never overlooked, for the purpose of chartering a steamer to rescue him from Dapitan and transport him to Singapore, whence he might direct the general uprising, the day and the hour for which were fixed by Bonifacio for August 26, 1896, at six o'clock sharp in the evening, since lack of precision in his magnificent programs was never a fault of that bold patriot, his logic being as severe as that of the Filipino policeman who put the flag at half-mast on Good Friday. Of all this, Rizal himself was, of course, entirely ignorant, until in May 1896, a Filipino doctor named Pio Valenzuela, a creature of Bonifacio's, was dispatched to Dapitan, taking along a blind man as a pretext for the visit to the famous oculist, to lay the plans before him for his consent and approval. Rizal expostulated with Valenzuela for a time over such a mad and hopeless venture, which would only bring ruin and misery upon the masses, and then is said to have very humanely lost his patience, ending the interview in so bad a humour and with words so offensive that the deponent, who had gone with the intention of remaining there a month, took the steamer on the following day for return to Manila. He reported secretly to Bonifacio, who bestowed several choice Tagalog epithets on Rizal and charged his envoy to say nothing about the failure of his mission, but rather to give the impression that he had been successful. Rizal's name continued to be used as the shibboleth of the insurrection, and the masses were made to believe that he would appear as their leader at the appointed hour. Vague reports from police officers, to the effect that something unusual in the nature of secret societies was going on among the people, began to reach the government, but no great attention was paid to them until the evening of August 19th, when the parish priest of Tondo was informed by the mother superior of one of the convent schools that she had just learned of a plot to massacre all the Spaniards. She had the information from a devoted pupil, whose brother was a compositor in the office of the Diario de Manila. As is so frequent the case in Filipino families, his elder sister was the purse-holder, and the brother's insistent requests for money, which was needed by him to meet the repeated assessments made on the members as the critical hour approached, awakened her curiosity and suspicion to such an extent that she forced him to confide the whole plan to her. Without delay she divulged it to her patroness, 
who in turn notified the curate of Tondo, where the printing office was located. The priest called in two officers of the civil guard, who arrested the young printer, frightened a confession out of him, and that night, in company with the friar, searched the printing office, finding secreted there several lithographic plates for printing receipts and certificates of membership in the Katipunan, with a number of documents giving some account of the plot. Then the Spanish population went wild. General Ramon Blanco was governor, and seems to have been about the only person who kept his head at all. He tried to prevent giving so irresponsible a movement a fictitious importance, but was utterly powerless to stay the clamour for blood which at once arose, loudest on the part of those alleged ministers of the gentle Christ. The gates of the old walled city, long fallen into disuse, were cleaned and put in order, martial law was declared, and wholesale arrests made. Many of the prisoners were confined in Fort Santiago, one batch being crowded into a dungeon for which the only ventilation was a grated opening at the top, and one night a sergeant of the guard carelessly spread his sleeping mat over this, so the next morning some fifty-five asphyxiated corpses were hauled away. On the 26th, armed insurrection broke out at Kalukan, just north of Manila, from time immemorial the resort of bad characters from all the country round, and the centre of brigandage, while at San Juan del Monte, on the outskirts of the city, several bloody skirmishes were fought a few days later with the Guardia Civil Veterana, the picked police force. Bonifacio had been warned of the discovery of his schemes in time to make his escape and flee to the barrio, or village, of Balintavac, a few miles north of Manila, thence to lead the attack on Calucan and inaugurate the reign of liberty, equality, and fraternity, in the manner in which Philippine insurrections have generally had a habit of starting, with the murder of Chinese merchants and the pillage of their shops. He had from the first reserved for himself the important office of treasurer in the Katipunan, in addition to being an occasion's president and at all times its ruling spirit, so he now established himself as dictator and proceeded to appoint a magnificent staff, most of whom contrived to escape as soon as they were out of reach of his bolo. Yet he drew considerable numbers about him, for this man, though almost entirely unlettered, seems to have been quite a personality among his own people, especially possessed of that gift of oratory in his native tongue to which the Malay is so pre-eminently susceptible. In Manila a special tribunal was constituted and worked steadily, sometimes through the siesta hour, for there were times, of which this was one, when even Spanish justice could be swift. Bagumbayan began to be a veritable field of blood, as the old methods of repression were resorted to for the purpose of striking terror into the native population by wholesale executions. Nor did the ruling powers realize that the time for such methods had passed. It was a case of sixteenth-century colonial methods fallen into fretful and frantic senility. So in all this wretched business it is doubtful whom to pity the more, the blind stupidity of the fossilized conservatives, incontinently throwing an empire away, forfeiting their influence over a people whom they, by temperament and experience, should have been fitted to control and govern, or the potential cruelty of perverted human nature in the dark Frankenstein, who would wreak upon the rulers in their decadent days the most hideous of the methods in the system that produced him, as he planned his festive holocaust and carmagnole on the spot where every spark of initiative and leadership among his people, both good and bad, had been summarily and ruthlessly extinguished. There is at least a world of reflection in it for the rulers of man. In the meantime, Rizal, wearying of the quiet life in Dapitan, and doubtless foreseeing the impending catastrophe, had requested leave to volunteer his services as a physician in the military hospitals of Cuba, of the horrors and sufferings in which he had heard. General Blanco at once gladly acceded to his request and had him brought to Manila, 
but unfortunately the boat carrying him arrived there a day too late for him to catch the regular August mail steamer to Spain, so he was kept in the cruiser a prisoner of war, awaiting the next transportation. While he was thus detained, the Katipunan plot was discovered, and the rebellion broke out. He was accused of being the head of it, but Blanco gave him a personal letter completely exonerating him from any complicity in the outbreak, as well as a letter of recommendation to the Spanish Minister of War. He was placed on the Isla de Panay when it left for Spain on September 3rd and travelled at first as a passenger. At Singapore he was advised to land and claim British protection, as did some of his fellow travellers, but he refused to do so, saying that his conscience was clear. As the name of Rizal had constantly recurred during the trials of the Katipunan suspects, the military tribunal finally issued a formal demand for him. The order of arrest was cabled to Port Said, and Rizal there placed in solitary confinement for the remainder of the voyage. Arrived at Barcelona, he was confined in the grim fortress of Montjuich, where, by curious coincidence, the governor was the same Despujols who had issued the decree of banishment in 1892. Shortly afterwards he was placed on the transport Colon, which was bound for the Philippines with troops, Blanco having at last been stirred to action. Strenuous efforts were now made by Rizal's friends in London to have him removed from the ship at Singapore, but the British authorities declined to take any action, on the ground that he was on a Spanish warship and therefore beyond the jurisdiction of their courts. The Colon arrived at Manila on November 3rd, and the Rizal was imprisoned in Fort Santiago, while a special tribunal was constituted to try him on the charges of carrying on anti-patriotic and anti-religious propaganda, rebellion, sedition, and the formation of illegal associations. Some other charges may have been overlooked in the hurry and excitement. It would be almost a travesty to call a trial the proceedings which began early in December and dragged along until the 26th. Rizal was defended by a young Spanish officer selected by him from among a number designated by the tribunal, who performed so unpopular a duty as well as he could. But the whole affair was a mockery of justice, for the Spanish government in the Philippines had finally and hopelessly reached a condition graphically pictured by Mr. Kipling. Panic that shells the drifting spar, loud waste with none to check, mad fear that rakes a scornful star, or sweeps a consort's deck. The clamour against Blanco had resulted in his summary removal by royal decree and the appointment of a real pacificator, Camilo Polavieja. While in prison, Rizal prepared an address to those of his countrymen who were in armed rebellion, repudiating the use of his name and deprecating the resort to violence. The closing words are a compendium of his life and beliefs. Quote, countrymen, I have given proofs, as well as the best of you, of desiring liberty for our country, and I continue to desire it. But I place as a premise the education of the people, so that by means of instruction and work they may have a personality of their own, and that they may make themselves worthy of that same liberty. In my writings I have recommended the study of the civic virtues, without which there can be no redemption. I have also written, and my words have been repeated, that reforms, to be fruitful, must come from above, that those which spring from below are uncertain and insecure movements. Imbued with these ideas, I cannot do less than condemn, and I do condemn, this absurd, savage rebellion, planned behind my back, which dishonors the Filipinos and discredits those who can speak for us. I abominate all criminal actions and refuse any kind of participation in them, pitying with all my heart the dupes who have allowed themselves to be deceived. Go back, then, to your homes, and may God forgive those who have acted in bad faith. End quote. This address, however, was not published by the Spanish authorities, 
since they did not consider it patriotic enough. Instead, they killed the writer. Rizal appeared before the tribunal, bound, closely guarded by two peninsula soldiers, but maintained his serenity throughout and answered the charges in a straightforward way. He pointed out the fact that he had never taken any great part in politics, having even quarrelled with Marcelo del Pilar, the active leader of the anti-clericals, by reason of those perennial subscriptions, and that during the time he was accused of being the instigator and organizer of armed rebellion, he had been a close prisoner in Dapitan under strict surveillance by both the military and ecclesiastical authorities. The prosecutor presented a lengthy document, which ran mostly to words, about the only definite conclusion laid down in being that the Philippines are, and always must remain, Spanish territory. What there may have been in Rizal's career to hang such a conclusion upon is not quite clear, but at any rate, this learned legal light was evidently still thinking in colours on the map, serenely unconscious in his European pseudo-presence of the new and wonderful development in the Western Hemisphere, humanity militant Lincolnism. The death sentence was asked, but the longer the case dragged on, the more favourable it began to look for the accused. So the president of the tribunal, after deciding, Jeffreys-like, that the charges had been proved, ordered that no further evidence be taken. Rizal betrayed some sunrise when his doom was thus foreshadowed, for, dreamer that he was, he seems not to have anticipated such a fatal eventuality for himself. He did not lose his serenity, however, when the tribunal promptly brought in a verdict of guilty and imposed the death sentence, upon which Pola Vieja the next day placed his cumplase, fixing the morning of December 30th for the execution. So Rizal's fate was sealed. The witnesses against him, in so far as there was any substantial testimony at all, had been his own countrymen, coerced or cajoled into making statements which they have since repudiated as false, and which in some cases were extorted from them by threats and even torture. But he betrayed very little emotion, even maintaining what must have been an assumed cheerfulness. Only one reproach is recorded, that he had been made a dupe of, that he had been deceived by everyone, even the banqueros and cocheros. His old Jesuit instructors remained with him in the capilla, or death cell, and largely through the influence of an image of the Sacred Heart, which he had carved as a schoolboy, it is claimed that reconciliation with the Church was effected. There has been considerable pragmatical discussion as to what form of retraction from him was necessary, since he had been, after studying in Europe, a frank freethinker, but such futile polemics may safely be left to the learned doctors. That he was reconciled with the Church would seem to be evidenced by the fact that just before the execution he gave legal status as his wife to the woman, a rather remarkable Eurasian adventuress, who had lived with him in Dapitan, and the religious ceremony was the only one then recognized in the islands. The greater part of his last night on earth was spent in composing a chain of verse, no very majestic flight of poesy, but a pathetic monody throbbing with patient resignation and inextinguishable hope, one of the sweetest, saddest swan songs ever sung. Thus he was left at the last, entirely alone. As soon as his doom became certain, the patriots had all scurried to cover, one gentle poetaster even rushing into doggerel verse to condemn him as a reversion to barbarism. The wealthier suspects betook themselves to other lands or made judicious use of their money-bags among the Spanish officials. The better classes of the population floundered hopelessly, leaderless in the confused whirl of opinions and passions, while the voiceless millions for whom he had spoken moved on in dumb, uncomprehending silence. He had lived in that higher dreamland of the future, ahead of his countrymen, ahead even of those who assumed to be the mentors of his people, and he must learn, as does every noble soul, that labours to make the bounds of freedom wider yet, 
the bitter lesson that nine-tenths, if not all, the woes that afflict humanity spring from man's own stupid selfishness, that the wresting of the scepter from the tyrant is often the least of the task, that the bondman comes to love his bonds, like Chillen's prisoner, his very chains and he grow friends, but that the struggle for human freedom must go on, at whatever cost, in ever-widening circles, wave after wave, each mightier than the last, for as long as one body toils in fetters or one mind welters in blind ignorance, either of the slave's base delusion or the despot's specious illusion, there can be no final security for any free man or his children or his children's children. End of Introduction, Part 3《Introduction》Part 4 of The Social Cancer, a complete English version of Noli Me Tangere from the Spanish of Jose Rizal by Charles Darbyshire. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avaí in October 2011. Translator's Introduction, Part 4 God save thee, ancient mariner, from the fiends that plague thee thus. Why lookst thou so? With my crossbow I shot the albatross. Coleridge It was one of those magic December mornings of the tropics, the very nuptials of earth and sky, when great nature seems to fling herself incontinently into creation, wrapping the world in a brooding calm of light and colour, that Spain chose for committing political suicide in the Philippines. Bagumbayan Field was crowded with troops, both regulars and militia, for every man capable of being trusted with arms was drawn up there, excepting only the necessary guards in other parts of the city. Extra patrols were in the streets, double guards were placed over the archiepiscopal and gubernatorial palaces. The calmest man in all Manila that day was he who must stand before the firing squad. Two special and unusual features are to be noted about this execution. All the principal actors were Filipinos. The commander of the troops and the officer directly in charge of the execution were native-born, while the firing squad itself was drawn from a local native regiment, though it is true that on this occasion a squad of peninsula cazadores, armed with loaded mausers, stood directly behind them to see that they failed not in their duty. Again there was but one victim, for it seems to have ever been the custom of the Spanish rulers to associate in these gruesome affairs some real criminals with the political offenders, no doubt with the intentional purpose of confusing the issue in the general mind. Rizal, standing alone, the occasion of so much hurried preparation and fearful precaution, is a pathetic testimonial to the degree of incapacity into which the ruling powers had fallen, even in chicanery. After bidding good-bye to his sister and making final disposition regarding some personal property, the doomed man, under close guard, walked calmly, even cheerfully, from Fort Santiago along the Malecon to the Luneta, accompanied by his Jesuit confessors. Arrived there, he thanked those about him for their kindness, and requested the officer in charge to allow him to face the firing squad, since he had never been a traitor to Spain. This the officer declined to permit, for the order was to shoot him in the back. Rizal assented with a slight protest, pointing out to the soldiers the spot in his back at which they should aim, and with a firm step took his place in front of them. Then occurred an act almost too hideous to record. There he stood, expecting a volley of Remington bullets in his back. Time was, and life's stream ebbed to eternity's flood, when the military surgeon stepped forward and asked if he might feel his pulse. Rizal extended his left hand, and the officer remarked that he could not understand how a man's pulse could beat normally at such a terrific moment. The victim shrugged his shoulders and let the hand fall again to his side. Latin refinement could be no further refined. 
A moment later, there he lay, on his right side, his life blood spurting over the luneta curb, eyes wide open, fixedly staring at that heaven where the priests had thought all those centuries agone that justice abides. The troops filed past the body, for the most part silently, while desultory cries of Viva España from among the patriotic Filipino volunteers were summarily hushed by a Spanish artillery officer's stern rebuke. Silence, you rabble! To drown out the fitful cheers and the audible murmurs, the bands struck up Spanish national airs. Stranger death dirge no man and system ever heard. Carnival revelers now dance upon the scene, and Filipino schoolboys play baseball over that same spot. A few days later, another execution was held on that spot, of members of the Liga, some of them characters that would have richly deserved shooting at any place or time, according to existing standards. But notable among them there knelt, torture-crazed, as to his orisons, Francisco Rosas, millionaire capitalist, who may be regarded as the social and economic head of the Filipino people, as Rizal was fitted to be their intellectual leader. Shades of Anda and Vargas. Out there, at Palintavac, rather fitly, the home of the snake demon, not three hours' march from this same spot, on the very edge of the city, Andres Bonifacio and his literally sans culottic gangs of cutthroats were, almost with impunity, soiling the fair name of freedom with murder and mutilation, rape and rapine, awakening the worst passions of an excitable, impulsive people, destroying that essential respect for law and order which to restore would take a holocaust of fire and blood with a generation of severe training. Unquestionably did Rizal demonstrate himself to be a seer and prophet when he applied to such a system the story of Babylon and a fateful handwriting on the wall. But forces had been loosened that would not be so suppressed. The time had gone by when such wild methods of repression would serve. The destruction of the native leaders, culminating in the executions of Rizal and Rosas, produced a counter-effect by rousing the Tagalogs, good and bad alike, to desperate fury, and the aftermath was frightful. The better classes were driven to take part in the rebellion, and Cavite especially became a veritable slaughter pen, as the contest settled down into a hideous struggle for mutual extermination. Dark Andres went his wild way to perish by the violence he had himself invoked, a prey to the rising ambition of a young leader of considerable culture and ability, a schoolmaster named Emilio Aguinaldo. His Katipunan hovered fitfully around Manila, for a time even drawing to itself in their desperation some of the better elements of the population, only to find itself sold out and deserted by its leaders, dying away for a time. But later, under changed conditions, it reappeared in strange metamorphosis as the rallying centre for a large number of Filipinos who have ever gathered together for a common purpose, and then finally went down before those thin, grim lines in khaki with sharp and sharpest shot clearing away the wreck of the old, blazing the way for the new, the broadening sweep of democracy announcing in rifle volleys death winged under her star banner to the tune of yankee doodle doo that she is born and whirlwind like will envelop the whole world manila december first nineteen o nine author's dedication to my fatherland Recorded in the history of human sufferings is a cancer of so malignant a character that the least touch irritates it and awakens in it the sharpest pains. Thus, how many times, when in the midst of modern civilizations I have wished to call thee before me, now to accompany me in memories, now to compare thee with other countries, hath thy dear image presented itself showing a social cancer like to that other. Desiring thy welfare, which is our own, and seeking the best treatment, I will do with thee what the ancients did with their sick, 
exposing them on the steps of the temple so that every one who came to invoke the divinity might offer them a remedy and to this end i will strive to reproduce thy condition faithfully without discriminations i will raise a part of the veil that covers the evil sacrificing to truth everything even vanity itself since as thy son i am conscious that i also suffer from thy defects and weaknesses the author europe eighteen eighty six end of introduction part four chapter one of the social cancer a complete english version of noli me tangere from the spanish of jose rizal by charles darbyshire this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by avai in november two thousand eleven chapter one a social gathering on the last of October, Don Santiago de los Santos, popularly known as Capitan Tiago, gave a dinner. In spite of the fact that, contrary to his usual custom, he had made the announcement only that afternoon, it was already the sole topic of conversation in Binondo and adjacent districts, and even in the walled city for at that time capitan tiago was considered one of the most hospitable of men and it was well known that his house like his country shut its doors against nothing except commerce and all new or bold ideas like an electric shock the announcement ran through the world of parasites bores and hangers-on whom god in his infinite bounty creates and so kindly multiplies in manila some looked at once for shoe polish others for buttons and cravats but all were especially concerned about how to greet the master of the house in the most familiar tone in order to create an atmosphere of ancient friendship or if occasion should arise to excuse a late arrival this dinner was given in a house on calle anloage and although we do not remember the number we will describe it in such a way that it may still be recognized provided the earthquakes have not destroyed it. We do not believe that its owner has had it torn down, for such labours are generally entrusted to God or nature, which powers hold the contracts also for many of the projects of our government. It is a rather large building, in the style of many in the country, and fronts upon the arm of the Pasig, which is known to some as the Binondo River, and which, like all the streams in Manila, plays the very roles of bath, sewer, laundry, fishery, means of transportation and communication, and even drinking water, if the Chinese water carrier finds it convenient. It is worthy of note that in the distance of nearly a mile this important artery of the district, where traffic is most dense and movement most deafening, can boast of only one wooden bridge, which is out of repair on one side for six months, and impassable on the other for the rest of the year, so that during the hot season the ponies take advantage of this permanent status quo to jump off the bridge into the water, to the great surprise of the abstracted mortal who may be dozing inside the carriage of philosophizing upon the progress of the age. The house of which we are speaking is somewhat low and not exactly correct in all its lines, whether the architect who built it was afflicted with poor eyesight, or whether the earthquakes and typhoons have twisted it out of shape, no one can say with certainty. A wide staircase with green newels and carpeted steps leads from the tiled entrance up to the main floor, between rows of flower-pots set upon pedestals of motley-coloured and fantastically decorated Chinese porcelain. Since there are neither porters nor servants who demand invitation cards, we will go in, O oh you who read this, whether friend or foe, if you are attracted by the strains of the orchestra, the lights, or the suggestive rattling of dishes, knives, and forks, and if you wish to see what such a gathering is like in the distant pearl of the Orient. Gladly, and for my own comfort, I should spare you this description of the house, were it not of great importance, since we mortals in general are very much like tortoises. We are esteemed and classified according to our shells. In this, and still other respects, the mortals of the Philippines in particular also resemble tortoises. 
If we go up the stairs, we immediately find ourselves in a spacious hallway, called there, for some unknown reason, the Kaida, which tonight serves as the dining room and at the same time affords a place for the orchestra. In the center, a large table, profusely and expensively decorated, seems to beckon to the hanger-on with sweet promises, while it threatens the bashful maiden, the simple Dalaga, with two mortal hours in the company of strangers whose language and conversation usually have a very restricted and special character. Contrasted with these terrestrial preparations are the motley paintings on the walls representing religious matters, such as Purgatory, Hell, The Last Judgment, The Death of the Just, and The Death of the Sinner. At the back of the room, fastened in a splendid and elegant framework in the Renaissance style, possibly by Arevalo, is a glass case in which are seen the figures of two old women. The inscription on this reads, Our Lady of Peace and Prosperous Voyages, who is worshipped in Antipolo, visiting in the disguise of a beggar the holy and renowned Capitana Inés during her sickness. While the work reveals little taste or art, yet it possesses in compensation an extreme realism, for to judge from the yellow and bluish tints of her face, the sick woman seems to be already a decaying corpse, and the glasses and other objects, accompaniments of long illness, are so minutely reproduced that even their contents may be distinguished. In looking at these pictures, which excite the appetite and inspire gay, bucolic ideas, one may perhaps be led to think that the malicious host is well acquainted with the characters of the majority of those who are to sit at his table, and that, in order to conceal his own way of thinking, he has hung from the ceiling costly Chinese lanterns, bird cages without birds, red, green, and blue globes of frosted glass, faded air plants, and dried and inflated fishes, which they call botetes. The view is closed on the side of the river by curious wooden arches, half Chinese and half European, affording glimpses of a terrace with arbors and bowers faintly lighted by paper lanterns of many colors. In the sala, among massive mirrors and gleaming chandeliers, the guests are assembled. Here, on a raised platform, stands a grand piano of great price, which tonight has the additional virtue of not being played upon. Here, hanging on the wall, is an oil painting of a handsome man in full dress, rigid, erect, straight as the tasseled cane he holds in his stiff, ring-covered fingers, the whole seeming to say, Ahem! See how well-dressed and how dignified I am! The furnishings of the room are elegant and perhaps uncomfortable and unhealthful, since the master of the house would consider not so much the comfort and health of his guests as his own ostentation. A terrible thing is dysentery, he would say to them, but you are sitting in European chairs and that is something you don't find every day. This room is almost filled with people, the men being separated from the women as in synagogues and Catholic churches. The women consist of a number of Filipino and Spanish maidens, who, when they open their mouths to yawn, instantly cover them with their fans, and who murmur only a few words to each other, any conversation ventured upon, dying out in monosyllables like the sounds heard in a house at night, sounds made by the rats and lizards. Is it perhaps the different likenesses of Our Lady hanging on the walls that force them to silence and a religious demeanor, or is it that the women here are an exception? A cousin of Capitan Tiago, a sweet-faced old woman who speaks Spanish quite badly, is the only one receiving the ladies. To offer to the Spanish ladies a plate of cigars and bouillos, to extend her hand to her countrywomen to be kissed, exactly as the friars do, this is the sum of her courtesy, her policy. The poor old lady soon became bored, and taking advantage of the noise of a plate breaking, rushed precipitately away, muttering, Jesus, just wait, you rascals, and failed to reappear. The men, for their part, are making more of a stir. 
Some cadets in one corner are conversing in a lively manner, but in low tones, looking around now and then to point out different persons in the room, while they laugh more or less openly among themselves. In contrast, two foreigners dressed in white are promenading silently from one end of the room to the other, with their hands crossed behind their backs, like the bored passengers on the deck of a ship. All the interest and the greatest animation proceed from a group composed of two priests, two civilians, and a soldier who are seated around a small table on which are seen bottles of wine and English biscuits. The soldier, a tall, elderly lieutenant with an austere countenance, a Duke of Alva straggling behind in the roster of the civil guard, talks little, but in a harsh, curt way. One of the priests, a youthful Dominican friar, handsome, graceful, polished as the gold-mounted eyeglasses he wears, maintains a premature gravity. He is the curate of Binondo and has been in former years a professor in the college of San Juan de Letran, where he enjoyed the reputation of being a consummate dialectician, so much so that in the days when the sons of Guzman still dared to match themselves in subtleties with laymen, the able disputant B. de Luna had never been able either to catch or to confuse him, the distinctions made by Fray Sibila leaving his opponent in the situation of a fisherman who tries to catch eels with a lasso. The Dominican says little, appearing to weigh his words. Quite in contrast, the other priest, a Franciscan, talks much and gesticulates more. In spite of the fact that his hair is beginning to turn grey, he seems to be preserving well his robust constitution, while his regular features, his rather disquieting glance, his wide jaws and Herculean frame give him the appearance of a Roman noble in disguise, and make us involuntarily recall one of those three monks of whom Heine tells in his Gods in Exile, who at the September equinox in the Tyrol used to cross a lake at midnight, and each time place in the hand of the poor boatman a silver piece, cold as ice, which left him full of terror. But Fray Damaso is not so mysterious as they were. He is full of merriment, and if the tone of his voice is rough like that of a man who has never had occasion to correct himself, and who believes that whatever he says is holy and above improvement, still, his frank, merry laugh wipes out his disagreeable impression and even obliges us to pardon his showing to the room bare feet and hairy legs that would make the fortune of a Mendieta in the Chiapo fairs. One of the civilians is a very small man with a black beard, the only thing notable about him being his nose, which, to judge from its size, ought not to belong to him. The other is a rubicund youth who seems to have arrived but recently in the country. With him, the Franciscan is carrying on a lively discussion. You'll see, the friar was saying, when you've been here a few months, you'll be convinced of what I say. It's one thing to govern in Madrid and another to live in the Philippines. But I, for example, continued Fray Damaso, raising his voice still higher to prevent the other from speaking. I, for example, who can look back over twenty-three years of bananas and morisqueta, know whereof I speak. Don't come at me with theories and fine speeches, for I know the Indian. Mark well that the moment I arrived in the country I was assigned to a toxin, small, it is true, but especially devoted to agriculture. I didn't understand Tagalog very well then, but I was, soon confessing the women, and we understood one another, and they came to like me so well that three years later, when I was transferred to another and larger town, made vacant by the death of the native curate, all fell to weeping, they heaped gifts upon me, they escorted me with music. But that only goes to show, wait, wait, don't be so hasty. My successor remained a shorter time, and when he left had more attendance, more tears, and more music. Yet he had been more given to whipping, and had raised the fees in the parish to almost double. But you will allow me. But that isn't all. 
I stayed in the town of San Diego twenty years, and it has been only a few months since I left it. Here he showed signs of chagrin. Twenty years, no one can deny, are more than sufficient to get acquainted with the town. San Diego has a population of six thousand souls, and I knew every inhabitant as well as if I had been his mother and wet nurse. I knew in which foot this one was lame, where the shoe pinched that one, who was courting that girl, what affairs she had had and with whom, who was the real father of the child, and so on, for I was the confessor of every last one, and they took care not to fail in their duty. Our host, Santiago, will tell you whether I am speaking the truth, for he has a lot of land there, and that was where we first became friends. Well, then, you may see what the Indian is. When I left, I was escorted by only a few old women and some of the tertiary brethren, and that after I had been there twenty years. But I don't see what that has to do with the abolition of the tobacco monopoly, ventured the rubicund youth, taking advantage of the Franciscan's pausing to drink a glass of sherry. Fray Damaso was so greatly surprised that he nearly let his glass fall. He remained for a moment, staring fixedly at the young man. "'What? How's that?' he was finally able to exclaim in great wonderment. "'Is it possible that you don't see it as clear as day? Don't you see, my son, that all this proves plainly that the reforms of the ministers are irrational?' It was now the youth's turn to look perplexed. The lieutenant wrinkled his eyebrows a little more, and the small man nodded toward Fray Damaso equivocally. The Dominican contented himself with almost turning his back on the whole group. "'Do you really believe so?' the young man at length asked with great seriousness, as he looked at the friar with curiosity. "'Do I believe so?' as I believe the gospel. The Indian is so indolent. Ah, pardon me for interrupting you, said the young man, lowering his voice and drawing his chair a little closer. But you have said something that awakens all my interest. Does this indolence actually, naturally exist among the natives, or is there some truth in what a foreign traveller says, that with this indolence we excuse our own, as well as our own backwardness and our colonial system. He referred to other colonies whose inhabitants belong to the same race. Pah! Jealousy! Ask Senor Laruja, who also knows this country. Ask him if there is any equal to the ignorance and indolence of the Indian. It's true, affirmed the little man who was referred to as Senor Laruja. In no part of the world can you find anyone more indolent than the Indian, in no part of the world. Nor more vicious, nor more ungrateful, nor more unmannerly. The rubicund youth began to glance about nervously. Gentlemen, he whispered, I believe that we are in the house of an Indian. Those young ladies, <laughs> bah, don't be so apprehensive. Santiago doesn't consider himself an Indian, and besides, he's not here. And what if he were? These are the nonsensical ideas of the newcomers. Let a few months pass, and you will change your opinion, after you have attended a lot of fiestas and bailuhan, slept on cots, and eaten your fill of tinola. Ah, is this thing that you call tinola a variety of lotus which makes people, um, forgetful? "'Nothing of the kind!' exclaimed Fray Damaso with a smile. "'You're getting absurd. "'Tinola is a stew of chicken and squash. "'How long has it been since you got here?' Four days,' responded the youth, rather offended. "'Have you come as a government employee?' "'No, sir. "'I have come at my own expense to study the country.' Oh, "'Man, what a rare bird!' exclaimed Fray Damaso, staring at him with curiosity. To come at one's own expense and for such foolishness! What a wonder, when there are so many books, and with two finger-breadths of forehead! Many have written books as big as that, with two finger-breadths of forehead. 
the Dominican here brusquely broke in upon the conversation. Did your reverence, Fray Damaso, say that you had been twenty years in the town of San Diego, and that you had left it? Wasn't your reverence satisfied with the town? At this question, which was put in a very natural and almost negligent tone, Fray Damaso suddenly lost all his merriment and stopped laughing. No, he gruntled dryly, and let himself back heavily against the back of his chair. The Dominican went on in a still more indifferent tone. It must be painful to leave a town where one has been for twenty years, and which he knows as well as the clothes he wears. I certainly was sorry to leave Camiling, and that after I had been there only a few months. But my superiors did it for the good of the orders, for my own good. Fray Damaso, for the first time that evening, seemed to be very thoughtful. Suddenly he brought his fist down on the arm of his chair and with a heavy breath exclaimed, Either religion is a fact or it is not. That is, either the curates are free or they are not. The country is going to ruin, it is lost. And again he struck the arm of his chair. Everybody in the sala turned toward the group with astonished looks. The Dominican raised his head to stare at the Franciscan from under his glasses. The two foreigners paused a moment, stared with an expression of mingled severity and reproof, then immediately continued their promenade. "'He's in a bad humour because you haven't treated him with deference,' murmured Señor Laruja into the ear of the rubicund youth. "'What does your reverence mean? What's the trouble?' inquired the Dominican and the lieutenant at the same time, but in different tones." That's why so many calamities come. The ruling powers support heretics against the ministers of God, continued the Franciscan, raising his heavy fists. What do you mean? again inquired the frowning lieutenant, half rising from his chair. What do I mean? repeated Fray Damaso, raising his voice and facing the lieutenant. I'll tell you what I mean. I, yes, I, mean to say that when a priest throws out of his cemetery the corpse of a heretic, no one, not even the king himself, has any right to interfere, and much less to impose any punishment. But a little general, a little general calamity. Padre, his excellency is the viceregal patron, shouted the soldier, rising to his feet. "'Excellency, vice-regal patron, what of that?' retorted the Franciscan, also rising. "'In other times he would have been dragged down a staircase, as the religious orders once did with the impious governor Bustamante. Those were indeed the days of faith. "'I warn you that I can't permit this. His Excellency represents His Majesty the King. "'King or Rook, what difference does it make? For us there is no king other than the legitimate—' Halt! shouted the lieutenant in a threatening tone, as if he were commanding his soldiers. Either you withdraw what you have said, or tomorrow I will report it to his excellency. Go ahead, right now, go on, was the sarcastic rejoinder of Fray Damaso as he approached the officer with clenched fists. Do you think that because I wear the cloth I am afraid? Go now, while I can lend you my carriage. The dispute was taking a ludicrous turn, but fortunately the Dominican intervened. "'Gentlemen,' he began in an authoritative tone and with the nasal twang that so well becomes the friars, "'you must not confuse things or seek for offences where there are none. We must distinguish in the words of Fray Damaso those of the man from those of the priest.' The latter, as such, per se, can never give offence, because they spring from absolute truth, while in those of the man there is a secondary distinction to be made, those which he utters ab irato, those which he utters ex ore, but not in corde, and those which he does utter in corde. These last are the only ones that can really offend, and only according to whether they pre-existed as a motive in mente, or arose solely per accidents in the heat of the discussion, if they really exist. But I, by accidents and for my own part, understand his motives, Padre Sibilla, 
broke in the old soldier, who saw himself about to be entangled in so many distinctions that he feared lest he might still be held to blame. I understand the motives about which your reverence is going to make distinctions. During the absence of Padre Damaso from San Diego, his coadjutor buried the body of an extremely worthy individual. Yes, sir, extremely worthy, for I had had dealings with him many times and had been entertained in his house. What if he never went to confession, what does it matter? Neither do I go to confession. But to say that he committed suicide is a lie, a slander. A man such as he was, who has a son upon whom he centres his affection and hopes, a man who has faith in God, who recognises his duties to society, a just and honourable man, does not commit suicide. This much I will say, and will refrain from expressing the rest of my thoughts here, so please your reference. Then, turning his back on the Franciscan, he went on, now then, this priest on his return to the town, after maltreating the poor coadjutor, had the corpse dug up and taken away from the cemetery to be buried, I don't know where. The people of San Diego were cowardly enough not to protest, although it is true that few knew of the outrage. The dead man had no relatives there, and his only son was in Europe. But His Excellency learned of the affair, and as he is an upright man asked for some punishment— and Padre Damaso was transferred to a better town. That's all there is to it. Now your reverence can make your distinctions. So saying, he withdrew from the group. I'm sorry that I inadvertently brought up such delicate a subject, said Padre Sibila sadly. But, after all, if there has been a gain in the change of towns, how is there to be a gain? And what of all the things that are lost in moving, the letters and the... And everything that is mislaid, interrupted Fray Damaso, stammering in the vain effort to control his anger. Little by little the party resumed its former tranquillity. Other guests had come in, among them a lame old Spaniard of mild and inoffensive aspect, leaning on the arm of an elderly Filipina, who was resplendent in frizzes and paint and a European gown. The group welcomed them heartily, and Doctor de Espadaña and his senora, the Doctora Doña Victorina, took their seats among our acquaintances. Some newspaper reporters and shopkeepers greeted one another and moved about aimlessly, without knowing just what to do. But can you tell me, Señor Laruja, what kind of man our host is? inquired the rubicund youth. I haven't been introduced to him yet. They say that he has gone out. I haven't seen him either. There is no need of introductions here, volunteered Fray Damaso. Santiago is made of the right stuff. No, he's not the man who invented gunpowder, added La Ruja. No, he's not the man who invented gunpowder, added La Ruja. You too, Señor La Ruja, exclaimed Doña Victorina in mild reproach as she fanned herself. How could the poor man invent gunpowder if, as is said, the Chinese invented it centuries ago? The Chinese? Are you crazy? cried Fray Damaso. Out with you! The Franciscan, one of my order, Fray, what do you call him, Savals, invented it in the, ah, the seventh century. A Franciscan? Well, he must have been a missionary in China, that Padre Savals, replied the lady, who did not thus easily part from her beliefs. Schwartz, perhaps you mean, Signora, said Fray Sibilla, without looking at her. I don't know. Fray Damaso said a Franciscan, and I was only repeating. Well, Savals or Chevas, what does it matter? The difference of a letter doesn't make him a Chinaman replied the Franciscan in bad humour. And in the fourteenth century, not the seventh, added the Dominican in a tone of correction, as if to mortify the pride of the other friar. Well, neither does a century more or less make him a Dominican. Don't get angry, your reverence, admonished Padre Sibila, smiling. So much the better that he did invent it, so as to save his brethren the trouble. And did you say, Padre Sibilla, that it was in the fourteenth century? 
asked Doña Victorina with great interest. Was that before or after Christ? Fortunately for the individual questioned, two persons entered the room. End of chapter 1「2」of「The Social Cancer」a complete English version of「No Lime Tangere」from the Spanish of José Rizal by Charles Darbyshire. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avaí in November 2011. Chapter 2. Crisóstomo Ibarra it was not two beautiful and well-gowned young women that attracted the attention of all, even including Fray Sibilla, nor was it His Excellency the Captain-General with his staff that a lieutenant should start from his abstraction and take a couple of steps forward, or that Fray Damaso should look as if turned to stone. It was simply the original of the oil-painting, leading by the hand a young man dressed in deep mourning. "'Good evening, gentlemen. Good evening, padre,' were the greetings of Capitan Tiago as he kissed the hands of the priests, who forgot to bestow upon him their benediction. The Dominican had taken off his glasses to stare at the newly arrived youth, while Fray Damaso was pale and unnaturally wide-eyed. "'I have the honour of presenting to you Don Crisostomo Ibarra, the son of my deceased friend,' went on Capitan Tiago. The young gentleman has just arrived from Europe, and I went to meet him. At the mention of the name exclamations were heard. The lieutenant forgot to pay his respects to his host and approached the young man, looking him over from head to foot. The young man himself at that moment was exchanging the conventional greetings with all in the group, nor did there seem to be anything extraordinary about him except his mourning garments in the centre of that brilliantly lighted room. Yet in spite of them, his remarkable stature, his features and his movements breathed forth an air of healthy youthfulness, in which both body and mind had equally developed. There might have been noticed in his frank pleasant face some faint traces of Spanish blood showing through a beautiful brown colour, slightly flushed at the cheeks as a result perhaps of his residence in cold countries what he exclaimed with joyful surprise the curate of my native town padre damaso my father's intimate friend every look in the room was directed toward the franciscan who made no movement pardon me perhaps i'm mistaken added ibarra embarrassed you are not mistaken, the friar was at last able to articulate in a changed voice, but your father was never an intimate friend of mine. Ibarra slowly withdrew his extended hand, looking greatly surprised, and turned to encounter the gloomy gaze of the lieutenant fixed on him. Young man, are you the son of Don Rafael Ibarra? he asked. The youth bowed. Fray Damaso partly rose in his chair and stared fixedly at the lieutenant. "'Welcome back to your country, and may you be happier in it than your father was!' exclaimed the officer in a trembling voice. "'I knew him well and can say that he was one of the worthiest and most honourable men in the Philippines.' "'Sir,' replied Ibarra, deeply moved, the praise you bestow upon my father removes my doubts about the manner of his death, of which I, his son, am yet ignorant. The eyes of the old soldier filled with tears, and turning away hastily he withdrew. The young man thus found himself alone in the centre of the room. His host having disappeared, he saw no one who might introduce him to the young ladies, many of whom were watching him with interest. After a few moments of hesitation, he started toward them in a simple and natural manner. "'Allow me,' he said, "'to overstep the rules of strict etiquette. It has been seven years since I have been in my own country, and upon returning to it I cannot suppress my admiration and refrain from paying my respects to its most precious ornaments, the ladies.' 
but as none of them ventured a reply, he found himself obliged to retire. He then turned toward a group of men who, upon seeing him approach, arranged themselves in a semicircle. Gentlemen, he addressed them, it is a custom in Germany when a stranger finds himself at a function, and there is no one to introduce him to those present, that he give his name and so introduce himself. Allow me to adopt this usage here, not to introduce foreign customs when our own are so beautiful, but because I find myself driven to it by necessity. I have already paid my respects to the skies and to the ladies of my native land. Now I wish to greet its citizens, my fellow countrymen. Gentlemen, my name is Juan Crisostomo Ibarra y Maxalin. The others gave their names, more or less obscure and unimportant here. My name is A said one youth dryly as he made a slight bow. Then I have the honour of addressing the poet whose works have done so much to keep up my enthusiasm for my native land. It is said that you do not write any more, but I could not learn the reason. The reason? Because one does not seek inspiration in order to debase himself and lie. One writer has been imprisoned for having put a very obvious truth into verse. They may have called me a poet, but they shan't call me a fool. And may I inquire what that truth was? He said that the lion's son is also a lion. He came very near to being exiled for it, replied the strange youth, moving away from the group. A man with a smiling face, dressed in the fashion of the natives of the country, with diamond studs in his shirt bosom, came up at that moment almost running. He went directly to Ibarra and grasped his hand, saying, Senor Ibarra, I have been eager to make your acquaintance. Capitan Tiago is a friend of mine, and I knew your respected father. I am known as Capitan Tinong and live in Tondo, where you will always be welcome. I hope that you will honor me with a visit. Come and dine with us tomorrow. He smiled and rubbed his hands. Thank you replied Ibarra, warmly, charmed with such amiability. But tomorrow morning I must leave for San Diego. How unfortunate! Then it will be on your return. Dinner is served, announced the waiter from the Café La Campana, and the guests began to file out toward the table, the women, especially the Filipinas, with great hesitation. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 of The Social Cancer, a complete English version of Noli Me Tangere from the Spain of José Rizal by Charles Darbyshire. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avaí in November 2011. Chapter 3. The Dinner. Gele, gele, bago quiere. Fray Sibylla seemed to be very content as he moved along tranquilly with the look of disdain no longer playing about his thin, refined lips. He even condescended to speak to the lame doctor, the Espadaña, who answered in monosyllables only, as he was somewhat of a stutterer. The Franciscan was in a frightful humor, kicking at the chairs and even elbowing a cadet out of his way. The lieutenant was grave while the others talked vivaciously, praising the magnificence of the table. Doña Victorina, however, was just turning up her nose in disdain when she suddenly became as furious as a trampled serpent. The lieutenant had stepped on the train of her gown. "'Haven't you any eyes?' she demanded. "'Yes, senora, two better than yours, but the fact is that I was admiring your frizzes.' retorted the rather ungallant soldier as he moved away from her. As if from instinct, the two friars both started toward the head of the table, perhaps from habit, and then, as might have been expected, the same thing happened that occurs with the competitors for a university position, who openly exalt the qualifications and superiority of their opponents, later giving to understand that just the contrary was meant, and who murmur and crumble when they do not receive the appointment. For you, Fray Damaso, 
for you, Fray Sibylla. An older friend of the family, confessor of the deceased lady, age, dignity, and authority. Not so very old either. On the other hand, you are the curate of the district, replied Fray Damaso sourly, without taking his hand from the back of the chair. Since you command it, I obey, concluded Fray Sibylla, disposing himself to take the seat. I don't command it, protested the Franciscan. I don't command it. Fray Sibylla was about to seat himself without paying any more attention to these protests when his eyes happened to encounter those of the lieutenant. According to clerical opinion in the Philippines, the highest secular official is inferior to a friar cook. Kedant arma toge, said Cicero in the Senate. Kedant arma cotte, said the friars in the Philippines. But Fray Sibylla was a well-bred person, so he said, Lieutenant, here we are in the world and not in the church. The seat of honor belongs to you. To judge from the tone of his voice, however, even in the world it really did belong to him, and the lieutenant, either to keep out of trouble or to avoid sitting between two friars, curtly declined. None of the claimants had given a thought to their host. Ibarra noticed him watching the scene with a smile of satisfaction. "'How's this, Don Santiago? Aren't you going to sit with us?' But all the seats were occupied. Lucullus was not to sup in the house of Lucullus. "'Sit still. Don't get up,' said Capitan Tiago, placing his hand on the young man's shoulder. "'This fiesta is for the special purpose of giving thanks to the Virgin for your safe arrival.' "'Oi! Bring on the tinola. I ordered tinola, as you doubtless have not tasted any for so long a time. A large steaming tureen was brought in. The Dominican, after muttering the Benedicte, to which scarcely anyone knew how to respond, began to serve the contents. But whether from carelessness or other cause, Padre Damaso received a plate in which a bare neck and a tough wing of chicken floated about in a large quantity of soup amidst lumps of squash, while the others were eating legs and breasts, especially Ibarra, to whose lot fell the second joints. Observing all this, the Franciscan mashed up some pieces of squash, barely tasted the soup, dropped his spoon noisily, and roughly pushed his plate away. The Dominican was very busy talking to the rubicund youth. "'How long have you been away from the country?' La Ruja asked Ibarra. "'Almost seven years.' "'Then you have probably forgotten all about it.' "'Quite the contrary. Even if my country does seem to have forgotten me, I have always thought about it.' "'How do you mean that it has forgotten you?' inquired the rubicund youth. I mean that it has been a year since I have received any news from here, so that I find myself a stranger who does not yet know how and when his father died. The statement drew a sudden exclamation from the lieutenant. And where were you that you didn't telegraph? asked Doña Victorina. When we were married, we telegraphed to the peninsula. Senora, for the past two years I have been in the northern part of Europe, in Germany and Russian Poland. Dr. de Espadaña, who until now had not ventured upon any conversation, thought this a good opportunity to say something. I, I knew in Spain a Pole from w Warsaw called Stadnitsky, if I r remember c correctly. P perhaps you saw him? he asked timidly and almost blushingly. "'It's very likely,' answered Ibarra in a friendly manner. "'But just at this moment I don't recall him.' B "'But you c couldn't have c confused him with anyone else,' went on the doctor, taking courage. "'He was r ruddy as gold and talk talked Spanish very b badly.' Those are good clues, but unfortunately while there I talked Spanish only in a few consulates. How then did you get along? asked the wondering Doña Victorina. The language of the country served my needs, madam. Do you also speak English? 
inquired the Dominican, who had been in Hong Kong, and who was a master of pidgin English, that adulteration of Shakespeare's tongue used by the sons of the celestial empire. I stayed in England a year among people who talked nothing but English. "'Which country of Europe pleased you the most?' asked the rubicund youth. "'After Spain, my second fatherland, any country of free Europe.' And you, who seem to have travelled so much, tell us, what do you consider the most notable thing that you have seen? inquired La Ruja. Ibarra appeared to reflect. Notable? In what way? For example, in regard to the life of the people, the social, political, religious life, in general, in its essential features, as a whole. Ibarra paused thoughtfully before replying. Frankly, I like everything in those people, setting aside the national pride of each one. But before visiting a country I tried to familiarize myself with its history, its exodus, if I may so speak, and afterwards I found everything quite natural. I have observed that the prosperity or misery of each people is in direct proportion to its liberties or its prejudices, and, accordingly, to the sacrifices or the selfishness of its forefathers." "'And haven't you observed anything more than that?' broke in the Franciscan with a sneer. Since the beginning of the dinner he had not uttered a single word, his whole attention having been taken up, no doubt, with the food. "'It wasn't worth while to squander your fortune to learn so trifling a thing. Any schoolboy knows that!' Ibarra was placed in an embarrassing position, and the rest looked from one to the other as if fearing a disagreeable scene. He was about to say, the dinner is nearly over and his reverence is now satiated, but restrained himself and merely remarked to the others, gentlemen, don't be surprised at the familiarity with which our former curate treats me. He treated me so when I was a child, and the years seem to make no difference in his reverence. I appreciate it, too, because it recalls the days when his reverence visited our home and honoured my father's table. The Dominican glanced furtively at the Franciscan, who was trembling visibly. Ibarra continued as he rose from the table. You will now permit me to retire, since, as I have just arrived and must go away tomorrow morning, there remain some important business matters for me to attend to. The principal part of the dinner is over, and I drink but little wine and seldom touch cordials. Gentlemen, all for Spain and the Philippines. Saying this, he drained his glass, which he had not before touched. The old lieutenant silently followed his example. "'Don't go,' whispered Capitan Tiago. "'Maria Clara will be here. Isabel has gone to get her. The new curate of your town, who is a saint, is also coming. "'I'll call tomorrow before starting. I have a very important visit to make now.' With this he went away. Meanwhile, the Franciscan had recovered himself. "'Do you see?' he said to the rubicund youth, at the same time flourishing his dessert spoon. "'That comes from pride. They can't stand to have the curate correct them. They even think that they are respectable persons. It's the evil result of sending young men to Europe. The government ought to prohibit it.' "'And how about the lieutenant?' Doña Victorina chimed in upon the Franciscan. He didn't get the frown off his face the whole evening. He did well to leave us so old and still only a lieutenant. The lady could not forget the allusion to her frizzes and the trampled ruffles of her gown. That night the rubicund youth wrote down, among other things, the following title for a chapter in his colonial studies. Concerning the manner in which the neck and wing of a chicken in a friar's plate of soup may disturb the merriment of a feast. Among his notes there appeared these observations. In the Philippines the most unnecessary person at the dinner is he who gives it, for they are quite capable of beginning by throwing the host into the street, and then everything will go on smoothly. Under present conditions it would perhaps be a good thing not to allow the Filipinos to leave the country, and even not to teach them to read. End of chapter 3
Chapter 4 of The Social Cancer, a complete English version of Noli Me Tangere from the Spanish of José Rizal by Charles Darbyshire. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avaí in November 2011. Chapter 4 Heretic and Filibuster Ibarra stood undecided for a moment. The night breeze, which during those months blows cool enough in Manila, seemed to drive from his forehead the light cloud that had darkened it. He took off his hat and drew a deep breath. Carriages flashed by, public rigs moved along at a sleepy pace, pedestrians of many nationalities were passing. He walked along at that irregular pace which indicates thoughtful abstraction or freedom from care, directing his steps towards Binondo Plaza and looking about him as if to recall the place. There were the same streets and the identical houses with their white and blue walls, whitewashed or frescoed in bad imitation of granite. The church continued to show its illuminated clock face. There were the same Chinese shops with their soiled curtains and their iron gratings, in one of which was a bar that he, in imitation of the street urchins of Manila, had twisted one night. It was still unstraightened. How slowly everything moves, he murmured as he turned into Calle Sacristia. The ice cream vendors were repeating the same shrill cry, Sorbete! while the smoky lamps still lighted the identical Chinese stands and those of the old women who sold candy and fruit. "'Wonderful!' he exclaimed. "'There's the same Chinese who was here seven years ago. And that old woman, the very same! It might be said that tonight I've dreamed of a seven years' journey in Europe. Good heavens, that pavement is still in the same unrepaired condition as when I left!' True it was that the stones of the sidewalk on the corner of San Jacinto and Sacristia were still loose. While he was meditating upon this marvel of the city's stability in a country where everything is so unstable, a hand was placed lightly on his shoulder. He raised his head to see the old lieutenant gazing at him with something like a smile in place of the hard expression and the frown which usually characterized him. "'Young man, be careful. Learn from your father,' was the abrupt greeting of the old soldier. "'Pardon me, but you seem to have thought a great deal of my father. "'Can you tell me how he died?' asked Ibarra, staring at him. "'What? Don't you know about it?' asked the officer. "'I asked Don Santiago about it, but he wouldn't promise to tell me until tomorrow. "'Perhaps you know?' I should say I do, as does everybody else. He died in prison. The young man stepped backward a pace and gazed searchingly at the lieutenant. In prison? Who died in prison? Your father, man, since he was in confinement, was the somewhat surprised answer. My father? In prison? Confined in a prison? What are you talking about? Do you know who my father was? Are you demanded the young man, seizing the officer's arm. I rather think that I am not mistaken. He was Don Rafael Ibarra. Yes, Don Rafael Ibarra, echoed the youth weakly. Well, I thought you knew about it, muttered the soldier in a tone of compassion as he saw what was passing in Ibarra's mind. I suppose that you... But be brave. Here one cannot be honest and keep out of jail. I must believe that you are not joking with me, replied Ibarra in a weak voice after a few moments' silence. Can you tell me why he was in prison? The old man seemed to be perplexed. It's strange to me that your family affairs were not made known to you. His last letter, a year ago, said that I should not be uneasy if he did not write, as he was very busy. He charged me to continue my studies and sent me his blessing. Then he wrote that letter to you just before he died. It will soon be a year since we buried him. But why was my father a prisoner? For a very honorable reason. But come with me to the barracks and I'll tell you as we go along. 
take my arm. They moved along for some time in silence. The elder seemed to be in deep thought and to be seeking inspiration from his goatee, which he stroked continually. As you well know, he began, your father was the richest man in the province, and while many loved and respected him, there were also some who envied and hated him. We Spaniards who come to the Philippines are unfortunately not all we ought to be. I say this as much on account of one of your ancestors as on account of your father's enemy. The continual changes, the corruption in the higher circles, the favoritism, the low cost and the shortness of the journey are blame for it all. The worst characters of the peninsula come here, and even if a good man does come, the country soon ruins him. So it was that your father had a number of enemies among the curates and other Spaniards. Here he hesitated for a while. Some months after your departure the troubles with Padre Damaso began, but I am unable to explain the real cause of them. Fray Damaso accused him of not coming to confession, although he had not done so formally, and they had nevertheless been good friends, as you may still remember. Moreover, Don Rafael was a very upright man, more so than many of those who regularly attend confession, and then the confessors themselves. He had framed for himself a rigid morality and often said to me, when he talked of these troubles, Senor Guevara, do you believe that God will pardon any crime, a murder, for instance, solely by a man's telling it to a priest? A man, after all, and one whose duty is to keep quiet about it, by his fearing that he will roast in hell as a penance, by being cowardly and certainly shameless into the bargain? I have another conception of God, he used to say, for in my opinion one evil does not correct another nor is a crime to be expiated by vain lamentings or by giving alms to the church. Take this example. If I have killed the father of a family, if I have made of a woman a sorrowing widow and destitute orphans of some happy children, have I satisfied eternal justice by letting myself be hanged, or by entrusting my secret to one who is obliged to guard it for me, or by giving alms to priests who are least in need of them, or by buying indulgences and lamenting night and day. What of the widow and the orphans? My conscience tells me that I should try to take the place of him whom I killed, that I should dedicate my whole life to the welfare of the family whose misfortunes I caused. But even so, who can replace the love of a husband and a father? Thus your father reasoned, and by this strict standard of conduct regulated all his actions, so that it can be said that he never injured anybody. On the contrary, he endeavoured by his good deeds to wipe out some injustices which he said your ancestors had committed. But, to get back to his troubles with the curate, these took on a serious aspect. Padre Damaso denounced him from the pulpit and that he did not expressly name him was a miracle, since anything might have been expected of such a character. I foresaw that sooner or later the affair would have serious results. Again the old lieutenant paused. There happened to be wandering about the province an ex-artilleryman who has been discharged from the army on account of his stupidity and ignorance. As the man had to live and he was not permitted to engage in manual labor, which would injure our prestige, he somewhat or other obtained a position as collector of the tax on vehicles. The poor devil had no education at all, a fact of which the natives soon became aware, as it was a marvel for them to see a Spaniard who didn't know how to read and write. Everyone ridiculed him, and the payment of the tax was the occasion of broad smiles. He knew that he was an object of ridicule, and this tended to sour his disposition even more, rough and bad as it had formerly been. They would purposely hand him the papers upside down to see his efforts to read them, and wherever he found a blank space he would scribble a lot of pothooks which rather fitly passed for his signature. The natives mocked while they paid him. He swallowed his pride and made the collections, but was in such a state of mind that he had no respect for anyone. He even came to have some hard words with your father. One day it happened that he was in a shop turning a document over and over in the effort to get it straight, 
when a schoolboy began to make signs to his companions and to point laughingly at the collector with his finger. The fellow heard the laughter and saw the joke reflected in the solemn faces of the bystanders. He lost his patience and, turning quickly, started to chase the boys who ran away shouting, Ba, be, bi, bo, bu. Blind with rage and unable to catch them, he threw his cane and struck one of the boys on the head, knocking him down. He ran up and began to kick the fallen boy, and none of those who had been laughing had the courage to interfere. Unfortunately, your father happened to come along just at that time. He ran forward indignantly, caught the collector by the arm and reprimanded him severely. The artilleryman, who was no doubt beside himself with rage, raised his hand, but your father was too quick for him, and with the strength of the descendant of the Basques, some say that he struck him, others that he merely pushed him, but at any rate the man staggered and fell a little way off, striking his head against a stone. Don Rafael quietly picked the wounded boy up and carried him to the town hall. The artilleryman bled freely from the mouth and died a few moments later without recovering consciousness. As was to be expected, the authorities intervened and arrested your father. All his hidden enemies at once rose up and false accusations came from all sides. He was accused of being a heretic and a filibuster. To be a heretic is a great danger anywhere, but especially so at that time when the province was governed by an alcalde who made a great show of his piety, who with his servants used to recite his rosary in the church in a loud voice, perhaps that all might hear and pray with him. But to be a filibuster is worse than to be a heretic, and to kill three or four tax collectors who know how to read, write, and attend to business. Everyone abandoned him, and his books and papers were seized. He was accused of subscribing to El Correo de Ultramar and to newspapers from Madrid, of having sent you to Germany, of having in his possession letters and a photograph of a priest who had been legally executed, and I don't know what not. Everything served as an accusation, even the fact that he, a descendant of peninsulas, wore a camisa. Had it been any one but your father, it is likely that he would soon have been set free, as there was a physician who ascribed the death of the unfortunate collector to a hemorrhage. But his wealth, his confidence in the law, and his hatred of everything that was not legal and just, wrought his undoing. In spite of my repugnance to ask for mercy from any one, I applied personal to the captain-general, the predecessor of our present one, and urged upon him that there could not be anything of the filibuster about a man who took up with all the Spaniards, even the poor immigrants, and gave them food and shelter, and in whose veins yet flowed the generous blood of Spain. It was in vain that I pledged my life and swore by my poverty and my military honour. I succeeded only in being coldly listened to and roughly sent away with the epithet of chiflado. The old man paused to take a deep breath, and after noticing the silence of his companion, who was listening with averted face, continued. At your father's request, I prepared the defense in the case. I went first to the celebrated Filipino lawyer, young Ah, but he refused to take the case. I should lose it, he told me, and my defending him would furnish the motive for another charge against him, and perhaps one against me. Go to Senor M., who is a forceful and fluent speaker and the peninsula of great influence. I did so, and the noted lawyer took charge of the case and conducted it with mastery and brilliance. But your father's enemies were numerous, some of them hidden and unknown. False witnesses abounded, and their calumnies, which under other circumstances would have melted away before a sarcastic phrase from the defense, here assumed shape and substance. If the lawyers succeeded in destroying the force of their testimony by making them contradict each other and even perjure themselves, new charges were at once preferred. They accused him of having illegally taken possession of a great deal of land and demanded damages. They said that he maintained relations with the Tulisanes in order that his crops and animals might not be molested by them. At last the case became so confused that at the end of a year no one understood it. 
The alcalde had to leave, and there came in his place one who had the reputation of being honest, but unfortunately he stayed only a few months, and his successor was too fond of good horses. The sufferings, the worries, the hard life in the prison, or the pain of seeing so much ingratitude, broke your father's iron constitution, and he fell ill with that malady which only the tomb can cure. When the case was almost finished and he was about to be acquitted of the charge of being an enemy of the fatherland and of being the murderer of the tax collector, he died in prison with no one at his side. I arrived just in time to see him breathe his last. The old lieutenant became silent, but still Ibarra said nothing. They had arrived meanwhile at the door of the barracks, so the soldier stopped and said as he grasped the youth's hand, Young man, for details, ask Capitan Tiago. Now, good night, as I must return to duty and see that all's well. Silently, but with great feeling, Ibarra shook the lieutenant's bony hand and followed him with his eyes until he disappeared. Then he turned slowly and signaled to a passing carriage. To Lala's hotel was the direction he gave in a scarcely audible voice. This fellow must have just got out of jail, thought the cochero as he whipped up his horses. End of chapter 4「Chapter Five of The Social Cancer, a complete English version of Noli me Tangere from the Spanish of Jose Rizal by Charles Darbyshire. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avaí in November 2011. Chapter Five, A Star in a Dark Night. Ibarra went to his room, which overlooked the river, and dropping into a chair gazed out into the vast expanse of the heavens spread before him through the open window. The house on the opposite bank was profusely lighted, and gay strains of music, largely from stringed instruments, were borne across the river even to his room. If the young man had been less preoccupied, if he had had more curiosity and had cared to see with his opera glasses what was going on in that atmosphere of light, he would have been charmed with one of those magical and fantastic spectacles, the like of which is sometimes seen in the great theatres of Europe. To the subdued strains of the orchestra, there seems to appear in the midst of a shower of light, a cascade of gold and diamonds in an oriental setting, a deity wrapped in misty gauze, a sylph enveloped in a luminous halo, who moves forward apparently without touching the floor. In her presence the flowers bloom, the dance awakens, the music bursts forth, and troops of devils, nymphs, satyrs, demons, angels, shepherds and shepherdesses dance, shake their tambourines, and whirl about in rhythmic evolutions, each one placing some tribute at the feet of the goddess. Ibarra would have seen a beautiful and graceful maiden, clothed in the picturesque garments of the daughters of the Philippines, standing in the center of a semicircle made up of every class of people, Chinese, Spaniards, Filipinos, soldiers, curates, old men and young, all gesticulating and moving about in a lively manner. Padre Damaso stood at the side of the beauty, smiling like one especially blessed. Fray Sibila, yes, Fray Sibila himself, was talking to her. Doña Victorina was arranging in the magnificent hair of the maiden a string of pearls and diamonds which threw out all the beautiful tints of the rainbow. She was white, perhaps too much so, and whenever she raised her downcast eyes there shone forth a spotless soul. When she smiled so as to show her small white teeth, the beholder realized that the rose is only a flower, and ivory but the elephant's tusk. From out of the filmy piña, draperies around her white and shapely neck there blinked, as the Tagalogs say, the bright eyes of a collar of diamonds. One man only in all the crowd seemed insensible to her radiant influence, a young Franciscan, thin, wasted and pale, who watched her from a distance, motionless as a statue and scarcely breathing. 
But Ibarra saw nothing of all this. His eyes were fixed on other things. A small space was enclosed by four bare and grimy walls, in one of which was an iron grating. On the filthy and loathsome floor was a mat upon which an old man lay alone in the throes of death, an old man breathing with difficulty and turning his head from side to side as amidst his tears he uttered a name. The old man was alone, but from time to time a groan or the rattle of a chain was heard on the other side of the wall. Far away there was a merry feast, almost an orgy. A youth was laughing, shouting, and pouring wine upon the flowers amid the applause and drunken laughter of his companions. The old man had the features of his father, the youth was himself, and the name that the old man uttered with tears was his own name. This was what the wretched young man saw before him. The lights in the house opposite were extinguished, the music and the noises ceased, but Ibarra still heard the anguished cry of his father calling upon his son in the hour of his death. Silence had now blown its hollow breath over the city, and all things seemed to sleep in the embrace of nothingness. The cock-crow alternated with the strokes of the clocks in the church towers and the mournful cries of the weary sentinels. A waning moon began to appear, and everything seemed to be at rest, even Ibarra himself, worn out by his sad thoughts or by his journey, now slept. Only the young Franciscan, whom we saw not so long ago standing motionless and silent in the midst of the gaiety of the ballroom, slept not, but kept vigil. In his cell, with his elbow upon the window-sill and his pale, worn cheek resting on the palm of his hand, he was gazing silently into the distance where a bright star glittered in the dark sky. The star paled and disappeared, the dim light of the waning moon faded, but the friar did not move from his place. He was gazing out over the field of Bagumbayan and the sleeping sea at the far horizon, wrapped in the morning mist. End of chapter 5Chapter 6 of The Social Cancer, a complete English version of Noli Me Tangere from the Spanish of José Rizal by Charles Darbyshire. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avaí in November 2011. Chapter 6. Capitán Tiago. Thy will be done on earth. While our characters are deep in slumber or busy with their breakfasts, let us turn our attention to Capitan Tiago. We have never had the honour of being his guest, so it is neither our right nor our duty to pass him by slightingly, even under the stress of important events. Low in stature, with a clear complexion, a corpulent figure, and a full face, thanks to the liberal supply of fat, which, according to his admirers, was the gift of heaven, and which his enemies averred was the blood of the poor, Capitan Tiago appeared to be younger than he really was. He might have been thought between thirty and thirty-five years of age. At the time of our story his countenance always wore a sanctified look, his little round head, covered with ebony black hair, cut long in front and short behind, was reputed to contain many things of weight. His eyes, small but with no Chinese slant, never varied in expression. His nose was slender and not at all inclined to flatness, and if his mouth had not been disfigured by the immoderate use of tobacco and buyo, which, when chewed and gathered in one cheek, marred the symmetry of his features, we would say that he might properly have considered himself a handsome man and have passed for such. Yet, in spite of this bad habit, he kept marvellously white both his natural teeth and also the two which the dentist furnished him at twelve pesos each. He was considered one of the richest landlords in Binondo and a planter of some importance by reason of his estates in Pampanga and Laguna, principally in the town of San Diego, the income from which increased with each year. San Diego, on account of its agreeable baths, its famous cockpit, and his cherished memories of the place, was his favourite town, so that he spent at least two months of the year there. 
His holdings of real estate in the city were large, and it is superfluous to state that the opium monopoly controlled by him and the Chinese brought in large profits. They also had the lucrative contract of feeding the prisoners in Bilibit and furnished saccade to many of the stateliest establishments in Manila, through the medium of contracts, of course. Standing well with all the authorities, clever, cunning, and even bold in speculating upon the wants of others, he was the only formidable rival of a certain Perez in the matter of the farming out of revenues and the sale of offices and appointments, which the Philippine government always confides to private persons. Thus, at the time of the events here narrated, Capitan Tiago was a happy man, in so far as it is possible for a narrow-brained individual to be happy in such a land. He was rich and at peace with God, the government, and man. That he was at peace with God was beyond doubt, almost like religion itself. There is no need to be on bad terms with the good God when one is prosperous on earth, when one has never had any direct dealings with him and has never lent him any money. Capitan Tiago himself had never offered any prayers to him, even in his greatest difficulties, for he was rich and his gold prayed for him. For masses and supplications high and powerful priests had been created, for novenas and rosaries, God in his infinite bounty had created the poor for the service of the rich, the poor who for a peso could be secured to recite sixteen mysteries and to read all the sacred books, even the Hebrew Bible, for a little extra. If at any time in the midst of pressing difficulties he needed celestial aid and had not at hand even a red Chinese taper, he would call upon his most adored saints, promising them many things for the purpose of putting them under obligation to him and ultimately convincing them of the righteousness of his desires. The saint to whom he promised the most and whose promises he was the most faithful in fulfilling was the Virgin of Antipolo, Our Lady of Peace and Prosperous Voyages. With many of the lesser saints he was not very punctual or even decent, and sometimes, after having his petitions granted, he thought no more about them, though of course after such treatment he did not bother them again when occasion arose. Capitan Tiago knew that the calendar was full of idle saints, who perhaps had nothing wherewith to occupy their time up there in heaven. Furthermore, to the Virgin of Antipolo he ascribed greater power and efficiency than to all the other virgins combined, whether they carried silver canes, naked or richly clothed images of the first child, scapularies, rosaries, or girdles. Perhaps his reverence was owing to the fact that she was a very strict lady, watchful of her name, and, according to the senior sacristan of Antipolo, an enemy of photography. When she was angered, she turned black as ebony, while the other virgins were softer of heart and more indulgent. It is a well-known fact that some minds love an absolute monarch rather than a constitutional one, as witness Louis XIV and Louis XVI, Philip II and Amadeo I. This fact perhaps explains why infidel Chinese and even Spaniards may be seen kneeling in the famous sanctuary. What is not explained is why the priests run away with the money of the terrible image, go to America and get married there. In the sala of Capitan Tiago's house, that door, hidden by a silk curtain, leads to a small chapel or oratory such as must be lacking in no Filipino home. There were placed his household gods, and we say gods, because he was inclined to polytheism rather than to monotheism, which he had never come to understand. There could be seen images of the Holy Family with busts and extremities of ivory, glass eyes, long eyelashes, and curly blonde hair, masterpieces of Santa Cruz sculpture. Paintings in oil by artists of Paco and Ermita represented martyrdoms of saints and miracles of the Virgin, Saint Lucy gazing at the sky and carrying in a plate an extra pair of eyes with lashes and eyebrows, such as are seen painted in the triangle of the Trinity or on Egyptian tombs, Saint Pasqual Bailon, 
St. Anthony of Padua in a gingon habit, looking with tears upon a Christ child dressed as a captain general, with the three-cornered hat, sword, and boots, as in the children's ball at Madrid that character is represented, which signified for Capitan Tiago that while God might include in his omnipotence the power of a captain general of the Philippines, the Franciscans would nevertheless play with him as with a doll. There might also be seen a St. Anthony the abbot with a hog by his side, a hog that for the worthy Capitan was as miraculous as the saint himself, for which reason he never dared to refer to it as the hog, but as the creature of holy St. Anthony. A St. Francis of Assisi in a coffee-coloured robe and with seven wings placed over a St. Vincent, who had only two but in compensation carried a trumpet. A St. Peter the martyr, with his head split open by the Taliban of an evil-doer, and held fast by a kneeling infidel, side by side with another St. Peter cutting off the ear of a Moro, Malchus, no doubt, who was gnawing his lips and writhing with pain, while a fighting cock on a Doric column crowed and flapped his wings, from all of which Capitan Tiago deduced that in order to be a saint it was just as well to smite as to be smitten. Who could enumerate that army of images and recount the virtues and perfections that were treasured there? A whole chapter would hardly suffice. Yet we must not pass over in silence a beautiful St. Michael of painted and gilded wood almost four feet high. The archangel is biting his lower lip and with flashing eyes, frowning forehead and rosy cheeks is grasping a Greek shield and brandishing in his right hand a Sulu chris, ready, as would appear from his attitude and expression, to smite the worshipper or anyone else who might approach, rather than the horned and tailed devil that had his teeth set in his girlish leg. Capitan Tiago never went near this image from fear of a miracle. Had not other images, even those more rudely carved ones that issue from the carpenter shops of Paete, many times come to life for the confusion and punishment of incredulous sinners? It is a well-known fact that a certain image of Christ in Spain, when invoked as a witness of promises of love, had assented with a movement of the head in the presence of the judge, and that another such image had reached out its right arm to embrace St. Lutgarda. And furthermore, had he not himself read a booklet recently published about a mimic sermon preached by an image of St. Dominic in Soriano? True, the saint had not said a single word, but from his movements it was inferred, at any rate the author of the booklet inferred, that he was announcing the end of the world. Was it not reported, too, that the Virgin of Luta in the town of Lipa had one cheek swollen larger than the other, and that there was mud on the borders of her gown? Does not this prove mathematically that the holy images also walk about without holding up their skirts, and that they even suffer from the toothache, perhaps for our sake? Had he not seen with his own eyes during the regular Good Friday sermon all the images of Christ move and bow their heads thrice in unison, thereby calling forth wails and cries from the women and other sensitive souls destined for heaven? More? We ourselves have seen the preacher show to the congregation at the moment of their descent from the cross a handkerchief stained with blood, and were ourselves on the point of weeping piously, when, to the sorrow of our soul, a sacristan assured us that it was all a joke, that the blood was that of a chicken which had been roasted and eaten on the spot, in spite of the fact that it was Good Friday, and the sacristan was fat. So Capitan Tiago, even though he was a prudent and pious individual, took care not to approach the Chris of St. Michael. Let's take no chances, he would say to himself. I know that he's an archangel, but I don't trust him. No, I don't trust him. Not a year passed without his joking with an orchestra in the pilgrimage to the wealthy shrine of Antipolo. He paid for two thanksgiving masses of the many that make up the three novenas, and also for the days when there are no novenas, and washed himself afterwards in the famous batis or pool where the sacred image herself had bathed. 
her votaries can even yet discern the tracks of her feet and the traces of her locks and the hard rock where she dried them resembling exactly those made by any woman who uses coconut oil and just as if her hair had been steel or diamonds and she had weighed a thousand tons we should like to see the terrible image once shake her sacred hair in the eyes of those credulous persons and put her foot upon their tongues or their heads there at the very edge of the pool capitan tiago made it his duty to eat roast pig sinigang of dalag with alibambang leaves and other more or less appetizing dishes the two masses would cost him over four hundred pesos but it was cheap after all if one considered the glory that the mother of the lord would acquire from the pinwheels rockets bombs and mortars and also the increased profits which thanks to these masses would come to one during the year but antipolo was not the only theatre of his ostentatious devotion in binondo in pampanga and in the town of san diego when he was about to put up a fighting cock with large wagers he would send gold monies to the curate for propitiatory masses and just as the romans consulted the augurs before a battle giving food to the sacred fowls so capitan tiago would also consult his augurs with the modifications befitting the times and the new truths tai would watch closely the flame of the tapers the smoke from the incense the voice of the priest and from it all attempt to forecast his luck it was an admitted fact that he lost very few wagers and in those cases it was due to the unlucky circumstance that the officiating priest was hoarse or that the altar candles were few or contained too much tallow or that a bad piece of money had slipped in with the rest the warden of the brotherhood would then assure him that such reverses were tests to which he was subjected by heaven to receive assurance of his fidelity and devotion so beloved by the priests respected by the sacristans humoured by the chinese chandlers and the dealers in fireworks he was a man happy in the religion of this world and persons of discernment and great piety even claimed for him great influence in the celestial court that he was at peace with the government cannot be doubted however difficult an achievement it may seem incapable of any new idea and satisfied with his modus vivendi he was ever ready to gratify the desires of the last official of the fifth class in every one of the offices to make presents of hams capons turkeys and chinese fruits at all seasons of the year if he heard any one speak ill of the natives he who did not consider himself as such would join in the chorus and speak worse of them if any one aspersed the chinese or spanish mestizos he would do the same perhaps because he considered himself become a full-blooded iberian he was ever first to talk in favour of any new imposition of taxes or special assessment especially when he smelled a contract or a farming assignment behind it he always had an orchestra ready for congratulating and serenading the governors judges and other officials on their name days and birthdays at the birth or death of a relative and in fact at every variation from the usual monotony for such occasions he would secure laudatory poems and hymns in which were celebrated the kind and loving governor the brave and courageous judge for whom there awaits in heaven the palm of the just with many other things of the same kind. He was the president of the rich guild of mestizos, in spite of the protests of many of them who did not regard him as one of themselves. In the two years that he held this office, he wore out ten frock coats, an equal number of high hats, and half a dozen canes. The frock coat and the high hat were in evidence at the Ayuntamiento, in the governor-general's palace, and at military headquarters, the high hat and the frock coat might have been noticed in the cockpit in the market in the processions in the chinese shops and under the hat and within the coat might have been seen the perspiring capitan tiago waving his tasseled cane directing arranging and throwing everything into disorder with marvellous activity and a gravity even more marvellous so the authorities saw in him a safe man gifted with the best of dispositions peaceful tractable and obsequious 
who read no books or newspapers from Spain, although he spoke Spanish well. Indeed, they rather looked upon him with the feeling with which a poor student contemplates the worn-out heel of his old shoe, twisted by his manner of walking. In this case there was truth in both the Christian and profane proverbs, Beati pauperes spiritu and Beati possidentes, and there might well be applied to him that translation, according to some people incorrect, from the Greek, glory to God in the highest, and peace to men of good will on earth, even though we shall see further along that it is not sufficient for man to have good will in order to live in peace. The irreverent considered him a fool, the poor regarded him as a heartless and cruel exploiter of misery and want, and his inferiors saw in him a despot and a tyrant. As to the women, ha, ah, the women! Accusing rumours buzzed through the wretched Nipa huts, and it was said that wails and sobs might be heard, mingled with the weak cries of an infant. More than one young woman was pointed out by her neighbours with the finger of scorn. She had a downcast glance and a faded cheek. But such things never robbed him of sleep, nor did any maiden disturb his peace. It was an old woman who made him suffer an old woman who was his rival in piety and who had gained from many curates such enthusiastic praises and eulogies as he in his best days had never received between capitan tiago and this widow who had inherited from brothers and cousins there existed a holy rivalry which redounded to the benefit of the church as the competition among the pampanga steamers then redounded to the benefit of the public did Capitan Tiago present to some virgin a silver wand ornamented with emeralds and topazes? At once Doña Patrocinio had ordered another of gold set with diamonds. If at the time of the naval procession Capitan Tiago erected an arch with two facades covered with ruffled cloth and decorated with mirrors, glass globes and chandeliers, then Doña Patrocinio would have another, with four facades, six feet higher, and more gorgeous hangings. Then he would fall back on his reserves, his strong point, his speciality, masses with bombs and fireworks, whereat Doña Patrocinio could only gnaw at her lips with her toothless gums, because, being exceedingly nervous, she could not endure the chiming of the bells, and still less the explosions of the bombs. While he smiled in triumph, she would plan her revenge and pay the money of others to secure the best orators of the five orders in Manila, the most famous preachers of the cathedral, and even the Paulists, to preach on the holy days upon profound theological subjects to the sinners who understood only the vernacular of the mariners. The partisans of Capitan Tiago would observe that she slept during the sermon, but her adherents would answer that the sermon was paid for in advance, and by her, and that in any affair payment was the prime requisite. At length she had driven him from the field completely by presenting to the church three andas of gilded silver, each one of which cost her over three thousand pesos. Capitan Tiago hoped that the old woman would breathe her last almost any day, or that she would lose five or six of her lawsuits, so that he might be alone in serving God. But, unfortunately, the best lawyers of the Real Audiencia looked after her interests, and, as to her health, there was no part of her that could be attacked by sickness. She seemed to be a steel wire, no doubt for the edification of souls, and she hung on in this veil of tears with the tenacity of a boil on the skin." Her adherents were secure in the belief that she would be canonized at her death and that Capitan Tiago himself would have to worship her at the altars, all of which he agreed to and cheerfully promised, provided only that she die soon. Such was Capitan Tiago in the days of which we write. As for the past, he was the only son of a sugar planter of Malabon, wealthy enough, but so miserly that he would not spend a cent to educate his son, for which reason the little Santiago had been the servant of a good Dominican, a worthy man who had tried to train him in all of good that he knew and could teach. When he had reached the happy stage of being known amongst his acquaintances as a logician, 
that is, when he began to study logic, the death of his protector, soon followed by that of his father, put an end to his studies, and he had to turn his attention to business affairs. He married a pretty young woman of Santa Cruz, who gave him social position and helped him to make his fortune. Doña Pia Alba was not satisfied with buying and selling sugar, indigo and coffee, but wished to plant and reap, so the newly married couple bought land in San Diego. From this time dated their friendship with Padre Damaso and with Don Rafael Ibarra, the richest capitalist of the town. The lack of an heir in the first six years of their wedded life made of that eagerness to accumulate riches almost a censurable ambition. Doña Pia was comely, strong, and healthy, yet it was in vain that she offered novenas and at the advice of the devout women of San Diego made a pilgrimage to the Virgin of Kai Sai Sai in Taal, distributed alms to the poor, and danced at midday in May in the procession of the Virgin of Turumba in Paquil but it was all with no result, until Fray Damaso advised her to go to Obando to dance in the fiesta of St. Pascual Bailon and ask him for a son. Now it is well known that there is in Obando a trinity which grants sons or daughters according to request, Our Lady of Salamba, St. Clara, and St. Pascual. Thanks to this wise advice, Doña Pia soon recognized the signs of approaching motherhood, but, alas, like the fisherman of whom Shakespeare tells in Macbeth, who ceased to sing when he had found a treasure, she at once lost all her mirthfulness, fell into melancholy, and was never seen to smile again. Capriciousness, natural in her condition, commented all, even Capitan Tiago. A purple fever put an end to her hidden grief, and she died, leaving behind a beautiful baby girl for whom Fray Damaso himself stood sponsor. As St. Pascual had not granted the son that was asked, they gave the child the name of Maria Clara, in honor of the Virgin of Salamba and St. Clara, punishing the worthy St. Pascual with silence. The little girl grew up under the care of her Aunt Isabel, that good old lady of monkish urbanity whom we met at the beginning of the story. For the most part, her early life was spent in San Diego, on account of its healthful climate, and there Padre Damaso was devoted to her. Maria Clara had not the small eyes of her father. Like her mother, she had eyes large, black, long-lashed, merry and smiling when she was playing, but sad, deep and pensive in moments of repose. As a child, her hair was curly and almost blonde, her straight nose was neither too pointed nor too flat, while her mouth, with the merry dimples at the corners, recalled the small and pleasing one of her mother. Her skin had the fineness of an onion cover and was as white as cotton, according to her perplexed relatives, who found the traces of Capitan Tiago's paternity in her small and shapely ears. Aunt Isabel ascribed her half-European features to the longings of Doña Pia, whom she remembered to have seen many times weeping before the image of St. Anthony. Another cousin was of the same opinion, deferring only in the choice of the smart, as for her it was either the Virgin itself or St. Michael. A famous philosopher, who was the cousin of Capitan Tinong and who had memorized the Amat, sought for the true explanation in planetary influences. The idol of all, Maria Clara grew up amidst smiles and love. The very friars showered her with attentions when she appeared in the processions dressed in white, her abundant hair interwoven with two broses and sampaguitas, with two diminutive wings of silver and gold fastened on the back of her gown, and carrying in her hands a pair of white doves tied with blue ribbons. Afterwards she would be so merry and talk so sweetly in her childish simplicity that the enraptured Capitan Tiago could do nothing but bless the saints of Obando and advise everyone to purchase beautiful works of sculpture. In southern countries the girl of thirteen or fourteen years changes into a woman as the bud of the night becomes a flower in the morning. 
at this period of change so full of mystery and romance maria clara was placed by the advice of the curate of binondo in the nunnery of saint catherine in order to receive strict religious training from the sisters with tears she took leave of padre damaso and of the only lad who had been a friend of her childhood crisostomo ibarra who himself shortly afterward went away to europe there in that convent which communicates with the world through double bars even under the watchful eyes of the nuns she spent seven years each having his own particular ends in view and knowing the mutual inclinations of the two young persons don rafael and capitan tiago agreed upon the marriage of their children and the formation of a business partnership this agreement which was concluded some years after the younger ibarra's departure was celebrated with equal joy by two hearts in widely separated parts of the world and under very different circumstances End of chapter 6chapter seven of the social cancer a complete english version of noli me tangere from the spanish of jose rizal by charles darbisher this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by avai in november two thousand eleven chapter seven an idyll on an azotea the song of songs which is solomon's that morning aunt isabel and maria clara went early to mass the latter elegantly dressed and wearing a rosary of blue beads which partly served as a bracelet for her and the former with her spectacles in order to read her anchor of salvation during the holy communion scarcely had the priest disappeared from the altar when the maiden expressed a desire for returning home to the great surprise and displeasure of her good aunt who believed her niece to be as pious and devoted to praying as a nun at least grumbling and crossing herself the good old lady rose the good lord will forgive me aunt isabel since he must know the hearts of girls better than you do maria clara might have said to check the severe yet maternal chidings after they had breakfasted maria clara consumed her impatience in working at a silk purse while her aunt was trying to clean up the traces of the former night's revelry by swinging a feather duster about capitan tiago was busy looking over some papers every noise in the street every carriage that passed caused the maiden to tremble and quickened the beatings of her heart now she wished that she were back in the quiet convent among her friends there she could have seen him without emotion and agitation but was he not the companion of her infancy had they not played together and even quarrelled at times the reason for all this i need not explain if you o oh reader have ever loved you will understand and if you have not it is useless for me to tell you as the uninitiated do not comprehend these mysteries i believe maria that the doctor is right said capitan tiago you ought to go into the country for you are pale and need fresh air what do you think of malabon or san diego at the mention of the latter place maria clara blushed like a poppy and was unable to answer you and isabel can go at once to the convent to get your clothes and to say good-bye to your friends he continued without raising his hand you will not stay there any longer the girl felt the vague sadness that possesses the mind when we leave forever a place where we have been happy but another thought softened this sorrow in four or five days after you get some new clothes made we'll go to malabon your godfather is no longer in san diego the priest that you may have noticed here last night that young padre is the new curate whom we have there and he is a saint i think that san diego would be better cousin observed aunt isabel besides our house there is better and the time for the fiesta draws near maria clara wanted to embrace her aunt for this speech but hearing a carriage stop she turned pale ah very true answered capitan tiago 
and then in a different tone he exclaimed, Don Crisostomo! The maiden let her sewing fall from her hands and wished to move, but could not. A violent tremor ran through her body. Steps were heard on the stairway, and then a fresh, manly voice. As if that voice had some magic power, the maiden controlled her emotion and ran to hide in the oratory among the saints. The two cousins laughed, and Ibarra even heard the noise of the door closing. Pale and breathing rapidly, the maiden pressed her beating heart and tried to listen. She heard his voice, that beloved voice that for so long a time she had heard only in her dreams he was asking for her. Overcome with joy, she kissed the nearest saint, which happened to be Saint Anthony the abbot, a saint happy in flesh and in wood, ever the object of pleasing temptations. Afterwards, she sought the keyhole in order to see and examine him. She smiled, and when her aunt snatched her from that position, she unconsciously threw her arms around the old lady's neck and rained kisses upon her. "'Foolish child, what's the matter with you?' the old lady was at last able to say as she wiped a tear from her faded eyes. Maria Clara felt ashamed and covered her eyes with her plump arm. "'Come on, get ready, come!' added the old aunt fondly, while he is talking to your father about you. Come, don't make him wait. Like a child, the maiden obediently followed her, and they shut themselves up in her chamber. Capitan Tiago and Ibarra were conversing in a lively manner when Aunt Isabel appeared, half dragging her niece, who was looking in every direction except toward the persons in the room. What said those two souls communicating through the language of the eyes, more perfect than that of the lips, the language given to the soul in order that sound may not mar the ecstasy of feeling? In such moments when the thoughts of two happy beings penetrate into each other's souls through the eyes, the spoken word is halting, rude and weak. It is as the harsh, slow roar of the thunder compared with the rapidity of the dazzling lightning flash, expressing feelings already recognized, ideas already understood, and if words are made use of, it is only because the heart's desire, dominating all the being and flooding it with happiness, wills that the whole human organism with all its physical and psychical powers give expression to the song of joy that rolls through the soul. Through the questioning glance of love, as it flashes out and then conceals itself, speech has no reply. The smile, the kiss, the sigh answer. Soon the two lovers, fleeing from the dust raised by Aunt Isabel's broom, found themselves on the azotea where they could commune in liberty among the little arbors. What did they tell each other in murmurs that you nod your heads, O oh little cypress flowers? Tell it, you who have fragrance in your breath and color on your lips. And thou, O sapphire, who learnest rare harmonies in the stillness of the dark night amidst the hidden depths of our virgin forests, tell it, O sunbeams, brilliant manifestation upon earth of the eternal, soul immaterial essence in a material world. You tell it, for I only know how to relate prosaic commonplaces. But since you seem unwilling to do so, I am going to try myself. The sky was blue, and a fresh breeze, not yet laden with the fragrance of roses, stirred the leaves and flowers of the vines. That is why the cypresses, the orchids, the dried fishes, and the Chinese lanterns were trembling. The splash of paddles in the muddy waters of the river, and the rattle of carriages and carts passing over the Binondo Bridge, came up to them distinctly, although they did not hear what the old aunt murmured as she saw where they were. That's better, and there you'll be watched by the whole neighborhood. At first they talked nonsense, giving utterance only to those sweet inanities which are so much like the boastings of the nations of Europe, pleasing and honey-sweet at home, but causing foreigners to laugh or frown. She, like a sister of Cain, was of course jealous, and asked her sweetheart, Have you always thought of me? Have you never forgotten me on all your travels in the great cities among so many beautiful women? He, too, was a brother of Cain, and sought to evade such questions, making use of a little fiction. Could I forget you? 
he answered as he gazed enraptured into her dark eyes. Could I be faithless to my oath, my sacred oath? Do you remember that stormy night when you saw me weeping alone by the side of my dead mother, and, drawing near to me, you put your hand on my shoulder, that hand which for so long a time you had not allowed me to touch, saying to me, You have lost your mother while I never had one, and you wept with me? You loved her, and she looked upon you as a daughter. Outside it rained, and the lightning flashed, but within I seemed to hear music and to see a smile on the pallid face of the dead. Oh, that my parents were alive and might behold you now! I then caught your hand along with the hand of my mother, and swore to love you and to make you happy, whatever fortune heaven might have in store for me, and that oath, which has never weighed upon me as a burden, I now renew. Could I forget you? The thought of you has ever been with me, strengthening me amid the dangers of travel, and has been a comfort to my soul's loneliness in foreign lands. The thoughts of you have neutralized the lotus effect of Europe, which erases from the memories of so many of our countrymen the hopes and misfortunes of our fatherland. In dreams I saw you standing on the shore at Manila, gazing at the far horizon wrapped in the warm light of the early dawn. I heard the slow, sad song that awoke in me sleeping affections and called back to the memory of my heart the first years of our childhood, our joys, our pleasures, and all that happy past which you gave life to while you were in our town. It seemed to me that you were the fairy, the spirit, the poetic incarnation of my fatherland, beautiful, unaffected, lovable, frank, a true daughter of the Philippines, that beautiful land which unites with the imposing virtues of the mother country, Spain, the admirable qualities of a young people, as you unite in your being all that is beautiful and lovely, the inheritance of both races. So indeed the love of you and that of my fatherland have become fused into one. Could I forget you? Many times I thought that I heard the sound of your piano and the accents of your voice. When in Germany, as I wandered at twilight in the woods, peopled with the fantastic creations of its poets and the mysterious legends of past generations, always I called upon your name, imagining that I saw you in the mists that rose from the depths of the valley, or I fancied that I heard your voice in the rustling of the leaves. When from afar I heard the songs of the peasants as they returned from their labours, it seemed to me that their tones harmonised with my inner voices, that they were singing for you, and thus they lent reality to my illusions and dreams. At times I became lost among the mountain paths, and while the night descended slowly, as it does there, I would find myself still wandering, seeking my way among the pines and beeches and oaks. Then, when some scattering rays of moonlight slipped down into the clear spaces left in the dense foliage, I seemed to see you in the heart of the forest, as a dim, loving shade wavering about between the spots of light and shadow. If perhaps the nightingale poured forth his varied trills, I fancied it was because he saw you and was inspired by you. Have I thought of you? The fever of love not only gave warmth to the snows but coloured the ice. The beautiful skies of Italy with their clear depths reminded me of your eyes. Its sunny landscape spoke to me of your smile. The plains of Andalusia, with their sand-laden airs, peopled with oriental memories, full of romance and colour, told me of your love. On dreamy, moonlit nights, while boating on the Rhine, I have asked myself if my fancy did not deceive me as I saw you among the poplars on the banks, on the rocks of the Lorelei, or in the midst of the waters, singing in the silence of the night, as if you were a comforting fairy maiden sent to enliven the solitude and sadness of those ruined castles. I have not travelled like you, so I know only your town and Manila and Antipolo, she answered with a smile which showed that she believed all that he said. But since I said good-bye to you and entered the convent, I have always thought of you and have only put you out of my mind when ordered to do so by my confessor, who imposed many penances upon me. 
I recalled our games and our quarrels when we were children. You used to pick up the most beautiful shells and search in the river for the roundest and smoothest pebbles of different colors that we might play games with them. You were very stupid and always lost, and by way of a forfeit I would slap you with the palm of my hand, but I always tried not to strike you hard, for I had pity on you. In those games you cheated much, even more than I did, and we used to finish our play in a quarrel. Do you remember that time when you became really angry at me? Then you made me suffer, but afterwards, when I thought of it in the convent, I smiled and longed for you so that we might quarrel again, so that we might once more make up. We were still children and had gone with your mother to bathe in the brook under the shade of the thick bamboo. On the banks grew many flowers and plants, whose strange names you told me in Latin and Spanish, for you were even then studying in the Ateneo. I paid no attention, but amused myself by running after the needle-like dragonflies and the butterflies with their rainbow colors and tints of mother-of-pearl as they swarmed about among the flowers. Sometimes I tried to surprise them with my hands or to catch the little fishes that slipped rapidly about amongst the moss and stones in the edge of the water. Once you disappeared suddenly, and when you returned you brought a crown of leaves and orange blossoms, which you placed upon my head, calling me Chloe. For yourself you made one of vines. But your mother snatched away my crown, and after mashing it with a stone, mixed it with the gogo with which she turned to wash our heads. The tears came into your eyes, and you said that she did not understand mythology. "'Silly boy!' your mother exclaimed. "'You will see how sweet your hair will smell afterwards.' I laughed, but you were offended and would not talk with me, and for the rest of the day appeared so serious that I wanted to cry. On our way back to the town through the hot sun, I picked some sage leaves that grew beside the path and gave them to you to put in your hat so that you might not get a headache. You smiled and caught my hand, and we made up. Ibarra smiled with happiness as he opened his pocket-book and took from it a piece of paper in which were wrapped up some dry blackened leaves which gave off a sweet odour. "'Your sage leaves,' he said in answer to her inquiring look. "'This is all that you have ever given me.' She in turn snatched from her bosom a little pouch of white satin. "'You must not touch this,' she said, tapping the palm of his hand lightly. It's a letter of farewell. The one I wrote to you before leaving? Have you ever written me any other, sir? And what did I say to you then? Many fibs, excuses of a delinquent debtor, she answered smilingly, thus giving him to understand how sweet to her those fibs were. Be quiet now, and I'll read it to you. I'll leave out your fine phrases in order not to make a martyr of you. Raising the paper to the height of her eyes, so that the youth might not see her face, she began. My, but I'll not read what follows that, because it's not true. Her eyes ran along some lines. My father wishes me to go away, in spite of all my pleadings. You are a man now, he told me, and you must think about your future and about your duties. You must learn the science of life, a thing which your fatherland cannot teach you, so that you may some day be useful to it. If you remain here in my shadow, in this environment of business affairs, you will not learn to look far ahead. The day in which you lose me, you will find yourself like the plant of which our poet Balthazar tells, grown in the water, its leaves wither at the least scarcity of moisture, and a moment's heat dries it up. Don't you understand? You are almost a young man, and yet you weep. These reproaches hurt me, and I confessed that I loved you. My father reflected for a time in silence, and then, placing his hand on my shoulder, said in a trembling voice, Do you think that you alone know how to love, that your father does not love you, and that he will not feel the separation from you? It is only a short time since we lost your mother, and I must journey on alone toward old age, toward the very time of life when I would seek help and comfort from your truth. 
yet I accept my loneliness, hardly knowing whether I shall ever see you again. But you must think of other and greater things. The future lies open before you, while for me it is already passing behind. Your love is just awakening, while mine is dying. Fire burns in your blood, while the chill is creeping into mine. Yet you weep and cannot sacrifice the present for the future, useful as it may be alike to yourself and to your country. My father's eyes filled with tears, and I fell upon my knees at his feet. I embraced him, I begged his forgiveness, and I assured him that I was ready to set out. Ibarra's growing agitation caused her to suspend the reading, for he had grown pale and was pacing back and forth. "'What's the matter? What is troubling you?' she asked him. "'You have almost made me forget that I have my duties, that I must leave at once for the town. Tomorrow is the day for commemorating the dead.' Maria Clara silently fixed her large dreamy eyes upon him for a few moments, and then, picking some flowers, she said with emotion, "'Go, I won't detain you longer.' In a few days we shall see each other again. Lay these flowers on the tomb of your parents. A few moments later the youth descended the stairway accompanied by Capitan Tiago and Aunt Isabel, while Maria Clara shut herself up in the oratory. Please tell Andeng to get the house ready, as Maria and Isabel are coming. A pleasant journey said Capitan Tiago as Ibarra stepped into the carriage, which at once started in the direction of the plaza of San Gabriel. Afterwards, by way of consolation, her father said to Maria Clara, who was weeping beside an image of the Virgin, Come, light two candles worth two reals each, one to Saint Roche and one to Saint Raphael, the protector of travellers. Light the lamp of Our Lady of Peace and Prosperous Voyages, since there are so many tulisanes. It's better to spend four reals for wax and six cuartos for oil now than to pay a big ransom later. End of chapter 7Chapter 8 of The Social Cancer, a complete English version of Noli Me Tangere from the Spanish of José Rizal by Charles Darbyshire. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avaí in December 2011. Chapter 8. Recollections. Ibarra's carriage was passing through a part of the busiest district in Manila, the same which the night before had made him feel sad, but which by daylight caused him to smile in spite of himself. The movement in every part, so many carriages coming and going at full speed, the caromatas and calesas, the Europeans, the Chinese, the natives, each in his own peculiar costume, the fruit vendors, the money changers, the naked porters, the grocery stores, the lunch stands and restaurants, the shops, and even the cards drawn by the impassive and indifferent Carabao, who seems to amuse himself in carrying burdens while he patiently ruminates, all this noise and confusion, the very sun itself, the distinctive odors and the motley colors, awoke in the youth's mind a world of sleeping recollections. Those streets had not yet been paved, and two successive days of sunshine filled them with dust which covered everything and made the passer-by cough while it nearly blinded him. A day of rain formed pools of muddy water, which at night reflected the carriage lights, and splashed mud a distance of several yards away upon the pedestrians on the narrow sidewalks. And how many women have left their embroidered slippers in those waves of mud! Then there might have been seen repairing those streets the lines of convicts with their shaven heads, dressed in short-sleeved camisas and pantaloons that reached only to their knees, each with his letter and number in blue. On their legs were chains partly wrapped in dirty rags to ease the chafing or perhaps the chill of the iron. 
joined two by two scorched in the sun worn out by the heat and fatigue they were lashed and goaded by a whip in the hands of one of their own number who perhaps consoled himself with this power of maltreating others they were tall men with sombre faces which he had never seen brightened with the light of a smile yet their eyes gleamed when the whistling lash fell upon their shoulders or when a passer-by threw them the chewed and broken stub of a cigar, which the nearest would snatch up and hide in a salakot, while the rest remained gazing at the passers-by with strange looks. The noise of the stones being crushed to fill the puddles, and the merry clank of the heavy fetters on the swollen ankles, seemed to remain with Ibarra. He shuddered as he recalled a scene that had made a deep impression on his childish imagination. It was a hot afternoon, and the burning rays of the sun fell perpendicularly upon a large cart, by the side of which was stretched out one of those unfortunates, lifeless, yes, with his eyes half opened. Two others were silently preparing a bamboo buyer, showing no signs of anger or sorrow or impatience, for such is the character attributed to the natives. Today it is you, tomorrow it will be I they say to themselves. The people moved rapidly about without giving heed. Women came up and, after a look of curiosity, continued unconcerned on their way. It was such a common sight that their hearts had become callous. Carriages passed, flashing back from their varnished sides the rays of the sun that burned in the cloudless sky. Only he, a child of eleven years and fresh from the country, was moved, and to him alone it brought bad dreams on the following night. There no longer existed the useful and honoured Puente de Barcas, the good Filipino pontoon bridge that had done its best to be of service in spite of its natural imperfections and its rising and falling at the caprice of the Pasig, which had more than once abused it and finally destroyed it. The almond trees in the plaza of San Gabriel had not grown, they were still in the same feeble and stunted condition. The escolta appeared less beautiful, in spite of the fact that an imposing building with caryatids carved on its front now occupied the place of the old row of shops. The new bridge of Spain caught his attention, while the houses on the right bank of the river, among the clumps of bamboo and trees where the Escolta ends and the Isla de Romero begins, reminded him of the cool mornings when he used to pass there in a boat on his way to the baths of Uli Uli. He met many carriages drawn by beautiful pairs of dwarfish ponies, within which were government clerks who seemed yet half asleep as they made their way to their offices, or military officers, or Chinese in foolish and ridiculous attitudes, or Gave friars and canons. In an elegant Victoria he thought he recognized Padre Damaso, grave and frowning, but he had already passed. Now he was pleasantly greeted by Capitan Tinong, who was passing in a caretella with his wife and two daughters. As they went down off the bridge, the horses broke into a trot along the Sabana Drive. On the left, the Arroceros Cigar Factory resounded with the noise of the cigar makers pounding the tobacco leaves, and Ibarra was unable to restrain a smile as he thought of the strong odor which about five o'clock in the afternoon used to float all over the Puente de Barcas and which had made him sick when he was a child. The lively conversations and the repartee of the crowds from the cigar factories carried him back to the district of Lavapiés in Madrid, with its riots of cigar-makers, so fatal for the unfortunate policeman. The botanical garden drove away these agreeable recollections. The demon of comparison brought before his mind the botanical gardens of Europe, in countries where great labor and much money are needed to make a single leaf grow or one flower upon its calyx, he recalled those of the colonies, where they were all well supplied and tended, and all open to the public. Ibarra turned away his gaze toward the old Manila, surrounded still by its walls and moats like a sickly girl wrapped in the garments of her grandmother's better days. Then the sight of the sea losing itself in the distance. 
On the other shore lies Europe, thought the young man. Europe, with its attractive peoples in constant movement in the search for happiness, weaving their dreams in the morning and disillusioning themselves at the setting of the sun, happy even in the midst of their calamities. Yes, on the farther shore of the boundless sea are the really spiritual nations, those who, even though they put no restraints on material development, are still more spiritual than those who pride themselves on adoring only the spirit. But these musings were in turn banished from his mind as he came in sight of the little mound in Bagumbayan field. This isolated knoll at the side of the Luneta now caught his attention and made him reminiscent. He thought of the man who had awakened his intellect and made him understand goodness and justice. The ideas which that man had impressed upon him were not many, to be sure, but they were not meaningless repetitions. They were convictions which had not paled in the light of the most brilliant foci of progress. That man was an old priest whose words of farewell still resounded in his ears. Do not forget that if knowledge is the heritage of mankind, it is only the courageous who inherit it, he had reminded him. I have tried to pass on to you what I got from my teachers, the sum of which I have endeavoured to increase and transmit to the coming generation as far as in me lay. You will now do the same for those who come after you, and you can treble it since you are going to rich countries. Then he had added with a smile, They come here seeking wealth. Go you to their country to seek also that other wealth which we lack. But remember that all that glitters is not gold. The old man had died on that spot. At these recollections the youth murmured audibly, No, in spite of everything, the fatherland first, first the Philippines, the child of Spain, first the Spanish fatherland. No, that which is decreed by fate does not tarnish the honour of the fatherland. No. He gave little heed to Ermita, the phoenix of Nipa that had re-arisen from its ashes under the form of blue and white houses with red-painted roofs of corrugated iron. Nor was his attention caught by Malate, neither by the cavalry barracks with the spreading trees in front, nor by the inhabitants of their little Nipa huts, pyramidal or prismatic in shape, hidden away among the banana plants and areca palms, constructed like nests by each father of a family. The carriage continued on its way, meeting now and then caromatas drawn by one or two ponies, whose abaca harness indicated that they were from the country. The drivers would try to catch a glimpse of the occupant of the fine carriage, but would pass on without exchanging a word, without a single salute. At times a heavy cart drawn by a slow and indifferent carabao would appear on the dusty road over which beat the brilliant sunlight of the tropics. The mournful and monotonous song of the driver mounted on the back of the carabao would be mingled at one time with the screechings of a dry wheel on the huge axle of the heavy vehicle, or at another time with the dull scraping of worn-out runners on a sledge, which was dragged heavily through the dust and over the ruts in the road. In the fields and wide meadows the herds were grazing, attended ever by the white buffalo birds which roosted peacefully on the backs of the animals, while these chewed their cuds or browsed in lazy contentment upon the rich grass. In the distance ponies frisked, jumping and running about, pursued by the lively colts with long tails and abundant manes, who whinnied and pawed the ground with their hard hoofs. Let us leave the youth dreaming or dozing, since neither the sad nor the animated poetry of the open country held his attention. For him there was no charm in the sun that gleamed upon the tops of the trees and caused the rustics, with feet burned by the hot ground in spite of their callousness, to hurry along, or that made the villager pause between the shade of an almond tree or a bamboo brake, while he pondered upon vague and inexplicable things. 
while the youth's carriage sways along like a drunken thing on account of the inequalities in the surface of the road when passing over a bamboo bridge or going up an incline or descending a steep slope let us return to manila end of chapter eight chapter nine of the social cancer a complete english version of noli me tangere from the spanish of jose rizal by charles darbyshire this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by avai in december two thousand eleven chapter nine local affairs ibarra had not been mistaken about the occupant of the victoria for it was indeed padre damaso and he was on his way to the house which the youth had just left where are you going asked the friar of maria clara and aunt isabel who were about to enter a silver-mounted carriage in the midst of his preoccupation padre damaso stroked the maiden's cheek lightly to the convent to get my things answered the letter aha aha we'll see who's stronger we'll see muttered the friar abstractedly as with bowed head and slow step he turned to the stairway leaving the two women not a little amazed he must have a sermon to preach and is memorizing it commented aunt isabel get in maria or we'll be late whether or not padre damaso was preparing a sermon we cannot say but it is certain that some grave matter filled his mind for he did not extend his hand to capitan tiago who had almost to get down on his knees to kiss it santiago said the friar at once i have an important matter to talk to you about let's go into your office capitan tiago began to feel uneasy so much so that he did not know what to say but he obeyed following the heavy figure of the priest who closed the door behind him while they confer in secret let us learn what fray sibylla has been doing the astute dominican is not at the rectory for very soon after celebrating mass he had gone to the convent of his order situated just inside the gate of isabel the second or of magellan according to what family happened to be reigning in madrid without paying any attention to the rich odour of chocolate or to the rattle of boxes and coins which came from the treasury and scarcely acknowledging the respectful and deferential salute of the procurator brother he entered passed along several corridors and knocked at a door come in sighed a weak voice may god restore health to your reverence was the young dominican's greeting as he entered seated in a large armchair was an aged priest wasted and rather sallow like the saints that rivera painted his eyes were sunken in their hollow sockets over which his heavy eyebrows were almost always contracted thus accentuating their brilliant gleam padre sibylla with his arms crossed under the venerable scapulary of saint dominic gazed at him feelingly then bowed his head and waited in silence Ah sighed the old man they advise an operation an operation hernando at my age this country oh this terrible country take warning from my ease hernando fray sibylla raised his eyes slowly and fixed them on the sick man's face what has your reverence decided to do he asked to die oh, what else can i do i am suffering too much but i have made many suffer i am paying my debt and how are you what has brought you here i have come to talk about the business which you committed to my care ah what about it pish answered the young man disgustedly as he seated himself and turned away his face with a contemptuous expression they have been telling us fairy tales young ibarra is a youth of discernment he doesn't seem to be a fool but i believe that he's a good lad you believe so hostilities began last night already how 
Fray Sibila then recounted briefly what had taken place between Padre Damaso and Ibarra. Besides, he said in conclusion, the young man is going to marry Capitan Tiago's daughter, who was educated in the college of our sisterhood. He's rich and won't care to make enemies and to run the risk of ruining his fortune and his happiness. The sick man nodded in agreement. Yes, I think as you do. With a wife like that and such a father-in-law, we'll owe him body and soul. If not, so much the better for him to declare himself an enemy of ours. Fray Sibilla looked at the old man in surprise. For the good of our holy order, I mean, of course, he added, breathing heavily. I prefer open attacks to the silly praises and flatteries of friends, which are really paid for. Does your reverence think... The old man regarded him sadly. Keep it clearly before you, he answered, gasping for breath. Our power will last as long as it is believed in. If they attack us, the government will say, they attack them because they see in them an obstacle to their liberty, so then let us preserve them. But if it should listen to them, sometimes the government... It will not listen. Nevertheless, if, led on by cupidity, it should come to wish for itself what we are taking in, if there should be some bold and daring one, then woe unto that one. Both remained silent for a while, then the sick man continued. Besides, we need their attacks to keep us awake that makes us see our weaknesses so that we may remedy them. Exaggerated flattery will deceive us and put us to sleep, while outside our walls we shall be laughed at, and the day in which we become an object of ridicule we shall fall as we fell in Europe. Money will not flow into our churches, no one will buy our scapularies or girdles or anything else, and when we cease to be rich, we shall no longer be able to control consciences. But we shall always have our estates, our property. All will be lost as we lost them in Europe. And the worst of it is that we are working toward our own ruin. For example, this unrestrained eagerness to raise arbitrarily the rents on our lands each year this eagerness which I have so vainly combated in all the chapters, this will ruin us. The native sees himself obliged to purchase farms in other places, which bring him as good returns as ours, or better. I fear that we are already on the decline. Cos vult perdere Jupiter demantat prius. For this reason we should not increase our burden. The people are already murmuring. You have decided well. Let us leave the others to settle their accounts in that quarter. Let us preserve the prestige that remains to us. And as we shall soon appear before God, let us wash our hands of it. And may the God of mercy have pity on our weakness. So your reverence thinks that the rent or tax... Let's not talk any more about money, interrupted the sick man with signs of disgust. You say that the lieutenant threatened to Padre Damaso that... Yes, Padre, broke in Fray Sibilla with a faint smile, but this morning I saw him, and he told me that he was sorry for what occurred last night, that the sherry had gone to his head, and that he believed that Padre Damaso was in the same condition. And your threat? I asked him jokingly. Padre, he answered me, I know how to keep my word when my honor is affected, but I am not, nor have ever been an informer. For that reason, I wear only two stars. After they had conversed a while longer on unimportant subjects, Fray Sibila took his departure. It was true that the lieutenant had not gone to the palace, but the captain-general heard what had occurred. 
while talking with some of his aides about the allusions that the Manila newspapers were making to him under the names of comets and celestial apparitions, one of them told him about the affair of Padre Damaso, with a somewhat heightened colouring, although substantially correct as to matter. "'From whom did you learn this?' asked His Excellency, smiling. "'From La Ruja, who was telling it this morning in the office.' The captain-general again smiled and said, A woman or a friar can't insult one. I contemplate living in peace for the time that I shall remain in this country, and I don't want any more quarrels with men who wear skirts. Besides, I've learned that the provincial has scoffed at my orders. I asked for the removal of this friar as a punishment, and they transferred him to a better town. Monkish tricks, as we say in Spain." but when His Excellency found himself alone, he stopped smiling. "'Ah, if these people were not so stupid, I would put a curb on their reverences,' he sighed to himself. "'But every people deserves its fate, so let's do as everybody else does.' Capitan Tiago, meanwhile, had concluded his interview with Padre Damaso, or rather, to speak more exactly, Padre Damaso had concluded with him. "'So now you are warned,' said the Franciscan on leaving. "'All this could have been avoided if you had consulted me beforehand, "'if you had not lied when I asked you. "'Try not to play any more foolish tricks, and trust your protector.' "'Capitan Tiago walked up and down the sala a few times, "'meditating and sighing. "'Suddenly, as if a happy thought had occurred to him, he ran to the oratory and extinguished the candles and the lamp that had been lighted for Ibarra's safety. "'The way is long, and there's yet time,' he muttered. End of chapter 9Chapter 10 of The Social Cancer, a complete English version of Noli Me Tangere, from the Spanish of José Rizal, by Charles Darbyshire. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Abai in December 2011. Chapter 10. The Town. Almost on the margin of the lake, in the midst of meadows and paddy fields, lies the town of San Diego. From it, sugar, rice, coffee and fruits are either exported or sold for a small part of their value to the Chinese, who exploit the simplicity and vices of the native farmers. When on a clear day the boys ascend to the upper part of the church tower, which is beautified by moss and creeping plants, they break out into joyful exclamations at the beauty of the scene spread out before them. In the midst of the clustering roofs of nipa, tiles, corrugated iron and palm leaves, separated by groves and gardens, each one is able to discover his own home, his little nest. Everything serves as a mark, a tree, that tamarind with its light foliage, that cocoa palm laden with nuts, like the Astarte Genetrix, or the Diana of Ephesus with her numerous breasts, a bending bamboo, an areca palm, or a cross. Yonder is the river, a huge glassy serpent sleeping on a green carpet, with rocks scattered here and there along its sandy channel that break its current into ripples. There the bed is narrowed between high banks to which the gnarled trees cling with bared roots, here it becomes a gentle slope where the stream widens and eddies about. Farther away, a small hut built on the edge of the high bank seems to defy the winds, the heights and the depths, presenting with its slender posts the appearance of a huge, long-legged bird watching for a reptile to seize upon. Trunks of palm or other trees with their bark still on them unite the banks by a shaky and infirm footbridge, which, if not a very secure crossing, is nevertheless a wonderful contrivance for gymnastic exercises in preserving one's balance, a thing not to be despised. The boys bathing in the river are amused by the difficulties of the old woman crossing with a basket on her head, or by the antics of the old man who moves tremblingly and loses his staff in the water. 
but that which always attracts particular notice is what might be called a peninsula of forest in the sea of cultivated fields there in that wood are century-old trees with hollow trunks which die only when their high tops are struck and set on fire by the lightning and it is said that the fire always checks itself and dies out in the same spot there are huge points of rock which time and nature are clothing with velvet garments of moss layer after layer of dust settles in the hollows the rains beat it down and the birds bring seeds the tropical vegetation spreads out luxuriantly in thickets and underbrush while curtains of interwoven vines hang from the branches of the trees and twine about their roots or spread along the ground as if flora were not yet satisfied but must place plant above plant mosses and fungi live upon the cracked trunks and orchids graceful guests twine in loving embrace with the foliage of the hospitable trees strange legends exist concerning this wood which is held in awe by the country folk the most credible account and therefore the one least known and believed seems to be this when the town was still a collection of miserable huts with the grass growing abundantly in the so-called streets at the time when the wild boar and deer roamed about during the nights there arrived in the place one day an old hollow-eyed spaniard who spoke tagalog rather well after looking about and inspecting the land he finally inquired for the owners of this wood in which there were hot springs some persons who claimed to be such presented themselves and the old man acquired it in exchange for clothes jewels and a sum of money soon afterward he disappeared mysteriously the people thought that he had been spirited away when a bad odour from the neighbouring wood attracted the attention of some herdsmen tracing this they found the decaying corpse of the old spaniard hanging from the branch of a balete tree in life he had inspired fear by his deep hollow voice his sunken eyes and his mirthless laugh but now dead by his own act he disturbed the sleep of the women some threw the jewels into the river and burned the clothes and from the time that the corpse was buried at the foot of the balete itself no one willingly ventured near the spot a belated herdsman looking for some of his strayed charges told of lights that he had seen there and when some venturesome youths went to the place they heard mournful cries to win the smiles of his disdainful lady a forlorn lover agreed to spend the night there and in proof to wrap around the trunk a long piece of rattan but he died of a quick fever that seized him the very next day stories and legends still cluster about the place a few months after the finding of the old spaniard's body there appeared a youth apparently a spanish mestizo who said that he was the son of the deceased he established himself in the place and devoted his attention to agriculture especially the raising of indigo don saturnino was a silent young man with a violent disposition even cruel at times yet he was energetic and industrious he surrounded the grave of his father with a wall but visited it only at rare intervals when he was along in years he married a young woman from manila and she became the mother of don rafael the father of crisostomo from his youth don rafael was a favorite with the country people the agricultural methods introduced and encouraged by his father spread rapidly new settlers poured in the chinese came and the settlement became a village with a native priest later the village grew into a town the priest died and fray damaso came all this time the tomb and the land around it remained unmolested sometimes a crowd of boys armed with clubs and stones would become bold enough to wander into the place to gather guavas papayas lomboy and other fruits but it frequently happened that when their sport was at its height or while they gazed in awed silence at the rotting piece of rope which still swung from the branch stones would fall coming from they knew not where then with cries of the old man the old man they would throw away fruit and clubs jump from the trees and hurry between the rocks and through the thickets 
nor would they stop running until they were well out of the wood, some pale and breathless, others weeping, and only a few laughing. End of chapter 10「Chapter Eleven of The Social Cancer, a complete English version of Noli Me Tangere from the Spanish of José Rizal by Charles Darbyshire. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avaí in December 2011. Chapter Eleven, The Rulers. Divide and Rule, the New Machiavelli. Who were the caciques of the town? Don Rafael, when alive, even though he was the richest, owned more land, and was the patron of nearly everybody, had not been one of them. As he was modest and depreciated the value of his own deeds, no faction in his favor had ever been formed in the town, and we have already seen how the people all rose up against him when they saw him hesitate upon being attacked. Could it be Capitan Tiago? True it was that when he went there he was received with an orchestra by his debtors, who banqueted him and heaped gifts upon him. The finest fruits burdened his table, and a quarter of deer or wild boar was his share of the hunt. If he found the horse of a debtor beautiful, half an hour afterwards it was in his stable. All this was true, but they laughed at him behind his back, and in secret called him Sacristan Tiago. Perhaps it was the gobernadorcillo. No, for he was only an unhappy mortal who commanded not, but obeyed, who ordered not, but was ordered, who drove not, but was driven. Nevertheless, he had to answer to the alcalde for having commanded, ordered, and driven, just as if he were the originator of everything. Yet be it said to his credit that he had never presumed upon or usurped such honours which had cost him five thousand pesos and many humiliations. But considering the income it brought him, it was cheap. Well, then, might it be God? Ah, the good God disturbed neither the consciences nor the sleep of the inhabitants. At least he did not make them tremble, and if by chance he might have been mentioned in a sermon, surely they would have sighed longingly, Oh, that only there were a God! To the good Lord they paid little attention, as the saints gave them enough to do. For those poor folk, God had come to be like those unfortunate monarchs who are surrounded by courtiers, to whom alone the people render homage. San Diego was a kind of Rome, not the Rome of the time when the cunning Romulus laid out its walls with a plough, nor of the later time when, bathed in its own and others' blood, it dictated laws to the world. No, it was a Rome of our own times, with the difference that in place of marble monuments and colosseums, it had its monuments of Savali and its cockpit of Nipa. The curate was the Pope in the Vatican, the alferez of the civil guard, the king of Italy on the Quirinal, all, it must be understood, on a scale of Nipa and bamboo. Here, as there, continual quarrelling went on, since each wished to be the master, and considered the other an intruder. Let us examine the characteristics of each. Fray Bernardo Salvi was that silent young Franciscan of whom we have spoken before. In his habits and manners he was quite different from his brethren, and even from his predecessor, the violent Padre Damaso. He was thin and sickly, habitually pensive, strict in the fulfilment of his religious duties, and careful of his good name. In a month after his arrival, nearly everyone in the town had joined the venerable tertiary order, to the great distress of its rival, the Society of the Holy Rosary. His soul leaped with joy to see about each neck four or five scapularies, and around each waist a knotted girdle, and to behold the procession of corpses and ghosts in gingon habits. The senior sacristan made a small fortune selling, or giving away as alms, we should say, all things necessary for the salvation of the soul and the warfare against the devil, as it is well known that this spirit, 
which formerly had the temerity to contradict God himself face to face and to doubt his words, as is related in the holy book of Job, who carried our Lord Christ through the air as afterwards in the dark ages he carried the ghosts, and continues, according to report, to carry the Azuang of the Philippines, now seems to have become so shamefaced that he cannot endure the sight of a piece of painted cloth, and that he fears the knots on a cord. But all this proves nothing more than that there is progress on this side also, and that the devil is backward, or at least a conservative, as are all who dwell in darkness. Otherwise we must attribute to him the weakness of a fifteen-year-old girl. As we have said, Fray Salvi was very assiduous in the fulfilment of his duties, too assiduous, the alferes thought. While he was preaching, he was very fond of preaching, the doors of the church were closed, wherein he was like Nero, who allowed no one to leave the theatre while he was singing. But the former did it for the salvation, and the latter for the corruption of souls. Fray Salvi rarely resorted to blows, but was accustomed to punish every shortcoming of his subordinates with fines. In this respect he was very different from Padre Damaso, who had been accustomed to settle everything with his fists or a cane, administering such chastisement with the greatest goodwill. For this, however, he should not be judged too harshly, as he was firm in the belief that the Indian could be managed only by beating him, just as was affirmed by a friar who knew enough to write books, and Padre Damaso never disputed anything that he saw in print, a credulity of which many might have reason to complain. Although Fray Salvi made little use of violence, yet, as an old wiseacre of the town said, what he lacked in quantity he made up in quality. But this should not be counted against him, for the fasts and abstinences thinned his blood and unstrung his nerves, and, as the people said, the wind got into his head. Thus it came about that it was not possible to learn from the condition of the sacristan's backs whether the curate was fasting or feasting. The only rival of this spiritual power, with tendencies toward the temporal, was, as we have said, the alferes, the only one, since the women told how the devil himself would flee from the curate, because, having one day dared to tempt him, he was caught, tied to a bedpost, soundly whipped with a rope, and set at liberty only after nine days. As a consequence, any one who after this would still be the enemy of such a man deserved to fall into worse repute than even the weak and unwary devils. But the alferes deserved his fate. His wife was an old Filipina of abundant rouge and paint, known as Doña Consolacion, although her husband and some others called her by quite another name. The alferes revenged his conjugal misfortunes on his own person by getting so drunk that he made a tank of himself, or by ordering his soldiers to drill in the sun while he remained in the shade, or, more frequently, by beating up his consort, who, if she was not a lamb of God to take away one's sins, at least served to lay up for her spouse many torments in purgatory, if, perchance, he should get there, a matter of doubt to the devout women. As if for the fun of it, these two used to beat each other up beautifully, giving free shows to the neighborhood with vocal and instrumental accompaniments, four-handed, soft, loud, with pedal and all. Whenever these scandals reached the ears of Padre Salvi, he would smile, cross himself, and recite a paternoster. They called him a grafter, a hypocrite, a carlist, and a miser. He merely smiled and recited more prayers. The alferes had a little anecdote which he always related to the occasional Spaniards who visited him. "'Are you going over to the convento to visit the sanctimonious rascal there, the little curate?' Yes? Well, if he offers you chocolate, which I doubt, but if he offers it, remember this. If he calls to the servant and says, Juan, make a cup of chocolate, eh? Then stay without fear. But if he calls out, Juan, make a cup of chocolate, ah, then take your hat and leave on a run. What? The startled visitor would ask. Does he poison people? 
Carambas! No, man, not at all. What then? Chocolate A means thick and rich, while chocolate A means watered and thin. But we are of the opinion that this was a slander on the part of the alferez, since the same story is told of many curates. At least it may be a thing peculiar to the order. To make trouble for the curate, the soldier, at the instigation of his wife, would prohibit anyone from walking abroad after nine o'clock at night. Doña Consolación would then claim that she had seen the curate, disguised in a piña camisa and salacot, walking about late. Fray Salvi would take his revenge in a holy manner. Upon seeing the alferez enter the church, he would innocently order the sacristan to close all the doors, and would then go up into the pulpit and preach until the very saints closed their eyes, and even the wooden dove above his head, the image of the Holy Ghost, murmured for mercy. But the alferez, like all the unregenerate, did not change his ways for this. He would go away cursing, and as soon as he was able to catch a sacristan, or one of the curate's servants, he would arrest him, give him a beating, and make him scrub the floor of the barracks and that of his own house, which at such times was put in a decent condition. On going to pay the fine imposed by the curate for his absence, the sacristan would explain the cause. Fray Salvi would listen in silence, take the money, and at once turn out his goats and sheep, so that they might graze in the alferez garden, while he himself looked up a new text for another, longer, and more edifying sermon. But these were only little pleasantries, and if the two chanced to meet, they would shake hands and converse politely. When her husband was sleeping off the wine he had drunk, or was snoring through the siesta, and she could not quarrel with him, Doña Consolación, in a blue flannel camisa, with a big cigar in her mouth, would take her stand at the window. She could not endure the young people, so from there she would scrutinize and mock the passing girls, who, being afraid of her, would hurry by in confusion, holding their breath the while, and not daring to raise their eyes. One great virtue Doña Consolación possessed, and this was that she had evidently never looked in a mirror. These were the rulers of the town of San Diego. End of chapter 11、2011. The one thing, perhaps, that indisputably distinguishes man from the brute creation is the attention which he pays to those who have passed away, and, wonder of wonders, this characteristic seems to be more deeply rooted in proportion to the lack of civilization. Historians relate that the ancient inhabitants of the Philippines venerated and deified their ancestors, but now the contrary is true, and the dead have to entrust themselves to the living. It is also related that the people of New Guinea preserve the bones of their dead in chests and maintain communication with them. The greater part of the peoples of Asia, Africa, and America offer them the finest products of their kitchens or dishes of what was their favorite food when alive, and give banquets at which they believe them to be present. The Egyptians raised up palaces, and the Mussulmans built shrines. But the masters in these things, those who have most clearly read the human heart, are the people of Dahomey. These Negroes know that man is revengeful, so they consider that nothing will more content the dead than to sacrifice all his enemies upon his grave, and, as man is curious and may not know how to entertain himself in the other life, each year they send him a newsletter under the skin of a beheaded slave. We ourselves differ from all the rest. In spite of the inscriptions on the tombs, hardly anyone believes that the dead rest, and much less, that they rest in peace. 
the most optimistic fancies his forefathers still roasting in purgatory and if it turns out that he himself be not completely damned he will yet be able to associate with them for many years if any one would contradict let him visit the churches and cemeteries of the country on all saints day and he will be convinced now that we are in san diego let us visit its cemetery which is located in the midst of paddy fields there toward the west not a city merely a village of the dead approached by a path dusty in dry weather and navigable on rainy days a wooden gate and a fence half of stone and half of bamboo stakes appear to separate it from the abode of the living but not from the curate's goats and some of the pigs of the neighbourhood who come and go making explorations among the tombs and enlivening the solitude with their presence in the centre of this enclosure rises a large wooden cross set on a stone pedestal the storms have doubled over the tin plate for the inscription i n r i and the rains have effaced the letters at the foot of the cross as on the real golgotha is a confused heap of skulls and bones which the indifferent grave digger has thrown from the graves he digs and there they will probably await not the resurrection of the dead but the coming of the animals to defile them round about may be noted signs of recent excavations here the earth is sunken there it forms a low mound there grow in all their luxuriance the tarambulo to prick the feet with its spiny berries and the pandakaki to add its odour to that of the cemetery as if the place did not have smelt enough already yet the ground is sprinkled with a few little flowers which like those skulls are only known to their creator their petals wear a pale smile and their fragrance is the fragrance of the tombs the grass and creepers fill up the corners or climb over the walls and niches to cover and beautify the naked ugliness and in places even penetrate into the fissures made by the earthquakes so as to hide from sight the revered hollowness of the sepulchre at the time we enter the people have driven the animals away with the single exception of some old hog an animal that is hard to convince who shows his small eyes and pulling back his head from a great gap in the fence sticks up his snout and seems to say to a woman praying near don't eat it all leave something for me won't you two men are digging a grave near one of the tottering walls one of them the grave digger works with indifference throwing about bones as a gardener does stones and dry branches while the other more intent on his work is perspiring smoking and spitting at every moment listen says the latter in tagalog wouldn't it be better for us to dig in some other place this is too recent one grave is as recent as another i can't stand it any longer that bone you just cut in two has blood oozing from it and those hairs but how sensitive you are was the other's reproach just as if you were a town clerk if like myself you had dug up a corpse of twenty days on a dark and rainy night my lantern went out his companion shuddered the coffin burst open the corpse fell halfway out it stunk and suppose you had to carry it the rain wet us both Ugh. and why did you dig it up the grave digger looked at him in surprise why how do i know i was ordered to do so who ordered you the grave digger stepped backward and looked his companion over from head to foot man you're like a spaniard for afterwards a spaniard asked me the same questions but in secret so i'm going to answer you as i answered the spaniard the fat curate ordered me to do so ah and what did you do with the corpse afterwards further questioned the sensitive one the devil if i didn't know you and was not sure that you are a man i would say that you were certainly a spaniard of the civil guard since you ask questions just as he did well the fat curate ordered me to bury it in the chinaman's cemetery but the coffin was heavy and the chinese cemetery far away no no i'm not going to dig any more the other interrupted in horror as he threw away his spade and jumped out of the hole 
I've cut a skull in two and I'm afraid that he won't let me sleep tonight. The old gravedigger laughed to see how the chicken-hearted fellow left, crossing himself. The cemetery was filling up with men and women dressed in mourning. Some sought a grave for a time, disputing among themselves the while, and as if they were unable to agree, they scattered about, each kneeling where he thought best. Others, who had niches for their deceased relatives, lighted candles and fell to praying devoutly. Exaggerated or suppressed sighs and sobs were heard amid the hum of prayers, ora preo, ora preis, requiem eternams, that arose from all sides. A little old man with bright eyes entered bareheaded. Upon seeing him, many laughed, and some women knitted their eyebrows. The old man did not seem to pay any attention to these demonstrations, as he went forward a pile of skulls and knelt to look earnestly for something among the bones. Then he carefully removed the skulls one by one, but apparently without finding what he sought, for he wrinkled his brow, nodded his head from side to side, looked all about him, and finally rose and approached the grave-digger, who raised his head when the old man spoke to him. Do you know where there is a beautiful skull, white as the meat of a coconut, with a complete set of teeth which I had there at the foot of the cross under those leaves? The grave-digger shrugged his shoulders. Look, added the old man, showing a silver coin. I have only this, but I'll give it to you if you find the skull for me. The gleam of the silver caused the grave-digger to consider, and starting toward the heap of bones, he said, Isn't it there? No? Then I don't know where it is. Don't you know? When those who owe me pay me, I'll give you more, continued the old man. It was the skull of my wife, so if you find it for me... Isn't it there? Then I don't know. But if you wish, I can give you another. You're like the grave you're digging, apostrophized the old man nervously. You don't know the value of what you lose. For whom is that grave? How should I know, replied the other in bad humor, for a corpse. Like the grave, like the grave, repeated the old man with a dry smile. You don't know what you throw away, nor what you receive. Dig, dig on. And he turned away in the direction of the gate. Meanwhile, the grave digger had completed his task, attested by the two mounds of fresh red earth at the sides of the grave. He took some buyo from his salakot and began to chew it, while he stared stupidly at what was going on around him. End of chapter 12「Chapter 13 of The Social Cancer, a complete English version of Noli me tangere from the Spanish of José Rizal by Charles Darbyshire. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avaí in December 2011. Chapter 13 – Signs of Storm as the old man was leaving the cemetery, there stopped at the head of the path a carriage, which, from its dust-covered appearance and sweating horses, seems to have come from a great distance. Followed by an aged servant, Ibarra left the carriage and dismissed it with a wave of his hand, then gravely and silently turned toward the cemetery. "'My illness and my duties have not permitted me to return,' said the old servant timidly. Capitan Tiago promised that he would see that a niche was constructed, but I planted some flowers on the grave and set up a cross carved by my own hands. Ibarra made no reply. There, behind that big cross, sir, he added when they were well inside the gate, as he pointed to the place. Ibarra was so intent upon his quest that he did not notice the movement of surprise on the part of the persons who recognized him and suspended their prayers to watch him curiously. He walked along carefully to avoid stepping on any of the graves which were easily distinguishable by the hollow places in the soil. In other times he had walked on them carelessly, but now they were to be respected. His father lay among them. 
When he reached the large cross, he stopped and looked all around. His companion stood confused and confounded, seeking some mark in the ground, but nowhere was any cross to be seen. "'Was it here?' he murmured through his teeth. "'No, there, but the ground has been disturbed.' Ibarra gave him a look of anguish. "'Yes,' he went on, "'I remember that there was a stone near it. The grave was rather short. The grave-digger was sick, so a farmer had to dig it. But let's ask that man what has become of the cross.' They went over to where the grave-digger was watching them with curiosity. He removed his salakot respectfully as they approached. "'Can you tell me which is the grave there that had a cross over it?' asked the servant. The grave-digger looked toward the place and reflected. "'A big cross?' "'Yes, a big one,' affirmed the servant eagerly, with a significant look at Ibarra, whose face lighted up. "'A carved cross, tied up with rattan?' continued the grave-digger. "'Yes, that's it, that's it, like this!' exclaimed the servant in answer as he drew on the ground the figure of a Byzantine cross. "'Were there flowers scattered on the grave?' "'Oleanders and tuberoses and forget-me-nots, yes!' the servant added joyfully, offering the grave-digger a cigar. "'Tell us which is the grave and where the cross is.' The grave-digger scratched his ear and answered with a yawn. "'Well, as for the cross, I burned it.' "'Burned it? Why did you burn it?' "'Because the fat curate ordered me to do so.' "'Who is the fat curate?' asked Ibarra. "'Who?' Why, the one that beats people with a big cane. Ibarra drew his hand across his forehead. But at least you can tell us where the grave is. You must remember that. The grave-digger smiled as he answered quietly, But the corpse is no longer there. What's that you're saying? Yes, continued the grave-digger in a half-jesting tone. I buried a woman in that place a week ago. "'Are you crazy?' cried the servant. "'It hasn't been a year since we buried him.' "'That's very true, but a good many months ago I dug the body up. The fat curate ordered me to do so and to take it to the cemetery of the Chinaman. But as it was heavy and there was rain that night—' He was stopped by the threatening attitude of Ibarra, who had caught him by the arm and was shaking him. "'Did you do that?' demanded the youth in an indescribable tone. "'Don't be angry, sir,' stammered the pale and trembling grave-digger. "'I didn't bury him among the Chinamen. Better be drowned than lie among Chinamen,' I said to myself, so I threw the body into the lake. Ibarra placed both his hands on the grave-digger's shoulder and stared at him for a long time with an indefinable expression. Then, with the ejaculation, you are only a miserable slave he turned away hurriedly stepping upon bones graves and crosses like one beside himself the grave-digger patted his arm and muttered all the trouble that man caused the fat padre caned me for allowing it to be buried while i was sick and this fellow almost tore my arm off for having dug it up that's what these spaniards are i'll lose my job yet Ibarra walked rapidly with a faraway look in his eyes, while the aged servant followed him weeping. The sun was setting, and over the eastern sky was flung a heavy curtain of clouds. A dry wind shook the treetops and made the bamboo clumps creak. Ibarra went bareheaded, but no tear wet his eyes, nor did any sigh escape from his breast. He moved as if fleeing from something, perhaps the shade of his father, perhaps the approaching storm. He crossed through the town to the outskirts on the opposite side and turned toward the old house which he had not entered for so many years. Surrounded by a cactus-covered wall, it seemed to beckon to him with its open windows, while the ilang ilang waved its flower-laden branches joyfully, and the doves circled about the conical roof of their coat in the middle of the garden. But the youth gave no heed to these signs of welcome back to his old home, 
his eyes being fixed on the figure of a priest approaching from the opposite direction. It was the curate of San Diego, the pensive Franciscan whom we have seen before, the rival of the Alferez. The breeze folded back the brim of his white hat and blew his gingon habit closely about him, revealing the outlines of his body and his thin, curved thighs. In his right hand he carried an ivory-headed palasan cane. This was the first time that he and Ibarra had met. When they drew near each other, Ibarra stopped and gazed at him from head to foot. Fray Salvi avoided the look and tried to appear unconcerned. After a moment of hesitation, Ibarra went up to him quickly and, dropping a heavy hand on his shoulder, asked in a husky voice, "'What did you do with my father?' Fray Salvi, pale and trembling as he read the deep feelings that flushed the youth's face, could not answer. He seemed paralyzed. "'What did you do with my father?' again demanded the youth in a choking voice. The priest, who was gradually being forced to his knees by the heavy hand that pressed upon his shoulder, made a great effort and answered, "'You are mistaken. I did nothing to your father.' "'You didn't?' went on the youth, forcing him down upon his knees. "'No, I assure you, it was my predecessor, it was Padre Damaso.' "'Ah!' exclaimed the youth, releasing his hold and clapping his hands desperately to his brow. Then, leaving poor Frey Salvi, he turned away and hurried toward his house. The old servant came up and helped the friar to his feet.' End of chapter 13。chapter 14 of the social cancer。a complete English version of no l i m e t a n g e r e from the Spanish of Jose Rizal by Charles Darbyshire。this LibriVox recording is in the public domain。recording by a b a i in December 2011。chapter 14。Tasio。lunatic or sage the peculiar old man wandered about the streets aimlessly a former student of philosophy he had given up his career in obedience to his mother's wishes and not from any lack of means or ability quite the contrary it was because his mother was rich and he was said to possess talent the good woman feared that her son would become learned and forget God, so she had given him his choice of entering the priesthood or leaving college. Being in love, he chose the latter course and married. Then, having lost both his wife and his mother within a year, he sought consolation in his books in order to free himself from sorrow, the cockpit, and the dangers of idleness. He became so addicted to his studies and the purchase of books that he entirely neglected his fortune and gradually ruined himself. Persons of culture called him Don Anastasio or Tasio the Sage, while the great crowd of the ignorant knew him as Tasio the Lunatic on account of his peculiar ideas and his eccentric manner of dealing with others. As we said before, the evening threatened to be stormy. The lightning flashed its pale rays across the leaden sky, the air was heavy, and the slight breeze excessively sultry. Tasio had apparently already forgotten his beloved skull, and now he was smiling as he looked at the dark clouds. Near the church he met a man wearing an alpaca coat, who carried in one hand a large bundle of candles, and in the other a tasseled cane, the emblem of his office as gobernadorcillo. "'You seem to be merry,' he greeted Tasio in Tagalog. "'Truly I am, Señor Capitan. I am merry because I hope for something.' "'Ah? Huh? What do you hope for?' "'The storm.' "'The storm? Are you thinking of taking a bath?' asked the gobernadorcillo in a jesting way as he stared at the simple attire of the old man. A bath? That's not a bad idea, especially when one has just stumbled over some trash, answered Tasio in a similar, though somewhat more offensive tone, staring at the other's face. 
but I hope for something better. What then? Some thunderbolts that will kill people and burn down houses, returned the sage seriously. Why don't you ask for the deluge at once? We all deserve it, even you and I. You, Senor Gobernadorcillo, have there a bundle of tapers that came from some Chinese shop, yet this now makes the tenth year that I have been proposing to each new occupant of your office the purchase of lightning rods. Every one laughs at me and buys bombs and rockets and pays for the ringing of bells. Even you yourself, on the day after I made my proposition, ordered from the Chinese founders a bell in honor of St. Barbara, when science has shown that it is dangerous to ring the bells during a storm. Explain to me why in the year 70, when lightning struck in Binyan, it hit the very church tower and destroyed the clock and altar. What was the bell of St. Barbara doing then? At the moment there was a vivid flash. Jesus Maria y José, holy St. Barbara! exclaimed the gobernadorcillo, turning pale and crossing himself. Tasio burst out into a loud laugh. You are worthy of your patroness, he remarked dryly in Spanish as he turned his back and went toward the church. Inside, the sacristans were preparing a catafalque bordered with candles placed in wooden sockets. Two large tables had been placed one above the other, and covered with black cloth, across which ran white stripes, with here and there a skull painted on it. "'Is that for the souls or for the candles?' inquired the old man, but noticing two boys, one about ten and the other seven, he turned to them without awaiting an answer from the sacristans. "'Won't you come with me, boys?' he asked them. "'Your mother has prepared a supper for you, fit for a curate.' The senior sacristan will not let us leave until eight o'clock, sir, answered the larger of the two boys. I expect to get my pay to give it to our mother. Ah, and where are you going now? To the belfry, sir, to ring the knell for the souls. Going to the belfry? <laughs> then take care. Don't go near the bells during the storm. Tasio then left the church not without first bestowing a look of pity on the two boys, who were climbing the stairway into the organ loft. He passed his hand over his eyes, looked at the sky again, and murmured, Now I should be sorry if thunderbolts should fall. With his head bowed in thought, he started towards the outskirts of the town. Won't you come in? invited a voice in Spanish from a window. The sage raised his head and saw a man of thirty or thirty-five years of age smiling at him. "'What are you reading there?' asked Tasio, pointing to a book the man held in his hand. "'A work just published, The Torments Suffered by the Blessed Souls in Purgatory,' the other answered with a smile. "'Man, man, man!' exclaimed the sage in an altered tone as he entered the house. "'The author must be a very clever person.' Upon reaching the top of the stairway, he was cordially received by the master of the house, Don Filippo Lino, and his young wife, Doña Teodora Vigna. Don Filippo was the teniente mayor of the town and leader of one of the parties, the liberal faction, if it be possible to speak so, and if there exist parties in the towns of the Philippines. Did you meet in the cemetery the son of the deceased Don Rafael, who has just returned from Europe? Yes, I saw him as he alighted from his carriage. They say that he went to look for his father's grave. It must have been a terrible blow. The sage shrugged his shoulders. Doesn't such a misfortune affect you? asked the young wife. You know very well that I was one of the six who accompanied the body, and it was I who appealed to the captain-general when I saw that no one, not even the authorities, said anything about such an outrage, although I always prefer to honour a good man in life rather than to worship him after his death. Well? But, madam, I am not a believer in hereditary monarchy. 
by reason of the Chinese blood which I have received from my mother, I believe a little like the Chinese. I honor the father on account of the son, and not the son on account of the father. I believe that each one should receive the reward or punishment for his own deeds, not for those of another. Did you order a mass said for your dead wife as I advised you yesterday? asked the young woman, changing the subject of conversation. No, answered the old man with a smile. What a pity! she exclaimed with unfeigned regret. They say that until ten o'clock tomorrow the souls will wander at liberty, awaiting the prayers of the living, and that during these days one mass is equivalent to five on other days of the year, or even to six, as the curate said this morning. What? Does that mean that we have a period without paying, which we should take advantage of? But, Dore, interrupted Don Filippo, you know that Don Anastasio doesn't believe in purgatory. I don't believe in purgatory, protested the old man, partly rising from his seat, even when I know something of its history. The history of purgatory, exclaimed the couple, full of surprise. Come, relate it to us. You don't know it, and yet you order masses and talk about its torments, well, as it has begun to rain and threatens to continue, we shall have time to relieve the monotony, replied Tassio, falling into a thoughtful mood. Don Filippo closed the book which he held in his hand, and Dore sat down at his side, determined not to believe anything that the old man was about to say. The letter began in the following manner. Purgatory existed long before our Lord came into the world, and must have been located in the centre of the earth, according to Padre Astete, or somewhere near Cluny, according to the monk of whom Padre Girard tells us. But the location is of least importance here. Now then, who were scorching in those fires that had been burning from the beginning of the world? Its very ancient existence is proved by Christian philosophy, which teaches that God has created nothing new since he rested. But it could have existed in potentia and not in actu, observed Don Filippo. Very well. But yet I must answer that some knew of it, and as existing in actu. One of these was Zarathustra, or Zoroaster, who wrote part of the Zend Avesta and founded a religion which in some points resembles ours, and Zarathustra, according to the scholars, flourished at least eight hundred years before Christ. I say, at least, since Gaffarel, after examining the testimony of Plato, Xantus of Lydia, Pliny, Hermippus, and Eudoxus, believes it to have been two thousand five hundred years before our era. However that may be, it is certain that Zarathustra talked of a kind of purgatory and showed ways of getting free from it. The living could redeem the souls of those who died in sin by reciting passages from the Avesta and by doing good works, but under the condition that the person offering the petitions should be a relative up to the fourth generation. The time for this occurred every year and lasted five days. Later, when this belief had become fixed among the people, the priests of that religion saw in it a chance of profit, and so they exploited the deep and dark prison where remorse reigns, as Zarathustra called it. They declared that by the payment of a small coin it was possible to save a soul from a year of torture, but as in that religion there were sins punishable by three hundred to a thousand years of suffering, such as lying, faithlessness, failure to keep one's word, and so on, it resulted that the rascals took in countless sums. Here you will observe something like our purgatory, if you take into account the differences in the religions. A vivid flash of lightning, followed by rolling thunder, caused Dore to start up and exclaim as she crossed herself, Jesus Maria y José, I'm going to leave you. I'm going to burn some sacred palm and light candles of penitence. The rain began to fall in torrents. 
the sage Tassio, watching the young woman leave, continued. Now that she is not here, we can consider this matter more rationally. Doré, even though a little superstitious, is a good Catholic, and I don't care to root out the faith from her heart. A pure and simple faith is as distinct from fanaticism as the flame from smoke or music from discords. Only the fools and the deaf confuse them. Between ourselves, we can say that the idea of purgatory is good, holy, and rational. It perpetuates the union of those who were and those who are, leading thus to a greater purity of life. The evil is in its abuse. But let us now see where Catholicism got this idea, which does not exist in the Old Testament nor in the Gospels. Neither Moses nor Christ made the slightest mention of it, and the single passage which is cited from Maccabees is insufficient. Besides, this book was declared apocryphal by the Council of Laodicea, and the Holy Catholic Church accepted it only later. Neither have the pagan religions anything like it. The oft-quoted passage in Virgil, Alie Panduntur Inanes, which probably gave occasion for St. Gregory the Great to speak of drowned souls, and to Dante for another narrative in his Divine Comedy, cannot have been the origin of this belief. Neither the Brahmins, the Buddhists, nor the Egyptians, who may have given Rome her Charon and her Avernus, had anything like this idea. I won't speak now of the religions of Northern Europe, for they were religions of warriors, bards and hunters, and not of philosophers. While they yet preserved their beliefs and even their rights under Christian forms, they were unable to accompany the hordes in the spoliation of Rome or to seat themselves on the Capitoline. The religions of the mists were dissipated by the southern sun. Now then, the early Christians did not believe in a purgatory, but died in the blissful confidence of shortly seeing God face to face. Apparently the first fathers of the church who mentioned it were St. Clement of Alexandria, Origen, and St. Irenaeus, who were all perhaps influenced by Zarathustra's religion, which still flourished and was widely spread throughout the East, since at every step we read reproaches against Origen's Orientalism. St. Irenaeus proved its existence by the fact that Christ remained three days in the depths of the earth three days of purgatory, and deduced from this that every soul must remain there until the resurrection of the body, although the hodie mecrum eris in paradiso seems to contradict it. St. Augustine also speaks of purgatory, and, if not affirming its existence, yet he did not believe it impossible, conjecturing that in another existence there might continue the punishments that we receive in this life for our sins. "'The devil with St. Augustine!' ejaculated Don Filippo. "'He wasn't satisfied with what we suffer here, but wished a continuance.' Well, so it went. Some believed it, and others didn't. Although St. Gregory finally came to admit it, De quibus dam levibus cultis esse ante judicium purgatorius ignis credendus est, yet nothing definite was done until the year 1439, that is, eight centuries later, when the Council of Florence declared that there must exist a purifying fire for the soul of those who have died in the love of God but without having satisfied divine justice. Lastly, the Council of Trent and the Pius IV in 1563, in the 25th session, issued the purgatorial decree beginning Cura Catholica Ecclesia, Spiritu Santo Edocta, wherein it deduces that, after the office of the Mass, the petitions of the living, their prayers, alms and other pious works, are the surest means of freeing the souls. Nevertheless, the Protestants do not believe in it, nor do the Greek fathers, since they reject any biblical authority for it, and say that our responsibility ends with death, and that the quodcumque ligaberis in terra does not mean usque ad purgatorium, but to this the answer can be made, 
that since purgatory is located in the centre of the earth, it fell naturally under the control of St. Peter. But I should never get through if I had to relate all that has been said on the subject. Any day that you wish to discuss the matter with me, come to my house and there we will consult the books and talk freely and quietly. Now I must go. I don't understand why Christian piety permits robbery on this night, and you, the authorities, allow it, and I fear for my books. If they should steal them to read, I wouldn't object, but I know that there are many who wish to burn them in order to do for me an act of charity, and such charity, worth of the Caliph Omar, is to be dreaded. Some believe that on account of those books I am already damned, but I suppose that you do believe in damnation, asked Doré with a smile, as she appeared carrying in a brazier the dry palm leaves, which gave off a peculiar smoke and an agreeable odour. I don't know, madam, what God will do with me, replied the old man thoughtfully. When I die, I will commit myself to him without fear, and he may do with me what he wishes. But a thought strikes me. What thought is that? If the only ones who can be saved are the Catholics, and of them only five per cent, as many curates say, and as the Catholics form only a twelfth part of the population of the world, if we believe what statistics show, it would result that after damning millions and millions of men during the countless ages that passed before the Saviour came to the earth, after a Son of God has died for us, it is now possible to save only five in every twelve hundred. That cannot be so. I prefer to believe and say with Job, Wilt thou break a leaf driven to and fro, and wilt thou pursue the dry stubble? No, such a calamity is impossible, and to believe it is blasphemy. What do you wish? Divine justice? Divine purity? Oh, but divine justice and divine purity saw the future before the creation, answered the old man as he rose shuddering. Man is an accidental and not a necessary part of creation, and that God cannot have created him, no indeed, only to make a few happy and condemn hundreds to eternal misery, and all in a moment for hereditary faults. No, if that be true, strangle your baby son sleeping there. If such a belief were not blasphemy against that God who must be the highest good, then the Phoenician Moloch, which was appeased with human sacrifices and innocent blood, and in whose belly were burned the babes torn from their mother's breasts, that bloody deity, that horrible divinity, would be by the side of him a weak girl, a friend, a mother of humanity. Horrified, the lunatic, or the sage, left the house and ran along the street in spite of the rain and the darkness. A lurid flash followed by frightful thunder and filling the air with deadly currents, lighted the old man as he stretched his hand toward the sky and cried out, Thou protestest! I know that thou art not cruel! I know that I must only name thee good! The flashes of lightning became more frequent, and the storm increased in violence. End of chapter 14 Chapter 15 of The Social Cancer, a complete English version of Noli Me Tangere from the Spanish of José Rizal by Charles Darbyshire. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avaí in December 2011. Chapter 15. The Sacristans. The thunder resounded, roar following close upon roar, each preceded by a blinding flash of zigzag lightning, so that it might have been said that God was writing his name in fire and that the eternal arch of heaven was trembling with fear. The rain whipped about in a different direction each moment by the mournfully whistling wind fell in torrents. 
With a voice full of fear the bells sounded their sad supplication, and in the brief pauses between the roars of the unchained elements tolled forth sorrowful peals like plaintive groans. On the second floor of the church tower were the two boys whom we saw talking to the sage. The younger, a child of seven years, with large black eyes and a timid countenance, was huddling close to his brother, a boy of ten, whom he greatly resembled in features, except that the look on the elder's face was deeper and firmer. Both were meanly dressed in clothes full of rents and patches. They sat upon a block of wood, each holding the end of a rope which extended upward and was lost amid the shadows above. The wind-driven rain reached them and snuffed the piece of candle burning dimly on the large round stone that was used to furnish the thunder on Good Friday by being rolled around the gallery. "'Pull on the rope, Crispin! Pull!' cried the elder to his little brother, who did as he was told, so that from above was heard a faint peal instantly drowned out by the re-echoing thunder." "'Oh, if we were only at home now with mother,' sighed the younger, as he gazed at his brother. "'There I shouldn't be afraid.' The elder did not answer. He was watching the melting wax of the candle, apparently lost in thought. "'There no one would say that I stole,' went on Crispin. "'Mother wouldn't allow it. If she knew that they whipped me—' The elder took his gaze from the flame, raised his head, and clutching the thick rope pulled violently on it so that the sonorous peal of the bells was heard. "'Are we always going to live this way, brother?' continued Crispin. "'I'd like to get sick at home to-morrow. I'd like to fall into a long sickness so that mother might take care of me and not let me come back to the convento, so I'd not be called a thief, nor would they whip me.' "'And you, too, brother, you must get sick with me.' "'No,' answered the older. "'We should all die, mother of grief, and we of hunger.' Crispin remained silent for a moment, then asked, "'How much will you get this month?' Two pesos. They find me twice.' "'Then pay what they say I've stolen, so that they won't call us thieves. "'Pay it, brother.' "'Are you crazy, Crispin? Mother wouldn't have anything to eat. "'The senior sacristan says that you've stolen two gold pieces, "'and they are worth thirty-two pesos.' "'The little one counted on his fingers up to thirty-two. Six hands and two fingers over, and each finger a peso,' he murmured thoughtfully. "'And each peso? How many cuartos?' "'A hundred and sixty. A hundred and sixty cuartos. A hundred and sixty time a cuarto. Goodness. And how many are a hundred and sixty? Thirty-two hands, answered the older. Crispin looked hard at his little hands. Thirty-two hands, he repeated, six hands and two fingers over, and each finger thirty-two hands, and each finger a cuarto, goodness what a lot of cuartos i could hardly count them in three days and with them could be bought shoes for our feet a head for my head when the sun shines hot a big umbrella for the rain and food and clothes for you and mother and he became silent and thoughtful again now i'm sorry that i didn't steal he soon exclaimed crispin reproached his brother. "'Don't get angry. The curate has said he'll beat me to death if the money doesn't appear, and if I had stolen it I could make it appear. Anyhow, if I died, you and mother would at least have clothes. Oh, if I had only stolen it!' The elder pulled on the rope in silence. After a time he replied with a sigh, what I'm afraid of is that mother will scold you when she knows about it. Do you think so? asked the younger with astonishment. You will tell her that they whipped me and I'll show the welts on my back and my torn pocket. I had only one cuarto which was given to me last Easter, but the curate took that away from me yesterday. I never saw a prettier cuarto. 
No, mother won't believe it. If the curate says so... Crispin began to cry, murmuring between his sobs. Then go home alone. I don't want to go. Tell mother that I'm sick. I don't want to go. Crispin, don't cry, pleaded the elder. Mother won't believe it. Don't cry. Old Tasio told us that a fine supper is waiting for us. A fine supper? And I haven't eaten for a long time. They won't give me anything to eat until the two gold pieces appear. But if mother believes it? You must tell her that the senior sacristan is a liar, but that the curate believes him and that all of them are liars, that they say that we're thieves because our father is a vagabond who... At that instant a head appeared at the top of the stairway leading down to the floor below, and that head, like Medusa's, froze the words on the child's lips. It was a long, narrow head, covered with black hair, with blue glasses concealing the fact that one eye was sightless. The senior sacristan was accustomed to appear thus, without noise or warning of any kind. The two brothers turned cold with fear. "'On you, Basilio, I impose a fine of two reals for not ringing the bells in time,' he said in a voice so hollow that his throat seemed to lack vocal cords. You, Crispin, must stay tonight until what you stole reappears. Crispin looked at his brother as if pleading for protection. But we already have permission. Mother expects us at eight o'clock, objected Basilio timidly. Neither shall you go home at eight. You'll stay until ten. But, sir, after nine o'clock no one is allowed to be out and... Our house is far from here. Are you trying to give me orders? growled the man irritably as he caught Crispin by the arm and started to drag him away. Oh, sir, it's been a week now since we've seen our mother, begged Basilio, catching hold of his brother as if to defend him. The senior sacristan struck his hand away and jerked at Crispin, who began to weep as he fell to the floor, crying out to his brother, don't leave me. They're going to kill me. The sacristan gave no heed to this and dragged him onto the stairway. As they disappeared among the shadows below, Basilio stood speechless, listening to the sounds of his brother's body striking against the steps. Then followed the sound of a blow and heart-rending cries that died away in the distance. The boy stood on tiptoe, hardly breathing and listening fixedly, with his eyes unnaturally wide and his fists clenched. "'When shall I be strong enough to plough a field?' he muttered between his teeth as he started below hastily. Upon reaching the organ-loft he paused to listen. The voice of his brother was fast dying away in the distance, and the cries of, "'Mother! Brother!' were at last completely cut off by the sound of a closing door. Trembling and perspiring, he paused for a moment with his fist in his mouth to keep down a cry of anguish. He let his gaze wander about the dimly lighted church where an oil lamp gave a ghostly light, revealing the catafalque in the centre. The doors were closed and fastened, and the windows had iron bars on them. Suddenly he reascended the stairway to the place where the candle was burning, and then climbed up into the third floor of the belfry. After untying the ropes from the bell clappers, he again descended. He was pale, and his eyes glistened, but not with tears. Meanwhile the rain was gradually ceasing and the sky was clearing. Basilio knotted the ropes together, tied one end to a rail of the balustrade, and without even remembering to put out the light, let himself down into the darkness outside. A few moments later, voices were heard on one of the streets of the town. Two shots resounded, but no one seemed to be alarmed, and silence again reigned. End of chapter 15Chapter 16 of The Social Cancer, a complete English version of No Lime Tangere from the Spanish of José Rizal by Charles Darbyshire. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.
Recording by Avai in December 2011. Chapter 16. Sisa. Through the dark night the villagers slept. The families who had remembered their dead gave themselves up to quiet and satisfied sleep, for they had recited their requiems, the novena of the souls, and had burned many wax tapers before the sacred images. The rich and powerful had discharged the duties their positions imposed upon them. On the following day they would hear three masses said by each priest and would give two pesos for another, besides buying a bull of indulgences for the dead. Truly, divine justice is not nearly so exacting as human. But the poor and indignant, who earn scarcely enough to keep themselves alive, and who also have to pay tribute to the petty officials, clerks and soldiers, that they may be allowed to live in peace, sleep not so tranquilly as gentle poets who have perhaps not felt the pinches of want would have us believe. The poor are sad and thoughtful, for on that night, if they have not recited many prayers, yet they have prayed much, with pain in their eyes and tears in their hearts. They have not the novenas, nor do they know the responsories, versicles and prayers which the friars have composed for those who lack original ideas and feelings, nor do they understand them. They pray in the language of their misery, their souls weep for them and for those dead beings whose love was their wealth. Their lips may proffer the salutations, but their minds cry out complaints charged with lamentations. Wilt thou be satisfied, O thou who blessedst poverty, and you, O suffering souls, with the simple prayers of the poor, offered before a rude picture in the light of a dim wick? Or do you perhaps desire wax tapers before bleeding Christs and virgins with small mouths and crystal eyes, and masses in Latin recited mechanically by priests? And thou, religion preached for suffering humanity, hast thou forgotten thy mission of consoling the oppressed in their misery and of humiliating the powerful in their pride? Hast thou now promises only for the rich, for those who can pay thee? The poor widow watches among the children who sleep at her side. She is thinking of the indulgences that she ought to buy for the repose of the souls of her parents and of her dead husband. A peso, she says, a peso is a week of happiness for my children, a week of laughter and joy, my savings for a month, a dress for my daughter who is becoming a woman. But it is necessary that you put aside these worldly desires, says the voice that she heard in the pulpit. It is necessary that you make sacrifices. Yes, it is necessary. The church does not gratuitously save the beloved souls for you, nor does it distribute indulgences without payment. You must buy them, so tonight instead of sleeping you should work. Think of your daughter so poorly clothed. Fast, for heaven is dear. Decidedly, it seems that the poor enter not into heaven. Such thoughts wander through the space enclosed between the rough mats spread out on the bamboo floor and the ridge of the roof from which hangs the hammock wherein the baby swings. The infant's breathing is easy and peaceful, but from time to time he swallows and smacks his lips. His hungry stomach, which is not satisfied with what his older brothers have given him, dreams of eating. The cicadas chant monotonously, mingling their ceaseless notes with the trills of the cricket hidden in the grass, or the chirp of the little lizard which has come out in search of food, while the big gecko, no longer fearing the water, disturbs the concert with its ill-omened voice as it shows its head from out the hollow of the decayed tree trunk. The dogs howl mournfully in the streets, and superstitious folk, hearing them, are convinced that they see spirits and ghosts. But neither the dogs nor the other animals see the sorrows of men, yet how many of these exist? Distant from the town an hour's walk lives the mother of Basilio and Crispin. 
the wife of a heartless man she struggles to live for her sons while her husband is a vagrant gamester with whom her interviews are rare but always painful he has gradually stripped her of her few jewels to pay the cost of his vices and when the suffering caesar no longer had anything that he might take to satisfy his whims he had begun to maltreat her weak in character with more heart than intellect she knew only how to love and to weep her husband was a god and her sons were his angels so he knowing to what point he was loved and feared conducted himself like all false gods daily he became more cruel more inhuman more wilful once when he had appeared with his countenance gloomier than ever before Caesar had consulted him about the plan of making a sacristan of Basilio, and he had merely continued to stroke his game-cock, saying neither yes nor no, only asking whether the boy would earn much money. She had not dared to insist, but her needy situation and her desire that the boys should learn to read and write in the town school forced her to carry out the plan. Still, her husband had said nothing. That night, between ten and eleven o'clock, when the stars were glittering in a sky now cleared of all signs of the storm of the early evening, Caesar sat on a wooden bench watching some faggots that smouldered upon the fireplace, fashioned of rough pieces of natural rock. Upon a tripod, or tunko, was a small pot of boiling rice, and upon the red coals lay three little dried fishes, such as are sold at three for two cuartos. Her chin rested in the palm of her hand, while she gazed at the weak yellow glow peculiar to the cane, which burns rapidly and leaves embers that quickly grow pale. A sad smile lighted up her face as she recalled a funny riddle about the pot and the fire, which Crispin had once propounded to her. The boy said, The black man sat down, and the red man looked at him. A moment passed, and cock a doodle doo rang forth. Sisa was still young, and it was plain that at one time she had been pretty and attractive. Her eyes, which, like her disposition, she had given to her sons, were beautiful, with long lashes and a deep look. Her nose was regular, and her pale lips curved pleasantly. She was what the Tagalogs call Kayumanging, Kaligatan, that is, her color was a clear, pure brown. In spite of her youthfulness, pain and perhaps even hunger had begun to make hollow her pallid cheeks, and if her abundant hair, in other times the delight and adornment of her person, was even yet simply and neatly arranged, though without pins or combs, it was not from coquetry, but from habit. Sisa had been for several days confined to the house, suing upon some work which had been ordered for the earliest possible time. In order to earn the money, she had not attended Mass that morning, as it would have taken two hours at least to go to the town and return. Poverty obliges one to sin. She had finished the work and delivered it, but had received only a promise of payment. All that day she had been anticipating the pleasures of the evening, for she knew that her sons were coming, and she had intended to make them some presents. She had bought some small fishes, picked the most beautiful tomatoes in her little garden, as she knew that Crispin was very fond of them, and begged from a neighbor, old Tassio the sage, who lived half a mile away, some slices of dried wild boar's meat and a leg of wild duck, which Basilio especially liked. Full of hope, she had cooked the whitest of rice, which she herself had gleaned from the threshing floors. It was indeed a curate's meal for the poor boys. But by an unfortunate chance her husband came and ate the rice, the slices of wild boar's meat, the duck leg, five of the little fishes, and the tomatoes. Caesar said nothing, although she felt as if she herself were being eaten. His hunger at length appeased, he remembered to ask for the boys. Then Caesar smiled happily and resolved that she would not eat that night, because what remained was not enough for three. The father had asked for their sons, and that, for her, was better than eating. Soon he picked up his game-cock and started away. 
Don't you want to see them? she asked tremulously. Old Tasio told me that they would be a little late. Crispin now knows how to read, and perhaps Basilio will bring his wages. The last reason caused the husband to pause and waver, but his good angel triumphed. In that case, keep a peso for me, he said as he went away. Sisa wept bitterly, but the thought of her sons soon dried her tears. She cooked some more rice and prepared the only three fishes that were left. Each would have one and a half. They'll have good appetites, she mused. The way is long and hungry stomachs have no heart. So she sat, the ear strained to catch every sound, listening to the lightest footfalls, strong and clear, Basilio, light and irregular, Crispin. Thus she mused. The Calao called in the woods several times after the rain had ceased, but still her sons did not come. She put the fishes inside the pot to keep them warm, and went to the threshold of the hut to look toward the road. To keep herself company, she began to sing in a low voice, a voice usually so sweet and tender that when her sons listened to her singing the Kundiman, they wept without knowing why but to-night it trembled and the notes were halting. She stopped singing and gazed earnestly into the darkness, but no one was coming from the town. That noise was only the wind shaking the raindrops from the white banana leaves. Suddenly a black dog appeared before her, dragging something along the path. Caesar was frightened, but caught up a stone and threw it at the dog, which ran away howling mournfully. She was not superstitious, but she had heard so much about presentiments and black dogs that terror seized her. She shut the door hastily and sat down by the light. Night favors credulity, and the imagination peoples the air with spectres. She tried to pray, to call upon the Virgin and upon God to watch over her sons, especially her little Crispin. Then she forgot her prayers, and her thoughts wandered to think about them, to recall the features of each, those features that always wore a smile for her, both asleep and awake. Suddenly she felt her hair rise on her head, and her eyes stared wildly. Illusion or reality, she saw Crispin standing by the fireplace, there where he was wont to sit and prattle to her, but now he said nothing as he gazed at her with those large, thoughtful eyes, and smiled. "'Mother, open the door! Open, mother!' cried the voice of Basilio from without. Caesar shuddered violently, and the vision disappeared. End of chapter 16「Chapter 17 of The Social Cancer – a complete English version of Noli Me Tangere from the Spanish of José Rizal by Charles Darbyshire. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avaí in December 2011. Chapter 17. Basilio. La vida es sueño. Basilio was scarcely inside when he staggered and fell into his mother's arms. An inexplicable chill seized Sisa as she saw him enter alone. She wanted to speak, but could make no sound. She wanted to embrace her son, but lacked the strength. To weep was impossible. At sight of the blood which covered the boy's forehead, she cried in a tone that seemed to come from a breaking heart, "'My sons!' "'Don't be afraid, mother,' Basilio reassured her. "'Crispin stayed at the convento.' At the convento? He stayed at the convento? Is he alive? The boy raised his eyes to her. Ah, she sighed, passing from the depths of sorrow to the heights of joy. She wept and embraced her son, covering his bloody forehead with kisses. Crispin is alive. You left him at the convento. But why are you wounded, my son? Have you had a fall? she inquired as she examined him anxiously. 
the senior sacristan took crispin away and told me that i could not leave until ten o'clock but it was already late and so i ran away in the town the soldiers challenged me i started to run they fired and a bullet grazed my forehead i was afraid they would arrest me and beat me and make me scrub out the barracks as they did with pablo who is still sick from it my god my god murmured his mother shuddering thou hast saved him then while she sought for bandages water vinegar and a feather she went on a finger's breadth more and they would have killed you they would have killed my boy the civil guards do not think of the mothers you must say that i fell from a tree so that no one will know they chased me basilio cautioned her why did crispin stay asked sisa after dressing her son's wound basilio hesitated a few moments then with his arms about her and their tears mingling he related little by little the story of the gold pieces without speaking however of the tortures they were inflicting upon his young brother my good crispin to accuse my good crispin it's because we're poor and we poor people have to endure everything murmured sisa staring through her tears at the light of the lamp which was now dying out from lack of oil so they remained silent for a while haven't you had any supper yet here are rice and fish i don't want anything only a little water yes answered his mother sadly i know that you don't like dried fish i had prepared something else but your father came father came asked basilio instinctively examining the face and hands of his mother the son's questioning gaze pained sisa's heart for she understood it only too well so she added hastily he came and asked a lot about you and wanted to see you and he was very hungry he said that if you continued to be so good he would come back to stay with us an exclamation of disgust from basilio's contracted lips interrupted her son she reproached him forgive me mother he answered seriously but aren't we three better off you crispin and i you are crying i haven't said anything caesar sighed and asked aren't you going to eat then let's go to sleep for it's now very late she then closed up the hut and covered the few coals with ashes so that the fire would not die out entirely just as a man does with his inner feelings he covers them with the ashes of his life which he calls indifference so that they may not be deadened by daily contact with his fellows basilio murmured his prayers and lay down near his mother who was upon her knees praying he felt hot and cold he tried to close his eyes as he thought of his little brother who that night had expected to sleep in his mother's lap and who now was probably trembling with terror and weeping in some dark corner of the convento his ears were again pierced with those cries he had heard in the church tower but wearied nature soon began to confuse his ideas and the veil of sleep descended upon his eyes he saw a bedroom where two dim tapers burned the curate with a rattan whip in his hand was listening gloomily to something that the senior sacristan was telling him in a strange tongue with horrible gestures crispin quailed and turned his tearful eyes in every direction as if seeking someone or some hiding place the curate turned toward him and called to him irritably the rattan whistled the child ran to hide himself behind the sacristan who caught and held him thus exposing him to the curate's fury the unfortunate boy fought kicked screamed threw himself on the floor and rolled about he picked himself up ran slipped fell and parried the blows with his hands which wounded he hid quickly all the time shrieking with pain basilio saw him twist himself strike the floor with his head he saw and heard the rattan whistle in desperation his little brother rose 
Mad with pain, he threw himself upon his tormentor and bit him on the hand. The curate gave a cry and dropped the rattan. The sacristan caught up a heavy cane and struck the boy a blow on the head so that he fell stunned. The curate, seeing him down, trampled him with his feet. But the child no longer defended himself, nor did he cry out. He rolled along the floor, a lifeless mass that left a damp track. Caesar's voice brought him back to reality. "'What's the matter? Why are you crying?' "'I dreamed. Oh, God!' exclaimed Basilio, sitting up, covered with perspiration. "'It was a dream. Tell me, mother, that it was only a dream, only a dream.' "'What did you dream?' The boy did not answer, but sat drying his tears and wiping away the perspiration. The hut was in total darkness. "'A dream, a dream,' repeated Basilio in subdued tones. "'Tell me what you dreamed. I can't sleep,' said his mother when he lay down again. "'Well,' he said in a low voice, "'I dreamed that we had gone to glean the rice stalks in a field where there were many flowers,' The women had baskets full of rice stalks, the men too had baskets full of rice stalks, and the children too. I don't remember any more, mother, I don't remember the rest. Caesar had no faith in dreams, so she did not insist. Mother, I've thought of a plan tonight, said Basilio after a few moments' silence. What is your plan? she asked. Caesar was humble in everything, even with her own sons, trusting their judgment more than her own. I don't want to be a sacristan any longer. What? Listen, mother, to what I've been thinking about. Today there arrived from Spain the son of the dead Don Rafael, and he will be a good man like his father. Well, now, mother... Tomorrow you will get Crispin, collect my wages, and say that I will not be a sacristan any longer. As soon as I get well, I'll go to see Don Crisostomo and ask him to hire me as a herdsman of his cattle and carabaos. I am now big enough. Crispin can study with old Tasio, who does not whip and who is a good man, even if the curate does not believe so. What have we to fear now from the padre? Can he make us any poorer than we are? You may believe it, mother, the old man is good. I have seen him often in the church when no one else was about, kneeling and praying, believe it. So, mother, I'll stop being a sacristan. I earn but little, and that little is taken away from me in fines. Everyone complains of the same thing. I'll be a herdsman, and by performing my tasks carefully, I'll make my employer like me. Perhaps he'll let us milk a cow so we can drink milk. Crispin likes milk so much. Who can tell? Maybe they'll give us a little calf if they see that I behave well and will take care of it and fatten it like our hen. I'll pick fruits in the woods and sell them in the town along with the vegetables from our garden so we'll have money. I'll set snares and traps to catch birds and wild cats. I'll fish in the river, and when I'm bigger, I'll hunt. I'll be able also to cut firewood to sell or to present to the owner of the cows, and so he'll be satisfied with us. When I'm able to plough, I'll ask him to let me have a piece of land to plant in sugarcane or corn, and you won't have to sue until midnight. We'll have new clothes for every fiesta, we'll eat meat and big fish, we'll live free, seeing each other every day and eating together. Old Tassio says that Crispin has a good head, and so we'll send him to Manila to study. I'll support him by working hard. Isn't that fine, mother? Perhaps he'll be a doctor. What do you say? What can I say but yes, said Sisa as she embraced her son. She noticed, however, that in their future the boy took no account of his father and shed silent tears. Basilio went on talking of his plans with the confidence of the years that see only what they wish for. 
To everything, Sisa said yes. Everything appeared good. Sleep again began to weigh down upon the tired eyelids of the boy, and this time Ole Luc Oye, of whom Andersen tells us, spread over him his beautiful umbrella with its pleasing pictures. Now he saw himself with his little brother as they picked guavas, alpai, and other fruits in the woods. They clambered from branch to branch, light as butterflies. They penetrated into the caves and saw the shining rocks. They bathed in the springs where the sand was gold dust and the stones like the jewels in the virgin's crown. The little fishes sang and laughed. The plants bent their branches toward them, laden with golden fruit. Then he saw a bell hanging in a tree, with a long rope for ringing it. To the rope was tied a cow with a bird's nest between her horns, and Crispin was inside the bell. Thus he went on dreaming, while his mother, who was not of his age and who had not run for an hour, slept not. End of chapter 17「Chapter 18 of The Social Cancer, a complete English version of Noli me tangere from the Spanish of José Rizal by Charles Darbyshire. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avaí in December 2011. Chapter 18. Souls in Torment It was about seven o'clock in the morning when Fray Salvi finished celebrating his last Mass, having offered up three in the space of an hour. "'The padre is ill,' commented the pious women. "'He doesn't move about with his usual slowness and elegance of manner.' He took off his vestments without the least comment, without saying a word or looking at any one. Attention, whispered the sacristans among themselves. The devil's to pay. It's going to rain fines and all on account of those two brothers. He left the sacristy to go up into the rectory, in the hallway of which there awaited him some seven or eight women seated upon benches and a man who was pacing back and forth. Upon seeing him approach, the women arose, and one of them pressed forward to kiss his hand, but the holy man made a sign of impatience that stopped her short. "'Can it be that you've lost the real, Curipot?' exclaimed the woman with a jesting laugh, offended at such a reception. "'Not to give his hand to me, matron of the sisterhood, Sister Rufa!' It was an unheard-of proceeding." He didn't go into the confessional this morning, added Sister Sipa, a toothless old woman. I wanted to confess myself so as to receive communion and get the indulgences. Well, I'm sorry for you, commented a young woman with a frank face. This week I earned three plenary indulgences and dedicated them to the soul of my husband. Badly done, Sister Juana, said the offended Rufa. One plenary indulgence was enough to get him out of purgatory. You ought not to squander the holy indulgences. Do as I do. I thought so many more the better, answered the simple sister Juana, smiling. But tell me what you do. Sister Rufa did not answer at once. First she asked for a buyo and chewed at it, gazed at her audience, which was listening attentively, then spat to one side and commenced chewing at the buyo meanwhile. I don't misspend one holy day. Since I've belonged to the sisterhood, I've earned 457 plenary indulgences, 760,598 years of indulgence. I set down all that I earn, for I like to have clean accounts. I don't want to cheat or be cheated. Here Sister Rufa paused to give more attention to her chewing. The women gazed at her in admiration, but the man who was pacing back and forth remarked with some disdain, "'Well, this year I've gained four plenary indulgences more than you have, Sister Rufa, and a hundred years more, and that without praying much either.' "'More than I? More than six hundred and eighty-nine plenary indulgences on nine hundred ninety-four thousand eight hundred and fifty-six years?' queried the Rufa, somewhat disgruntled. That's it, 
eight indulgences and a hundred fifteen years more and a few months over answered the man from whose neck hung soiled scapularies and rosaries that's not strange admitted rufa at last admitting defeat you're an expert the best in the province the flattered man smiled and continued it isn't so wonderful that i earn more than you do why i can almost say that even when sleeping i earn indulgences and what do you do with them sir asked four or five voices at the same time pish answered the man with a gesture of proud disdain i have them to throw away but in that i can't command you sir protested the rufa you'll go to purgatory for wasting the indulgences you know very well that for every idle word one must suffer forty days in fire according to the curate for every span of thread uselessly wasted sixty days and for every drop of water spilled twenty you'll go to purgatory well i'll know how to get out answered brother pedro with sublime confidence how many souls have i saved from the flames how many saints have i made besides even in articulo mortis i can still earn if i wish at least seven plenary indulgences and shall be able to save others as i die so saying he strode proudly away sister rufa turned to the others nevertheless you must do as i do for i don't lose a single day and keep my accounts well i don't want to cheat or be cheated well what do you do asked juana you must imitate what i do for example suppose i earn a year of indulgence i set it down in my account book and say most blessed father and lord saint dominic please see if there is anybody in purgatory who needs exactly a year neither a day more nor a day less then i play heads and tails if it comes heads no if tails yes let's suppose that it comes tails then i write down paid if it comes heads then i keep the indulgence in this way i arrange groups of a hundred years each of which i keep a careful account it's a pity that we can't do with them as with money put them out at interest for in that way we should be able to save more souls believe me and do as i do well i do it a better way remarked sister sipa what better demanded the astonished rufa that can't be my system can't be improved upon listen a moment and you'll be convinced sister said old sipa in a tone of vexation how is it let's hear exclaimed the other after coughing ceremoniously the old woman began with great care you know very well that by saying the bendita sea tu purezza and the senor mio jesu cristo padre dulcissimo por el gozo ten years are gained for each letter twenty no less five interrupted several voices a few years more or less make no difference now when a servant breaks a plate a glass or a cup i make him pick up the pieces and for every scrap even the very smallest he has to recite for me one of those prayers the indulgences that i earn in this way i devote to the souls every one in my house except the cats understands the systems but those indulgences are earned by the servants and not by you sister sipa objected the rufa and my cups and plates who pays for them the servants are glad to pay for them in that way and it suits me also i never resort to blows only sometimes a pinch or a whack on the head i'm going to do as you do i'll do the same and i exclaimed the women but suppose the plate is only broken into two or three pieces then you earn very few observed the obstinate rufa abba answered the old sipa i make them recite the prayers anyhow then i glue the pieces together again and so lose nothing sister rufa had no more objections left allow me to ask about a doubt of mine said young juana timidly you ladies understand so well these matters of heaven purgatory and hell 
Well, I confess that I am ignorant. Often I find in the novenas and other books this direction, three paternosters, three Ave Marias, and three Gloria Patris. Yes, well? Now, I want to know how they should be recited, whether three paternosters in succession, three Ave Marias in succession, and three Gloria Patris in succession, or a paternoster, an Ave Maria, and a Gloria Patri together three times. This way, a paternoster three times. Pardon me, Sister Sipa, interrupted Rufa. They must be recited in the other way. You mustn't mix up males and females. The paternosters are males, the Ave Marias are females, and the Gloria Patris are the children. Eh? Excuse me, Sister Rufa, Pater Nostra, Ave Maria, and Gloria are like rice, meat, and sauce, a mouthful for the saints. You're wrong. You'll see, for you who pray that way will never get what you ask for. And you who pray the other way won't get anything from your novenas, replied old Sipa. Who won't? asked the Rufa, rising. A short time ago I lost a little pig. I prayed to St. Anthony and found it, and then I sold it for a good price. Abba! Yes? Then that's why one of your neighbors was saying that you sold a pig of hers. Who? The shameless one! Perhaps I'm like you! Here the expert had to interfere to restore peace, for no one was thinking any more about paternosters. The talk was all about pigs. Come, come, there mustn't be any quarrel over a pig, sisters. The holy scriptures give us an example to follow. The heretics and protestants didn't quarrel with our Lord for driving into the water a herd of swine that belonged to them, and we that are Christians, and besides brethren of the holy rosary, shall we have hard words on account of a little pig? What would our rivals, the tertiary brethren, say? all became silent before such wisdom, at the same time fearing what the tertiary brethren might say. The expert, well satisfied with such acquiescence, changed his tone and continued. Soon the curate will send for us. We must tell him which preacher we've chosen of the three that he suggested yesterday, whether Padre Damaso, Padre Martin, or the coadjutor. I don't know whether the tertiary brethren have yet made any choice, so we must decide. The coadjutor, murmured Juana timidly. <laughs> the coadjutor doesn't know how to preach, declared Sipa. Padre Martin is better. Padre Martin, exclaimed another disdainfully. He hasn't any voice. Padre Damaso would be better. That's right, cried Rufa. Padre Damaso surely does know how to preach. He looks like a comedian. But we don't understand him, murmured Juana, because he's very deep, and as he preaches well... This speech was interrupted by the arrival of Sisa, who was carrying a basket on her head. She saluted the sisters and went on up the staircase. She's going in. Let's go in too, they exclaimed. Sisa felt her heart beating violently as she ascended the stairs. She did not know just what to say to the padre to placate his wrath or what reasons she should advance in defense of her son. That morning at the first flush of dawn she had gone into her garden to pick the choicest vegetables, which she placed in a basket among banana leaves and flowers. Then she had looked along the bank of the river for the pako, which she knew the curate liked for salads. Putting on her best clothes and without awakening her son, she had set out for the town with the basket on her head. As she went up the stairway, she tried to make as little noise as possible and listened attentively in the hope that she might hear a fresh childish voice so well known to her. But she heard nothing, nor did she meet anyone as she made her way to the kitchen. There she looked into all the corners. The servants and sacristans received her coldly, scarcely acknowledging her greeting. "'Where can I put these vegetables?' she asked, not taking any offence at their coldness. "'There, anywhere,' growled the cook, hardly looking at her as he busied himself in picking the feathers from a capon. 
With great care, Caesar arranged the vegetables and the salad leaves on the table, placing the flowers above them. Smiling, she then addressed one of the servants, who seemed to be more approachable than the cook. "'May I speak with the padre?' "'He's sick,' was the whispered answer. "'And Crispin? Do you know if he is in the sacristy?' The servant looked surprised and wrinkled his eyebrows. "'Crispin, isn't he at your house? Do you mean to deny it?' "'Basilio is at home, but Crispin stayed here.' answered Sisa, and I want to see him. Yes, he stayed, but afterwards he ran away, after stealing a lot of things. Early this morning the curate ordered me to go and report it to the civil guard. They must have gone to your house already to hunt for the boys. Sisa covered her ears and opened her mouth to speak, but her lips moved without giving out any sound. A pretty pair of sons you have, exclaimed the cook. It's plain that you're a faithful wife. The son are so like the father. Take care that the younger doesn't surpass him. Sisa broke out into bitter weeping and let herself fall upon a bench. Don't cry here, yelled the cook. Don't you know that the padre is sick? Get out in the street and cry. The unfortunate mother was almost shoved down the stairway at the very time when the sisters were coming down, complaining and making conjectures about the curate's illness, so she hid her face in her panuelo and suppressed the sounds of her grief. Upon reaching the street she looked about uncertainly for a moment, and then, as if having reached a decision, walked rapidly away. End of chapter 18 Chapter 19 of The Social Cancer, a complete English version of Noli Me Tangere from the Spanish of José Rizal by Charles Darbyshire. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avaí in December 2011. Chapter 19. A Schoolmaster's Difficulties. El vulgo es necio y pues lo paga es justo. Hablarle en necio para darle el gusto. Lope de Vega The mountain-encircled lake slept peacefully with that hypocrisy of the elements which gave no hint of how its waters had the night before responded to the fury of the storm. As the first reflections of light awoke on its surface the phosphorescent spirits, there were outlined in the distance, almost on the horizon, the grey silhouettes of the little bankas of the fishermen, who were taking in their nets, and of the larger craft spreading their sails. Two men dressed in deep mourning stood gazing at the water from a little elevation. One was Ibarra, and the other a youth of humble aspect and melancholy features. This is the place, the letter was saying. From here your father's body was thrown into the water. Here's where the grave digger brought Lieutenant Guevara and me. Ibarra warmly grasped the hand of the young man who went on. You have no occasion to thank me. I owed many favors to your father, and the only thing that I could do for him was to accompany his body to the grave. I came here without knowing anyone, without recommendation and having neither name nor fortune, just as present. My predecessor had abandoned the school to engage in the tobacco trade. Your father protected me, secured me a house, and furnished whatever was necessary for running the school. He used to visit the classes and distribute pictures among the poor but studious children, as well as provide them with books and paper. But this, like all good things, lasted only a little while. Ibarra took off his hat and seemed to be praying for a time. Then he turned to his companion. Did you say that my father helped the poor children? And how? Now they get along as well as possible and write when they can, answered the youth. What is the reason? The reason lies in their torn camisas and their downcast eyes. How many pupils have you now? asked Ibarra with interest after a pause. More than two hundred on the roll, but only about twenty-five in actual attendance. How does that happen? 
The schoolmaster smiled sadly as he answered. To tell you the reasons would make a long and tiresome story. Don't attribute my question to idle curiosity, replied Ibarra gravely, while he stared at the distant horizon. I've thought better of it, and believe that to carry out my father's ideas will be more fitting than to weep for him, and far better than to revenge him. Sacred nature has become his grave, and his enemies were the people and a priest. The former I pardon on account of their ignorance, and the latter because I wish that religion, which elevated society, should be respected. I wish to be inspired with the spirit of him who gave me life, and therefore desire to know about the obstacles encountered here in educational work. The country will bless your memory, sir, said the schoolmaster, if you carry out the beautiful plans of your dead father. Do you wish to know the obstacles which the progress of education meets? Well, then, under present circumstances, without substantial aid, education will never amount to much, in the very first place because, even when we have the pupils, lack of suitable means and other things that attract them more kill off their interest. It is said that in Germany a peasant's son studies for eight years in the town school, but who here would spend half that time when such poor results are to be obtained? They read, write, and memorize selections, and sometimes whole books, in Spanish, without understanding a single word. What benefit does our country child get from the school? And why have you, who see the evil, not thought of remedying it? The schoolmaster shook his head sadly. A poor teacher struggles not only against prejudices, but also against certain influences. First, it would be necessary to have a suitable place, and not to do as I must at present, hold the classes under the convento by the side of the padre's carriage. There the children, who like to read aloud, very naturally disturb the padre, and he often comes down, nervous, especially when he has his attacks, yells at them, and even insults me at times. You know that no one can either teach or learn under such circumstances, for the child will not respect his teacher when he sees him abused without standing up for his rights. In order to be heeded and to maintain his authority, the teacher needs prestige, reputation, moral strength, and some freedom of action. Now let me recount to you even sadder details. I have wished to introduce reforms and have been laughed at. In order to remedy the evil of which I just spoke to you, I try to teach Spanish to the children because, in addition to the fact that the government so orders, I thought also that it would be of advantage for everybody. I use the simplest methods of words and phrases without paying any attention to long rules, expecting to teach them grammar when they should understand the language. At the end of a few weeks, some of the brightest were almost able to understand me and could use a few phrases. The schoolmaster paused and seemed to hesitate. Then, as if making a resolution, he went on, I must not be ashamed of the story of my wrongs, for anyone in my place would have acted the same as I did. As I said, it was a good beginning, but a few days afterwards Padre Damaso, who was the curate then, sent for me by the senior sacristan. Knowing his disposition and fearing to make him wait, I went upstairs at once, saluted him, and wished him good morning in Spanish. His only greeting had been to put out his hand for me to kiss, but at this he drew it back, and without answering me began to laugh loud and mockingly. I was very much embarrassed as the senior sacristan was present. At the moment I didn't know just what to say, for the curate continued his laughter, and I stood staring at him. Then I began to get impatient, and saw that I was about to do something indiscreet, since to be a good Christian and to preserve one's dignity are not incompatible. I was going to put a question to him when suddenly, passing from ridicule to insult, he said sarcastically, "'So it's buenos dins, eh? Buenos dias!' How nice that you know how to talk Spanish. Then again he broke out into laughter. Ibarra was unable to repress a smile. You smile, continued the schoolmaster following Ibarra's example, but I must confess that at the time I had very little desire to laugh. 
I was still standing. I felt the blood rush to my head, and lightning seemed to flash through my brain. The curate I saw far, far away. I advanced to apply to him without knowing just what I was going to say, but the senior sacristan put himself between us. Padre Damaso arose and said to me in Tagalog, Don't try to shine in borrowed finery. Be content to talk your own dialect and don't spoil Spanish, which isn't meant for you. Do you know the teacher Ciruela? Well, Ciruela was a teacher who didn't know how to read, and he had a school. I wanted to detain him, but he went into his bedroom and slammed the door. What was I to do with only my meager salary, to collect which I have to get the curate's approval and make a trip to the capital of the province? What could I do against him, the foremost religious and political power in the town, backed up by his order, feared by the government, rich, powerful, sought after and listened to, always believed and heeded by everybody? Although he insulted me, I had to remain silent, for if I replied, he would have had me removed from my position, by which I should lose all hope in my chosen profession. Nor would the cause of education gain anything but the opposite, for everybody would take the curate's side. They would curse me and call me presumptuous, proud, vain, a bad Christian, uncultured, and if not those things, then anti-Spanish and a filibuster. Of a schoolmaster, neither learning nor zeal is expected. Resignation, humility, and inaction only are asked. May God pardon me if I have gone against my conscience and my judgment. But I was born in this country. I have to live. I have a mother. So I have abandoned myself to my fate like a corpse tossed about by the waves. Did this difficulty discourage you for all time? Have you lived so since? Would that it had been a warning to me, if only my troubles had been limited to that. It is true that from that time I began to dislike my profession and thought of seeking some other occupation, as my predecessor had done, because any work that is done in disgust and shame is a kind of martyrdom, and because every day the school recalled the insult to my mind, causing me hours of great bitterness. But what was I to do? I could not undeceive my mother. I had to say to her that her three years of sacrifice to give me this profession now constituted my happiness. It is necessary to make her believe that this profession is most honourable, the work delightful, the way strewn with flowers, that the performance of my duties brings me only friendship, that the people respect me and show me every consideration. By doing otherwise, without ceasing to be unhappy myself, I should have caused more sorrow, which, besides being useless, would also be a sin. I stayed on, therefore, and tried not to feel discouraged. I tried to struggle on. Here he paused for a while, then resumed. From that day on which I was so grossly insulted, I began to examine myself, and I found that I was in fact very ignorant. I applied myself day and night to the study of Spanish and whatever concerned my profession. The old sage lent me some books, and I read and pondered over everything that I could get hold of. With the new ideas that I have been acquiring in one place and another, my point of view has changed and I have seen many things under a different aspect from what they had appeared to me before. I saw error where before I had seen only truth and truth in many things where I had formerly seen only error. Corporal punishment, for example, which from time immemorial has been the distinctive feature in the schools, and which has heretofore been considered as the only efficacious means of making pupils learn, so we have been accustomed to believe, soon appeared to me to be a great hindrance rather than in any way an aid to the child's progress. I became convinced that it was impossible to use one's mind properly when blows or similar punishment were in prospect. Fear and terror disturbed the most serene, and a child's imagination, besides being very lively, is also very impressionable. As it is on the brain that ideas are impressed, it is necessary that there be both inner and outer calm, that there be serenity of spirit, physical and moral repose, and willingness 
so I thought that before everything else I should cultivate in the children confidence, assurance, and some personal pride. Moreover, I comprehended that the daily sight of floggings destroyed kindness in their hearts and deadened all sense of dignity, which is such a powerful lever in the world. At the same time it caused them to lose their sense of shame, which is a difficult thing to restore. I have also observed that when pupil is flogged he gets comfort from the fact that the others are treated in the same way, and that he smiles with satisfaction upon hearing the wails of the others. As for the person who does the flogging, while at first he may do it with repugnance, he soon becomes hardened to it and even takes delight in his gloomy task. The past filled me with horror, so I wanted to save the present by modifying the old system. I endeavoured to make study a thing of love and joy. I wished to make the primer not a black book bathed in the tears of childhood, but a friend who was going to reveal wonderful secrets, and of the schoolroom not a place of sorrows, but a scene of intellectual refreshment. So, little by little, I abolished corporal punishment, taking the instruments of it entirely away from the school and replacing them with emulation and personal pride. If one was careless about his lesson, I charged it to lack of desire and never to lack of capacity. I made them think that they were more capable than they really were, which urged them on to study just as any confidence leads to notable achievements. At first it seemed that the change of methods was impracticable, many ceased their studies, but I persisted and observed that little by little their minds were being elevated and that more children came, that they came with more regularity and that he who was praised in the presence of the others studied with double diligence on the next day. It soon became known throughout the town that I did not whip the children. The curate sent for me and fearing another scene I greeted him curtly in Tagalog. On this occasion he was very serious with me. He said that I was exposing the children to destruction, that I was wasting time, that I was not fulfilling my duties, that the father who spared the rod was spoiling the child, according to the Holy Ghost, that learning enters with blood, and so on. He quoted to me sayings of barbarous times just as if it were enough that a thing had been said by the ancients to make it indisputable according to which we ought to believe that there really existed those monsters which in past ages were imagined and sculptured in the palaces and temples. Finally, he charged me to be more careful and to return to the old system, otherwise he would make unfavorable report about me to the alcalde of the province. Nor was this the end of my troubles. A few days afterward, some of the parents of the children presented themselves under the convento, and I had to call to my aid all my patience and resignation. They began by reminding me of former times when teachers had character and taught as their grandfathers had. Those indeed were the times of the wise man, they declared. They whipped and straightened the bent tree. They were not boys but old men of experience, great-haired and severe. Don Catalino, king of them all and founder of this very school, used to administer no less than twenty-five blows, and as a result his pupils became wise men and priests. Ah, the old people were worth more than we ourselves. Yes, sir, more than we ourselves. Some did not content themselves with such indirect rudeness, but told me plainly that if I continued my system their children would learn nothing and that they would be obliged to take them from the school. It was useless to argue with them, for as a young man they thought me incapable of sound judgment. What would I not have given for some grey hairs? They cited the authority of the curate, of this one and that one, and even called attention to themselves, saying that if it had not been for the whippings they had received from their teachers, they would have never learned anything. Only a few persons showed any sympathy to sweeten for me the bitterness of such a disillusioning. In view of all this, I had to give up my system, which, after so much toil, was just beginning to produce results. In desperation, I carried the whips back to the school the next day and began the barbarous practice again. Serenity disappeared and sadness reigned in the faces of the children, who had just begun to care for me and who were my only kindred and friends. 
although I tried to spare the whippings and to administer them with all the moderation possible, yet the children felt the change keenly, they became discouraged and wept bitterly. It touched my heart, and even though in my own mind I was vexed with the stupid parents, still I was unable to take any spite out on those innocent victims of their parents' prejudices. Their tears burned me, my heart seemed bursting from my breast, and that day I left the school before closing time to go home and weep alone. Perhaps my sensitiveness may seem strange to you, but if you had been in my place you would understand it. Old Don Anastasio said to me, So the parents want floggings. Why not inflict them on themselves? As a result of it all I became sick. Ibarra was listening thoughtfully. Scarcely had I recovered when I returned to the school to find the number of my pupils reduced to a fifth. The better ones had run away upon the return to the old system, and of those who remained, mostly those who came to school to escape work at home, not one showed any joy, not one congratulated me on my recovery. It would have been the same to them whether I got well or not, or they might have preferred that I continue sick since my substitute, although he whipped them more, rarely went to the school. My other pupils, those whose parents had obliged them to attend school, had gone to other places. Their parents blamed me for having spoiled them and heaped reproaches on me for it. One, however, the son of a countrywoman who visited me during my illness, had not returned on account of having been made a sacristan, and the senior sacristan says that the sacristans must not attend school, they would be dismissed. Were you resigned in looking after your new pupils? asked Ibarra. What else could I do? was the queried reply. Nevertheless, during my illness many things had happened, among them a change of curates, so I took new hope and made another attempt to the end that the children should not lose all their time and should, in so far as possible, get some benefit from the floggings, that such things might at least have some good result for them. I pondered over the matter, as I wished that even if they could not love me, by getting something useful from me, they might remember me with less bitterness. You know that in nearly all the schools the books are in Spanish, with the exception of the catechism in Tagalog, which varies according to the religious order to which the curate belongs. These books are generally novenas, canticles, and the catechism of Padre Astete, from which they learn about as much piety as they would from the books of heretics. Seeing the impossibility of teaching the pupils in Spanish, or of translating so many books, I tried to substitute short passages from useful works in Tagalog, such as the Treatise on Manners by Hortensio y Felisa, some manuals of agriculture, and so forth. Sometimes I would myself translate simple works, such as Padre Baranera's History of the Philippines, which I then dictated to the children, with at times a few observations of my own, so that they might make notebooks. As I had no maps for teaching geography, I copied one of the province that I said at the capital, and with this and the tiles of the floor I gave them some idea of the country. This time it was the women who got excited. The men contented themselves with smiling, as they saw in it only one of my vagaries. The new curate sent for me, and while he did not reprimand me, Yet he said that I should first take care of religion, that before learning such things the children must pass an examination to show that they had memorized the mysteries, the canticles, and the catechism of Christian doctrine. So then, I am now working to the end that the children become changed into parrots, and know by heart so many things of which they do not understand a single word. Many of them now know the mysteries and the canticles, but I fear that my efforts will come to grief with the catechism of Padre Astete, since the greater part of the pupils do not distinguish between the questions and the answers, nor do they understand what either may mean. Thus we shall die, thus those unborn will do, while in Europe they will talk of progress. Let's not be so pessimistic, said Ibarra. The Teniente Mayor, the Teniente Mayor, has sent me an invitation to attend a meeting in the town hall. 
Who knows but that there you may find an answer to your questions? The schoolmaster shook his head in doubt as he answered. You'll see how the plan of which they talk to me meets the same fate as mine has. But yet, let us see. End of chapter 19 Chapter 20 of The Social Cancer, a complete English version of Noli Me Tangere from the Spanish of José Rizal by Charles Darbyshire. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avaí in December 2011. Chapter 20. The Meeting in the Town Hall. The hall was about 12 to 15 meters long by 8 to 10 wide. Its whitewashed walls were covered with drawings in charcoal, more or less ugly and obscene, with inscriptions to complete their meanings. Stacked neatly against a wall in one corner were to be seen about a dozen old flint locks among rusty swords and talibons, the armament of the cuadrilleros. At one end of the hall there hung, half hidden by soiled red curtains, a picture of His Majesty, the King of Spain. Underneath this picture, upon a wooden platform, an old chair spread out its broken arms. In front of the chair was a wooden table, spotted with ink stains, and whittled and carved with inscriptions and initials like the tables in the German taverns frequented by students. Benches and broken chairs completed the furniture. This is the hall of counsel, of judgment, and of torture, wherein are now gathered the officials of the town and its dependent villages. The faction of old men does not mix with that of the youths, for they are mutually hostile. They represent respectively the conservative and the liberal parties, save that their disputes assume in the towns an extreme character. The conduct of the gobernador Theo fills me with distrust, Don Filippo, the teniente mayor and leader of the liberal faction, was saying to his friends. It was a deep-laid scheme, this thing of putting off the discussion of expenses until the eleventh hour. Remember that we have scarcely eleven days left. And he has staved at the convento to hold a conference with the curate, who is sick, observed one of the youths. It doesn't matter, remarked another. We have everything prepared. Just so the plan of the old man doesn't receive a majority. I don't believe it will, interrupted Don Filippo, as I shall present the plan of the old man myself. What? What are you saying? asked his surprised hearers. I said that if I speak first, I shall present the plan of our rivals. But what about our plan? I shall leave it to you to present ours answered Don Filippo with a smile, turning toward a youthful cabeza de barangay. You will propose it after I have been defeated. We don't understand you, sir, said his hearers, staring at him with doubtful looks. Listen, continued the liberal leader in a low voice to several near him. This morning I met old Tasio, and the old man said to me, your rivals hate you more than they do your ideas. Do you wish that a thing shall not be done? Then propose it yourself, and though it were more useful than a mitre, it would be rejected. Once they have defeated you, have the least forward person in the whole gathering propose what you want, and your rivals, in order to humiliate you, will accept it. But keep quiet about it. But... So I will propose the plan of our rivals and exaggerate it to the point of making it ridiculous. Ah, here comes Signor Ibarra and the schoolmaster. These two young men saluted each of the groups without joining either. A few moments later the gobernadorcillo, the very same individual whom we saw yesterday carrying a bundle of candles, entered with a look of disgust on his face. Upon his entrance the murmurs ceased, Everyone sat down, and silence was gradually established, as he took his seats under the picture of the king, coughed four or five times, rubbed his hand over his face and head, rested his elbows on the table, then withdrew them, coughed once more, and then the whole thing over again. 
Gentlemen, he at last began in an unsteady voice, I have been so bold as to call you together here for this meeting. Ahem, <clears throat> ahem. We have to celebrate the fiesta of our patron saint, San Diego, on the twelfth of this month. Ahem. <clears throat> Today is the second. Ahem, <clears throat> ahem. At this point a slow, dry cough cut off his speech. A man of proud bearing, apparently about forty years of age, then arose from the bench of the elders. He was the rich Capitan Basilio, the direct contrast of Don Rafael, Ibarra's father. He was a man who maintained that after the death of St. Thomas Aquinas the world had made no more progress, and that since St. John Lateran had left it, humanity had been retrograding. "'Gentlemen, allow me to speak a few words about such an interesting matter,' he began. I speak first, even though there are others here present who have more right to do so than I have, but I speak first because in these matters it seems to me that by speaking first one does not take the first place, no more than that by speaking last does one become the least. Besides, the things that I have to say are of such importance that they should not be put off or last spoken of, and accordingly I wish to speak first in order to give them due weight." So you will allow me to speak first in this meeting, where I see so many notable persons, such as the present Senor Capitan, the former Capitan, my distinguished friend Don Valentin, a former Capitan, the friend of my infancy Don Julio, our celebrated captain of Cuadrilleros, Don Melchor, and many other personages, whom, for the sake of brevity, I must omit to enumerate, all of whom you see present here. I beg of you that I may be allowed a few words before any one else speaks. Have I the good fortune to see my humble request granted by the meeting? Here the orator with a faint smile inclined his head respectfully. Go on, you have our undivided attention, said the notables alluded to, and some others who considered Capitan Basilio a great orator. The elders coughed in a satisfied way and rubbed their hands. After wiping the perspiration from his brow with a silk handkerchief, he then proceeded. Now that you have been so kind and complacent with my humble self as to grant me the use of a few words before any one else of those are present, I shall take advantage of this permission so generously granted, and shall talk. In imagination I fancy myself in the midst of the August Roman Senate, Senatus Populusque Romanus, as was said in those happy days, which, unfortunately for humanity, will never more return. I propose to the patres conscripti, as the learned Cicero would say if he were in my place, I propose in view of the short time left, and time is money, as Solomon said, that concerning this important matter each one set forth his opinion clearly, briefly, and simply. Satisfied with himself, and flattered by the attention in the hall, the orator took his seat, not without first casting a glance of superiority toward Ibarra, who was seated in a corner, and a significant look at his friends as if to say, "Aha! Uh -huh. haven't I spoken well? His friends reflected both of these expressions by staring at the youths as though to make them die of envy. Now, any one may speak who wishes that. <clears throat> began the gobernadorcillo, but a repetition of the cough and sighs cut short the phrase. To judge from the silence, no one wished to consider himself called upon as one of the conscript fathers, since no one rose. Then Don Filippo seized the opportunity and rose to speak. The conservatives winked and made significant signs to each other. I rise, gentlemen, to present my estimate of expenses for a fiesta, he began. We can't allow it, commented a consumptive old man, who was an irreconcilable conservative. We'll won't against it, corroborated others. Gentlemen, exclaimed Don Filippo, repressing a smile, I haven't yet made known the plan which we, the younger men, bring here. We feel sure that this great plan will be preferred by all over any other that our opponents think of or are capable of conceiving. 
this presumptuous exordium so thoroughly irritated the minds of the conservatives that they swore in their hearts to offer determined opposition we have estimated three thousand five hundred pesos for the expenses went on don filippo now then with such a sum we shall be able to celebrate a fiesta that will eclipse in magnificence any that has been seen up to this time in our own or neighbouring provinces. Ahem! coughed some doubters. The town of A has five thousand, B has four thousand. Ahem! Humbug! Listen to me, gentlemen, and I'll convince you, continued the unterrified speaker. I propose that we erect a theatre in the middle of the plaza, to cost one hundred and fifty pesos. That won't be enough. It'll take one hundred and sixty, objected a confirmed conservative. Write it down, señor director. Two hundred pesos for the theatre, said Don Filippo. I further propose that we contract with a troupe of comedians from Tondo for seven performances on seven successive nights. Seven performances at two hundred peso a night make fourteen hundred pesos. Write down fourteen hundred pesos, senor director. Both the elders and the youths stared in amazement. Only those in the secret gave no sign. I propose besides that we have magnificent fireworks, no little lights and pinwheels such as please children and old maids, nothing of the sort. We want big bombs and immense rockets. I propose two hundred big bombs at two pesos each, and two hundred rockets at the same price. We'll have them made by the pyrotechnists of Malabon. Huh? grunted an old man. A two peso bomb doesn't frighten or deafen me. They ought to be three peso ones. Write down one thousand pesos for two hundred bombs and two hundred rockets. The conservatives could no longer restrain themselves. Some of them rose and began to whisper together. Moreover, in order that our visitors may see that we are a liberal people and have plenty of money, continued the speaker, raising his voice and casting a rapid glance at the whispering group of elders, I propose, first, four hermanos mayores for the two days of the fiesta, and second, that each day there be thrown into the lake two hundred fried chickens, one hundred stuffed capons, and forty roast pigs, as did Scylla, a contemporary of that Cicero of whom Capitan Basilio just spoke. That's it, like Scylla, repeated the flattered Capitan Basilio. The surprise steadily increased. Since many rich people will attend, and each one will bring thousands of pesos, his best game cocks and his playing cards, I propose that the cockpit run for fifteen days, and that license be granted to open all gambling houses. The youths interrupted him by rising, thinking that he had gone crazy. The elders were arguing heatedly. And finally, that we may not neglect the pleasures of the soul, the murmurs and cries which arose all over the hall drowned his voice out completely, and tumult reigned. No! yelled an irreconcilable conservative. I don't want him to flatter himself over having run the whole fiesta. No! Let me speak! Let me speak! Don Filippo has deceived us, cried the liberals. We'll vote against his plan. He has gone over to the old man. We'll vote against him. The gobernadorcillo, more overwhelmed than ever, did nothing to restore order, but rather was waiting for them to restore it themselves. The captain of the cuadrilleros begged to be heard, and was granted permission to speak, but he did not open his mouth, and sat down again confused and ashamed. By good fortune, Capitan Valentin, the most moderate of all the conservatives, arose and said, we cannot agree to what the Teniente Mayor has proposed, as it appears to be exaggerated. So many bombs and so many nights of theatrical performances can only be desired by a young man, such as he is, who can spend night after night sitting up and listening to so many explosions without becoming deaf. I have consulted the opinion of the sensible persons here, and all of them unanimously disapprove Don Filippo's plan. Is it not so, gentlemen?' "'Yes, yes!' 
cried the youths and elders with one voice. The youths were delighted to hear an old man speak so. "'What are we going to do with four hermanos mayores?' went on the old man. "'What is the meaning of those chickens, capons, and roast pigs thrown into the lake?' humbug our neighbors would say and afterwards we should have to fast for six months what have we to do with scylla and the romans have they ever invited us to any of their festivities i wonder i at least have never received any invitation from them and you can all see that i'm an old man the romans live in rome where the pope is capitan basilio prompted him in a low voice now i understand exclaimed the old man calmly. They would make of their festivals watch-meetings, and the Pope would order them to throw their food into the sea so they might commit no sin. But in spite of all that, your plan is inadmissible, impossible, a piece of foolishness. Being so stoutly opposed, Don Filippo had to withdraw his proposal. Now that their chief rival had been defeated, even the worst of the irreconcilable insurgents looked on with calmness while the young cabeza de barangay asked for the floor i beg that you excuse the boldness of one so young as i am in daring to speak before so many persons respected for their age and prudence and judgment in affairs but since the eloquent orator capitan basilio has requested every one to express his opinion let the authoritative words spoken by him excuse my insignificance. The conservatives nodded their head with satisfaction, remarking to one another, This young man talks sensibly. He's modest. He reasons admirably. What a pity that he doesn't know very well how to gesticulate, observed Capitan Basilio. But there's time yet. He hasn't studied Cicero, and he's still a young man. If I present to you, gentlemen, any program or plan, the young man continued, I don't do so with the thought that you will find it perfect or that you will accept it, but at the same time that I once more bow to the judgment of all of you, I wish to prove to our elders that our thoughts are always like theirs, since we take as our own those ideas so eloquently expressed by Capitan Basilio. Well spoken, well spoken, cried the flattered conservatives. Capitan Basilio made signs to the speaker, showing him how he should stand and how he ought to move his arm. The only one remaining impassive was the gobernadorcillo, who was either bewildered or preoccupied. As a matter of fact, he seemed to be both. The young man went on with more warmth. My plan, gentlemen, reduces itself to this. Invent new shows that are not common and ordinary, such as we see every day, and endeavour that the money collected may not leave the town, and that it be not wasted in smoke, but that it be used in some manner beneficial to all. That's right, assented the youths. That's what we want. Excellent, added the elders. What should we get from a week of comedies, as the Teniente Mayor proposes? What can we learn from the kings of Bohemia and Granada, who commanded that their daughters' heads be cut off, or that they should be blown from a cannon, which later is converted into a throne. We are not kings, neither are we barbarians. We have no cannon, and if we should imitate those people, they would hang us on Bagumbayan. What are those princesses who mingle in the battles, scattering thrusts and blows about in combat with princes, or who wander alone over mountains and through valleys as those seduced by the Tikbalang? Our nature is to love sweetness and tenderness in woman, and we would shudder at the thought of taking the blood-stained hand of a maiden, even when the blood was that of a moro or a giant so abhorred by us. We consider vile the man who raises his hand against a woman, be he prince or alferes or rude countryman. Would it not be a thousand times better to give a representation of our own customs in order to correct our defects and vices and to encourage our better qualities? That's right, that's right, exclaimed some of his faction. He's right, muttered several old men thoughtfully. I should never have thought of that, murmured Capitan Basilio. But how are you going to do it? asked the irreconcilable. Very easily, answered the youth. 
I have brought here two dramas, which I feel sure the good taste and recognized judgment of the respected elders here assembled will find very agreeable and entertaining. One is entitled The Election of the Gobernadorcillo, being a comedy in prose in five acts, written by one who is here present. The other is in nine acts for two nights and is a fantastical drama of a satirical nature, entitled Mariang Makiling, written by one of the best poets of the province. Seeing that the discussion of preparations for the fiesta has been postponed, and fearing that there would not be time enough left, we have secretly secured the actors and had them learn their parts. We hope that with a week of rehearsal they will have plenty of time to know their parts thoroughly. This gentleman, besides being new, useful and reasonable, has the great advantage of being economical. We shall not need costumes, as those of our daily life will be suitable. "'I'll pay for the theatre," shouted Capitan Basilio enthusiastically. "'If you need quadrilleros, I'll lend you mine,' cried the captain. "'And I, and I, if an old man is needed,' stammered another one, swelling with pride. "'Accept it, accept it,' cried many voices." Don Filippo became pale with emotion and his eyes filled with tears. He's crying from spite, thought the irreconcilable, so he yelled, Accept it! Accept it without discussion! Thus satisfied with revenge and the complete defeat of his rival, this fellow began to praise the young man's plan. The letter continued his speech. A fifth of the money collected may be used to distribute a few prizes, such as to the best schoolchild, the best herdsman, farmer, fisherman, and so on. We can arrange for boat races on the river and lake, and for horse races on shore. We can raise greased poles and also have other games in which our country people can take part. I concede that on account of our long-established customs we must have some fireworks, Wheels and fire castles are very beautiful and entertaining, but I don't believe it necessary to have bombs, as the former speaker proposed. Two bands of music will afford sufficient merriment, and thus we shall avoid those rivalries and quarrels between the poor musicians who come to gladden our fiesta with their work and who so often behave like fighting cocks, afterwards going away poorly paid, underfed, and even bruised and wounded at times. With the money left over, we can begin the erection of a small building for a schoolhouse, since we can't wait until God himself comes down and builds one for us, and it is a sad state of affairs that while we have a fine cockpit, our children study almost in the curate's stable. Such are the outlines of my plan. The details can be worked out by all. A murmur of pleasure ran through the hall, as nearly everyone agreed with the youth. Some few muttered, innovations innovations when we were young let's adopt it for the time being and humiliate that fellow said others indicating don filippo when silence was restored all were agreed there was lacking only the approval of the gobernadorcillo that worthy official was perspiring and fidgeting about he rubbed his hand over his forehead and was at length able to stammer out in a weak voice I also agree, but... <clears throat> Everyone in the hall listened in silence. But what? asked Capitan Basilio. Very agreeable, repeated the gobernadorcillo. That is to say, I don't agree. I mean, yes, but... Here he rubbed his eyes with the back of his hand. But the curate, the poor fellow went on. The curate wants something else. Does the curate, or do we ourselves, pay for this fiesta? Has he given a cuarto for it? exclaimed a penetrating voice. All looked toward the place whence these questions came, and saw there the sage Tassio. Don Filippo remained motionless with his eyes fixed on the gobernadorcillo. What does the curate want? asked Capitan Basilio. Well, the padre wants six processions, three sermons, three high masses, and if there is any money left, a comedy from Tondo with songs in the intermissions. But we don't want that, 
said the youths and some of the old men. The curate wants it, repeated the gobernadorcillo. I've promised him that his wish shall be carried out. Then why did you have us assemble here? For the very purpose of telling you this. Why didn't you tell us so at the start? I wanted to tell you, gentlemen, but Capitan Basilio spoke and I haven't had a chance. The curate must be obeyed. He must be obeyed, echoed several old men. He must be obeyed, or else the alcalde will put us all in jail, added several other old men sadly. Well then, obey him and run the fiesta yourselves, exclaimed the youths, rising. We withdraw our contributions. Everything has already been collected, said the gobernadorcillo. Don Filippo approached this official and said to him bitterly, I sacrificed my pride in favor of a good cause. You are sacrificing your dignity as a man in favor of a bad one, and you have spoiled everything. Ibarra turned to the schoolmaster and asked him, Is there anything that I can do for you at the capital of the province? I'll leave for there immediately. Have you some business there? We have business there, answered Ibarra mysteriously. On the way home, when Don Filippo was cursing his bad luck, old Tasio said to him, The blame is ours. You didn't protest when they gave you a slave for a chief, and I, fool that I am, had forgotten it. End of chapter 20